Good evening, everyone. My name is Brock McMillan. I call this meeting to order. It is 6.06 .06 p.m. on the 10th of November. <laughs> um, welcome to the Central Region Advisory Council meeting. This meeting is being held in person at the DWR Central Region in Springville, as well as being streamed live on YouTube. This is a public forum allowing you to express your opinions and proposals on the management of wildlife in our state. This RAC considers your ideas, opinions, and proposals and reports them to the Wildlife Board. The Wildlife Board, not the RAC, is charged with setting wildlife policy in our state. Uh, we all have our ideas and opinions about how we should best manage wildlife. Uh, and we all have uh, a lot of emotion and passion. I'd encourage all who wish to express their opinion to do so. However, I ask that we, uh, as individuals, respect opposing views that we are just discussing. Uh, in other words, I appreciate the audience keeping their emotions in check and allowing everybody to express their opinions. Appropriate um, conduct will allow this meeting to, to move uh, smoothly and allow everybody to hear and, and listen to ideas and digest those ideas. Um, nothing rude or, or condescending or out of line. We'll ask you to leave. Um, I'd like to welcome the, the RAC members and ask everybody to introduce themselves. Amos, maybe give a little more ab about you too when we get you so that everybody gets to know you if that's okay. Scott, you wanna start? Scott Jensen, I represent public at large. Mike Christensen at large. Eric Reed, Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Dan Potts. Uh, Non-consumptive, but I consume everything, sorry. Ken Strong, sportsman's rep. Braden Shepherd, agriculture. Uh, I'm new on the rack. This is uh, Amos Murphy. This is the first time I'm here. Um, out from the uh, Iowa area with the uh, Confederate Tribes of the Goshen Reservation. I'm one of the tribal council members also as well. So I, uh, they asked me if I'd uh, come out and uh, take a seat on this, uh, this rack. So this is my first time, so uh, bear with me. Don't, don't, uh, don't scream at me or anything. So uh, let, me, let me catch on first. Thank you. Welcome, Amos. Uh, hi, everyone. Johnny Collin, for service. Ben Lauder, public at large. Joshua Leonard, sportsman's rep. Thank you, everyone. We also have in the audience, Gary Nielsen from the Wildlife Board and online, we have Randy Dirth from, from the Wildlife Board. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the DWR, DWR staff, especially those that provided presentations and they're available to answer questions. Those include Dax Mangus, big game coordinator, Rusty Robinson, once in a lifetime species coordinator, Derek Yule, Northeast Regional Biologist, uh, Chad Wilson, Public Wildlife Private Lands Coordinator. Uh, welcome everybody that's in attendance in person. This is a packed house, I love it. Uh, maybe the second most we've had since I've been on the rack, which is fantastic. Um, if, you, if you would like to make a comment tonight on any of the items that we are discussing, you need to pick up one of these yellow cards on the table just outside the door and fill it out and hand it in. You can just hand it to Josh here on the end and he'll pass it around. That's the only way you'll be able to make a comment. Um, the public that are watching online will not be able to provide comments. However, the presentations were provided in advance and they had an opportunity to comment online. Um, if, uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to move to number two on the agenda, which is approval of the agenda and uh, the minutes. If so moved. We have a uh, motion from Ken to approve the agenda and minutes and a second from Scott. All in favor? Any opposed? One opposed? Let's hear it. I just think we stack too much information in a couple of these meetings every year. And so it's really hard to cover everything and, and give it its due process. And I don't like overlooking uh, really important items. So 
I knew it would pass anyway, but I just wanted to get that on the record. I like it. I, I, so, I mean, we have three big things at least here today, and, and that's a lot for one meeting. I agree. Um, next item on the agenda is the wildlife board update. In the last mood meeting, uh, there was a motion to approve the two 2023 fishing recommendations as presented. That motion passed unanimously. There was a motion to approve the Henry Mountains Bison Management Plan as presented. That motion passed unanimously. Uh, there was a motion to approve on the Landowner Association amendments. There was a, lotion, a motion to approve four amendments as presented by the division. Then Carl Hurst, that, that passed unanimously. Carl Hurst made a motion to uh, move that they place the action log and directive to form a LOA advisory group and have an update given to the board each meeting as it progresses. It was then, with, that motion was withdrawn. There was then a motion to move that they direct the LOA advisory committee to look at multipliers, 50% rule and other issues. And that motion failed on a three to three vote. Um, so basically the LOA rule was approved as presented. Uh, there was a motion to accept the conservation permit audit, and that passed unanimously. A motion to expect, accept the conservation permit annual report, that passed unanimously. There was a motion to approve the prohibited species request as presented with all stipulations in the recommendation, that passed unanimously. Uh, there was a motion to accept the 2023 meeting dates, that passed unanimously. And there was a motion that the division formulate a guiding document for the formation of committees that would include final approval of coming to the wildlife board and that passed unanimously. With that, I'll turn the time over to Jason for a regional update. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you get that up? Is it up? Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time and you know, just a, an extra welcome to Amos for being here tonight. I appreciate you making the long trip out here and welcome to the rack and Johnny as well, filling in for Luke Decker. Luke's been um, assigned, that's not the right word, I know. Detailed, detailed thank you, detailed to, to California. Um, so appreciate you taking the time to be here as well, filling in for him. So I'll just take a few minutes and, and give you kind of an update on what's happened and what's going to be happening in the region. Um, in our aquatic section, they've been busy this summer and fall uh, doing quite a bit of monitoring throughout the region. Um, they've monitored the, monitored the lower Provo River. Uh, that's electroshocking going through and removing, uh, shocking all the fish and, and counting and um, identifying all those fish within certain segments of the river. Um, overall, overall, they found a healthy fish population with about three to 6,000 fish individuals that are greater than six inches per mile. So excited about those results and uh, a, a great healthy population there. On the Jordan L, they did some curtain net sampling <clears throat> and uh, all of the data hasn't been crunched yet, but some early information they felt like I could share is uh, the rainbow numbers are, are very encouraging. They're looking good in there. Coking number, kokanee numbers seem to be good as well, but they do have some concerns about the wiper population within the reservoir, and they're gonna look into that a, a little bit closer. Deer Creek Reservoir, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, right in the middle of COVID, or at the beginning of COVID, we started a creel census on the, the reservoir. Um, as time went by and we started to understand COVID and what that meant, we, we ended that survey early. And then as time went by some more and uh, we were able to restart that Creel survey. So the survey went through 2020 and 2021. Um, just a, a couple of highlights from that survey. Um, they found that they had twice as many angling hours in 2021 versus that of 2005 when, was, when the most recent Creel survey was. So that reservoir is getting a lot more use over you know, a, a two decade period or a decade and a half. Um, some of their recommendations coming from that will start to need, will need to start looking at some crowding issues 
on that reservoir as well. So um, angler satisfaction was high, um, 87% versus 63% in 2005. And rainbow trout is still the, the most sought after fish in the reservoir, although they are seeing walleye and uh, targeting bass targeting increasing in the reservoir. <clears throat> Um, our aquatic section is also, you know, I think nearly every time I talk about the fires from 2018 and the impacts they've had across the region, um, and some of those are upland habitats and, and mountain habitats, some of those effects are still uh, hitting some of, these re uh, some of the rivers, especially the Spanish Fork River. And today I'm gonna talk about Diamond Fork. Um, we've had our heavy equipment crew up in the river, um, the, the section that they're in is just up from Little Diamond's campground, uh, moving up just over a mile upstream from that campground. They've been doing a lot of restoration work in there, placing, uh, bar not barriers, uh, J-hooks and logs and, and creating habitat in that. So they'll, they'll continue to, to get that taken care of and um, get these hopefully rivers back into a, a more prime habitat for fish. Our wildlife section, um, deer classification is beginning. Um, just want to throw out a, an invitation to any of the RAC members that would like to go out and classify deer with any of our biologists on any of our units in the region. Uh, please let me know, or, or Sydney's here today too, in our packed room here. Give her a call. She'd love to, to take you out and, and get these biologists out as well and, and do some classifying out on those units. Um, with this time of the year coming around, it's always busy with nuisance wildlife. It started, it feels like it started early this year. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of turkeys come down early and we've been transplanting some moose out of some of our, our urban areas. Um, so that's been a, a little bit of a challenge and, and hopefully that'll not continue to, to go as, as we've seen it as far as them coming down. Um, pheasant hunt uh, started last Saturday. Uh, the, the week be previous to that was the youth pheasant hunt. Uh, along with the pheasant hunts, we release pheasants in, in some areas throughout the state. I did a quick count on our pheasant map and there's over 50 locations throughout the state where we're releasing pheasants, whether they're on WMAs or walk-in access areas or, or other public lands. I've put the website there um, for future reference if you'd like. It, it shows where we drop off each of those pheasants. And, and usually there's, at least in our region, we'll drop them off uh, once a week and uh, provide some hunting. And I'd like to just point out in that top right picture there, that's uh, some of my friends down from Manti um, with their, their new dog they were able to, to limit out with their family on opening of the general season. And, and that's really why we're putting those out there is, you know, a lot of youth, lots of smiles and hopefully a happy dog as well. So it was a good time. Habitat section, way busy time of the year as well. Um, it's a little conflicting for them. They, they love the snow. They love moisture because it helps make their things that they plant grow but it never feels like they have enough time to get the things in the ground that they want to grow. So there's always a little bit of a battle there to get it in the ground. So they're, they're super busy right now. Uh, we have a few new employees in the region. Mason Morgan is our new assistance ma assistant maintenance um, manager for the region in our habitat section. And then Talon Robison is a new biologist on our central Utah project. Uh, Mason, comes from us, he's been a seasonal for us for this summer and, and we're excited to get him on full time. Talon has spent a lot of time up in the Northern region on waterfowl management areas and uh, we're excited to have his experience and knowledge in, in waterfowl in the region. And he'll be spending a lot of time on waterfowl management areas. Something that, that we're really excited about in the region is the, the big game work that's going on the South Manti unit. Uh, with our partners from the Forest Service and SFW and other sportsmen's groups, we were able to get money on the ground quickly to get these projects going. This, this has been a really quick turnaround, and, and thanks to Johnny as well. He's played a big part in, in making this happen on the, on the forest side. 
Um, we're doing aspen regeneration higher up on the mountain, and we're doing lop and scatter, removing some pinion and jumer, juniper down in the winter range. So trying to connect these things together and provide additional habitat for, for big game. Um, if you travel up Parley's Canyon at, at all, you'll be seeing a new project just off the highway there, uh, an oak brush staining project. We've got some uh, masticators up there thinning out the, the oak brush and it's a big game habitat improvement as well as a fuels reduction project. So um, we, we're excited about that project. Tons and tons of partners on that from counties to cities to, to different um, conservation groups and just a, a great project. And we anticipate that we'll uh, increase some habitat there as well. And then the, the last thing there I talked about a little bit, uh, tons of seedling plantings going on throughout the region. By the end of the, the year, they'll have planted over 35,000 shrubs. These are primarily in big game winter range habitats. So we're really excited about that. Part of that also is a research project that we're doing to look at improved seedling survival across the landscape. Um, that's a project that's happening out of our Great Basin Research Center in Ephraim, as well as Scott Jensen with the Shrub Sciences Laboratory. So we've, we've had a great relationship with the Shrub Sciences Laboratory and look forward to uh, getting some good results out of that. Um, outreach section, um, they've been really busy holding some seminars and, and trainings. We held a pheasant hunting seminars a few days before the youth pheasant hunt had a good response to that. Um, hopefully got some people understanding how to, to get out and hunt pheasants and what to do after the pheasants are, are in your hand and, and breast them out. Uh, we'll be holding two waterfowl seminars coming up November 18th and 19th. One of them is a waterfowl hunting basics seminar and the second is a decoy placement seminar. And we're really excited about both of those. The decoy placement, we have a pond um, just behind this building here that we'll be able to utilize and, and talk about different ways to strategies to place the decoys out there and kind of a real life experience. So that'll, that'll be a great opportunity. And finally, our, our law enforcement section. Um, of course, as you can guess, super busy time of the year for law enforcement uh, with all the hunts going on. Uh, they've got several investigations ongoing dealing with unlawful take and, and wanton destruction violations, uh, numerous self-report of accidental harvest of dough. Uh, our lieutenant said that seems to be a little bit higher this year than it has been in the past. Not sure why that would be, just happened to be that way. Um, one of our WMAs is Goshen Warm Springs and it's uh, in the south part of Utah County, just south of Genola and east of Goshen, the cities of Goshen, the city of Goshen. Um, it's a WMA that's currently closed to the public right now. It's an old reduction mill that was built in the 1920s and uh, they used a lot of chemicals, arsenic and lead and different things to reduce um, the, not the coal, the, the rocks that came in. Can't think of the right word tailings, um, or that, yes, thank you, the ore that came in and they reduced that. Um, we, were at, we have been the owners of that property since the late 1970s. In the early 2000s, we did some testing of the water and the soil in that area and found that it was uh, toxic for lead and arsenic. So we closed it at that point to, to the public. Um, we've had a lot of trespassers going into that area and, and we've tried to work in getting um, that reduced. Just recently, we, we have some trail cameras on there to, to alert us when there's people coming in. And we had a, one of the hunters that was trespassing in there shot the trail camera, um, destroyed it, but fortunately we were able to get the pictures off it and, and figure out who that was. But uh, it's the, the reason I mention it is you can go out on the web and there's lots of websites that um, encourage you to go to Goshen Warm Springs and look at the property and the, the tailing buildings and, and they're quite dangerous actually. Um, 
but we've had an uptick in visitors out there and I just, I just wanna encourage people to not go out there. Um, there's a lot of trespassing and, and vandalism out there, but. And finally, it's not all doom and gloom for law enforcement. They're not always out there trying to, to, to bust people. We've had a few, and I know others throughout the state, uh, law enforcement love to take out um, hunters with disabilities and, and provide them an opportunity to go hunting and, and find a buck and, and have them harvest the buck. And, and we've had several officers in our region be able to do that. And, um, you know, that's, it's been a, a great opportunity for them. And um, I think, you know, it's always fun to go hunting and, and have a good time. Our officers, even though they're, you know, they're not the ones harvesting. They're having just as great of a time as, as the hunters out there and appreciate their time and efforts that they put into those. And with that, unless there's any questions from the RAC members, I, that's all I've got tonight. Go ahead, Ken. Just to, to bring it to people's attention, uh, yesterday I was in a meeting on strawberry. Uh, they have reseeded uh, and planted a lot of willows up Strawberry River but in the last two weeks, they have dumped nine load, nine truckloads of fish, averaging 9.8 inches. Of, they're all rainbows so far. Yeah, you know, in the management plan, they've they've got a really good plan. There, and, uh, it's one of the highest hit fisheries in the in the state, um, and it's very popular. So we we do everything we can to make sure that there's a, a good opportunity and good recreation there. So thanks for pointing that out, Ken. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, got a question here. Sure. And uh, when you're talking about the law enforcement, the uh, are, are there limited law enforcement in particular areas, you know, like out where I'm from, the uh, Deep Creeks, we have no law enforcement out there. You know, we have some uh, poaching going on there and we've uh, called uh, law enforcement, but they're time when they get there everything's all done and over with so we you know it's kind of hard to catch some of the uh individuals that are out there doing the poaching and stuff so yeah and and you know i think we've had some conversations on that and and trying to work um on that a couple of things that that we've proposed and are working on um we've identified uh, a utip poaching sign and I, a couple of weeks ago, we, we gave the tribe, a, I think a stack of a dozen of those signs to hopefully put out there so that if we see, if there are hunters out there that aren't poaching or see something going on, the tribe can put those signs up where they need to. And hopefully somebody will see it and text or call or, or whatever it needs to be able to get some more information on those. Cause those are tough. Um, our law enforcement agent is uh, stationed in, in Tooele. So, you know, that's a, an hour drive or more probably. Yeah, it's, it's more. Yeah. Hour and a half or two. Um, so there can be delay in, in getting law enforcement out there, but hopefully we're, we're going to be able to, to have everybody kind of be law enforcement or at least be able to know who to call to make sure we get that information back to us so that we can make those cases. Cause it's important to us as, as well, Amos, to make sure that we, you know, everybody loses when, when that poaching takes place. So if, you know, if there's other concerns, let's talk about it and see what we can do to, to try to eliminate that. All right, thank you. You bet. Josh. Yeah, Jason, how many acres is that Goshen Warm Springs WMA? A couple, uh, roughly. A couple thousand. Uh, pri primarily uh, deer habitat or upland it, game or what's most, it's primarily probably upland game habitat. Okay. There's not a lot of trees, a lot of shrubs on it, chuckers are the primary upland game bird on there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just on the 1200 acres. Not, Thank you. So not huge. Not really big. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, has the division uh, approached or, or looked into, you know, like looking at Fish and Wildlife Service or EPA or uh, <clears throat> I don't know, even WRI to sort of reclaim some of that tailing and remediate the site so that we can bring that back into public access? Because it, it sounds like the problem's not fixing itself. I mean, have, have you guys explored funding options with different agencies like that or? We have, and it's really expensive. Yeah. Like it, so, it always super is. fund expensive. Super fund expensive. Yeah. 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 So we haven't 
continued going down that road more recently. It, it, but it's not a designated super fund. It's not designated super fund, okay. but it's should be. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and Josh, it, it's, it's a lot smaller, 116 acres. Sorry. I pulled oh, yeah, it's tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Anything else? I, I will mention I, I wish we could go down that road because it would be great to have people access that and especially for the upland game hunting. Right now it's it's not feasible for our agency to do that. Great question though. Anything else? Okay, before we announce the first action agenda item, a few rules. If you're, if you're a public person, you have three minutes to comment. If you're representing a group, you have five minutes to comment. If you're gonna comment, again, you have to have filled out one of these yellow cards. Um, the DWR representative will come up to this south podium and that's where they'll be for questions and comments and the public will come up to the north podium if they have a question or comment and we'll time you. And when your time's up, I'm gonna stop you. You're, we have a lot of people here and a lot of comment cards. So you're gonna have three or five minutes depending on who you represent. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the elk plan. And I will open it up for questions from the rack for Dax, or if you have a comment you want to make first, Dax. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I do have one correction. Please Push the button. Mr. Chair, I have one correction if I could. Uh, we did notice in the plan, the version that was uh, circulated on one of the maps showing the spike elk units, the LaSalle Mountains portion was left out and that was inadvertent, that was a mistake. So our recommendation would be to continue with the spike elk hunt in the LaSalle Mountains. So the Dolores Triangle was there, but the LaSalle, LaSalle Mountains was not. So what one mistake we noticed. Excellent. Questions for Dax from the from the rack. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, uh, and this is as much for the public, I think, as 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 just me. I'm I'm clueless. Uh, so what is the biological uh, reason that we do spike elk hunts? If if that could be explained, I think that would help a lot of people because there were comments in the you know that we we got that related a little bit to that. Thanks, yeah, that's a great question. So the, the spike elk hunts, uh, they're really kind of multi-purpose. There, there's several reasons behind uh, why we have the spike elk hunts. So typically we have spike elk hunts that target primarily yearling bulls. Uh, it's one of the more abundant age classes um, that these spike elk units typically are units that are managed for limited entry bull hunting. So we're trying to uh, really grow these older age class bulls for folks that are lucky enough or persistent enough to draw one of those permits. Um, the spike hunting helps us to manage sex ratios in those populations. Uh, we have pop unit population objectives where, you know, for example, if we have a unit where our population objective is 2000 elk on a, on a unit, in order to manage that population objective, uh, we often end up having to harvest antlerless animals. Uh, to, to manage the population numbers. If we harvest just a whole bunch of antlerless animals and we don't harvest very many bulls, we can get to this point, and we're there on some units even with the spike hunt, where we have really out of whack bull to cow ratios. The sex ratios get to an unhealthy level. So the spike hunts can help us manage sex ratios and also provides an opportunity on the most abundant age class of bulls, while at the same time allowing us to still manage for those older age class bulls through the limited entry side of the hunting season. So that kind of, that's, that's quick and dirty version, but that's uh, kind of the primary reasons why we Thank have the spike hunts. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, Dax. Uh, what is the, I mean, on deer, we lose about 50% of the yearlings, if I'm, if I'm not. Do we do the same with elk or do the elk survive a lot better? I, I don't know if we have as good a data on that. I'll maybe turn the time to Professor McMillan. We, we've actually talked about this quite a bit. So I'm only familiar with one paper that, we haven't looked at it in Utah. I'm only familiar with one paper. And so adult survival is about 95% and yearling survival is less than that, 80 to 85% in that paper, that's it. That's all we know. So we don't have a ton of data and the data, the limited amount of data we do have is not as, it's not as dramatic as what we see in deer. Any other questions from the rack? Go ahead, Mike. I've got a couple. Um, let's see here. Uh, the Moroni Hills, why is that included as a any bull unit? So Moroni Hills 
is an area that, um, and region, if, if anyone from the region wants to speak to anything that I miss or that I get incorrect, please come on up. Uh, Morona Hills is an area where we have a lot of depredation issues with elk. It's not uh, typically one of the core areas for folks that hunt that Nebo unit. And so it presented a good opportunity where we had an area that met those criteria that we look at when we look at uh, any bull units where maybe we have some conflict or depredation issues. We have uh, typically on any bull units, we have units, areas that have uh, lots of refuge areas or places they can they can escape. And uh, and so that's when, when we were trying to identify places that would be a good fit in any bull, those were some of the things that jumped out to us there from that Moroni Hills area. Okay. Um, another question I have is, um, Last night in the northern rack, you said that the average uh, hunter harvested his limited entry bull on the early hunt in five days. Is that? So 72%, looking at the last, I think it was six years worth of data, 72% of the limited entry hunters that harvested, harvested within the first five days. So is it the first five days or five days within the season? Oh, you got me on the semantics there. I don't know exactly which days they were hunted five days or less. Yeah. This more, would be more correct to say. Yeah. So it's possible they hunted at the end of the season or took some days off in the middle. But okay. I don't, we don't have the specific days that they hunted, just the total number of days. Okay, because that does make a difference to me. Um, let's see. Um, on the, well, so the multi-season elk tags, um, we just went through a pricing um, meeting and that was based on them being able to hunt three hunts. Is that correct? Or maybe Lindy, is that kind of how it, that was, pre, that's how that was presented, correct? But was there a discussion within the L committee that, uh, that we could raise that price if we're gonna have, let them hunt four hunts or was it discussed that maybe the multi-season hunters could not hunt the second uh, general season? Was that discussed? So we really didn't get into the tag pricing uh, okay. component of that very much. Um, but uh, the, we, did, we did talk about whether or not the multi-season permit should only be able to hunt one of the any weapon hunts on the any bull units. And after you know, a reasonable amount of conversation, some back and forth on that, decided to just move forward with that permit, being able to hunt all, of, all the hunts, so both of the any weapon hunts. Okay. Um, yeah. There was also some, um, there's been a lot of talk about the, the antlerless elk harvested um, during the bow hunt, during the archery hunt. Um, it looks like we average about six to 700 antlerless elk um, on those general season archery elk tags, is that correct? Yeah, it sounds like you've looked at the exact numbers more recently than me, but the last, uh, last few annual reports I looked through, it was about 60% of the harvest was bulls and about 40% of the harvest was cows. Okay, does, does um, What's that? What's the average harvest rate for antlerless elk just statewide on on our antlerless tags? Kent's here. Correct me if I say this wrong, Kent, but I think it's about forty percent success rate. Okay, so I'm just trying to understand. Like, there, this is the the uh, archery general season archery success rate is about eleven percent total, yeah. counting bulls and cows. Yeah, but but overall, so so isn't the purpose of excluding those? Um, excluding that opportunity to hunt um, either sex. Isn't that, is that for point creep? Is that what I understood? So and I actually look at it more as an expansion of allowing either sex hunting rather than an exclusion because a hunter would be able to literally harvest both a bull and a cow instead of just either or. So I guess it depends on how you look at it. You would have to purchase an additional permit, but you could harvest two animals instead of only one. Um, the purpose of that, uh, it's to address point creep within the antlerless elk system. It seems to just take more and more points to draw antlerless elk permits. Uh, one of the other things too, we, we want to encourage antlerless harvest during the archery season. It's a great time of year for us to get harvest. The pressure that comes from archery hunters doesn't typically have as much of an impact on elk distribution as uh, hunting pressure during you know, the any weapon seasons, for example. So. Uh, I don't think we want to discourage folks from doing that and, and in some ways, you know, potentially encourage even more of it. So if, if someone, an individual really wanted to hold out for a bull, but also was open to the idea of harvesting the cow, they could do both. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Dax? Yeah, um, so 
there's a, a lot of hunters who've been applying for 20 plus years, right? And the, milk, the management plan has changed multiple times since then. So some of these guys are thinking, you know, when you first start, hey, I'm applying for an eight-year-old bull on this unit, blah, 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 or whatever their little favorite thing is. And over time, those things change. Is there, is there any consideration given to some sort of a grievance process? So a particular hunter could say, hey, when I started or somewhere along the way, this is what I was planning. It's no longer that way now. Could I have it back? Uh, yeah, I, I just don't know in, in the world of wildlife management if we can ever guarantee, the only thing we can guarantee is change. Uh, I don't know that we can promise that anything's ever going to stay the same. And I, I realize that's disappointing sometimes, but, you know, I knew folks that had a bunch of, of Rocky Mountain bighorn points and were really looking forward to hunting the three corners unit several years back. And then we had a big die off right before we were about to open the unit and hunt sheep on it. And sometimes, you know, the winds of public opinion change and we might change the age objective on a unit or convert a unit from limited entry to general season. And I realize that can be a bummer for somebody, but again, I, th I think the only thing we can guarantee is change. Any other, go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I got another one. So uh, I, I, I think there was a fair amount of comment, public comment, and, and, and uh, the one of the organizations I represent uh, been around 100 years, that's a while. <laughs> uh, they've always advocated that we totally avoid the, uh, the, uh, the larger part of the, the rut. Uh, and, and so the first half, if you will, of October be, uh, you know, let them be. Uh, uh, and then shorten the hunt. We've always advocated shortening the hunt because just in my experience hunting elk, uh, you know, the whole elk hunt uh, in, in a lot of situations, you know, well, with a lot of uh, different weapons, especially rifles, the whole hunt is over in five minutes. So, so do you have a question? It, yeah. So, so my question is, is, is it, what's, what, what, what's the rationale for not going that direction all these years later. I, it just seems like we should be avoiding the rut. So what, what's the explanation to that? That's the question, sorry, Brock. Yeah, um, so typically elk hunting during the rut is the most, that's the most desirable time to hunt elk. Um, and pretty much every state hunts elk during the rut. Uh, in Utah, we do more rifle rut hunting than any other state. And uh, there's, there's been a lot of comments and a, and a lot of folks that have expressed strong emotions and opinions about that both ways. You know, some folks say this rifle rut hunt in September is a really unique thing. Utah is one of the few states that does this much rifle rut hunting. You know, this is the holy grail, the pinnacle of the most effective weapon type during the most vulnerable time of the year for the biggest bulls. Um, and, you know, some folks love that idea. Um, also, some folks think that's, that's wrong, we shouldn't be doing that way at all. We should only be archery hunting uh, during the rut. Um, we've heard from both groups. Uh, I, I don't know, I haven't heard from anyone that says we shouldn't hunt elk at all during the rut. That hasn't been something that I've heard much of, maybe a couple people, uh, but there's a pretty strong track record of hunting elk during the rut going on throughout the West for uh, longer than I've been alive and elk populations seem to be doing just fine. So um, this, the committee, took all those things into consideration uh, with, the, with the idea of trying to expand opportunity while maintaining quality. Uh, the recommendation represents something of a compromise. Uh, rather than completely eliminate that September rifle rut hunting, uh, we're recommending shortening it from nine days to five days and giving a few, those, those four days, those four days to the, to the archery hunters, which is more in line with what's done in a lot of the surrounding states but it still maintains that rifle rut hunting opportunity, albeit a shorter window and a smaller allocation of the permits. So along, along those lines, um, what's that save us? What does that accomplish by, by cutting out four days in the rifle rut hunt there? I mean, because, so yeah. So, that. so it responds to some of those social preferences and pressures and desires. Also, uh, with a shorter time frame, hunters probably can't be as selective as they perhaps have been in the past. Uh, it may result in less harvest as well, but I don't think a lot less harvest, but probably hunters will, yeah. Coming from a member of the committee, about half the committee wanted to remove it off the rut and half wanted to keep it. That was the compromise. Yeah, I, I hear it's a social issue, but it's a social issue for who? 
you know what I mean? And so, um, but that's a comment, sorry. Um, it, I, I, oh, I've got plenty. I, I should apologize to who, whoever's uh, compiling the, the, the minutes of this, so. Um, the success rate of the rut hunt, isn't it comparable on most units to the later hunts? Yeah, are any weapon success rates, um, whether it's the hunts in September, October, November, on most units, especially those managed for those higher age classes where we have a larger number of bulls present on the landscape, is typically like in that 80%, even 80% plus range. Yeah, so any, and if we're gonna cut tags, would it be reasonable to assume that if we cut tags on the early hunt and we just replace those with tags in a later hunt, that those, those bulls that would have been killed early most likely will have a probability of being killed later on because the success rates are comparable. Um, I, I don't see a lot of error in that logic, um, but I will say the, the idea was let's, let's, let's put the hunt back in hunting, you know, let's make them earn it. Um, if you draw during the other rifle seasons, uh, the, the intent was to move the most of the hunting with the most effective weapon type away from the peak of the rut when those biggest bulls are, are typically most vulnerable. Um, that mid-season hunt that we're recommending adding to all the limited entry units where we'll recommend the lion's share of the any weapon permits. There'll be, you know, uh, probably some rutting activity, some in post rut. Um, also be on top of spike elk hunters and on some units, even you know, early rifle deer hunters. So it'll, it should be a little tougher on some units, but we have still seen high success rates on those hunts. So I, I, I understand the, the point you're making with the question, um, but that, that's kind of the logic behind the recommendation. Okay, take a break. Um, just putting a couple ideas together there. If, if, we're less, if a hunter is less selective then, but the harvest rate is the similar, is that gonna artificially lower the age class where to end up harvesting fewer animals or offering fewer permits? So that's an interesting question. Um, and some of, the, some of the research in that paper, that Freeman et al paper, looking at that huge sample size, um, shows that the average bull scores about 320. That's about their potential. And we've actually seen on some units when we increased permits and hunters became less selective, our average age went up. Uh, because the hunters would suddenly harvest that 310 bull that they passed when they were holding out for a 360 bull. Um, a, a, there is a provision in the plan also that if we see that happening, if, if we are able to detect that because success rates drop or hunters become suddenly way less selective, we see uh, a drop in the age class of harvested bulls that isn't representative of what's actually available and isn't in the elk population, that we could take that into consideration when we recommend permit numbers. So we wouldn't want to, you know, inadvertently create like a downward spiral cycle here where we are forced to cut permits and cut permits and cut permits. Go ahead, Josh. Dak, can you maybe talk a little bit about how the elk committee came to a consensus on the number of permits allocated in the elk management plan? And what I'm thinking of is, you know, how did you come up with this uh, one season with 17,000, 15,000, and then the next was unlimited? And more specifically, permit allocation on um, limited entry hunts. Like, I was really glad to see that the age objectives have been addressed because I think, <clears throat> as we've discussed, they've been out of line with what's on the landscape in terms of when they were set and what's actually there now. And so I think bringing that in line is great. In terms of LE tag allocations, how would, is, how would those numbers get worked out in terms of like, if you have 20 points, people don't wanna see more tags allocated. If you have zero points, people think you could have gone a lot further in, in help point creep. And, and so maybe just talk for all of us, how the elk committee came to that sort of those number allocations. Okay, that was kind of a lot of questions. Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at part of it and then walk me through if you need to answer more. Um, uh, the st sticking with general season to start, um, up, until, uh, up until last year, we allocated 15,000 any bull permits. Um, well, it had been that way for the last few years and about 15,000 spike permits. Um, 
Last year, uh, we increased that to 17,500 on the any bowl. Uh, when the committee looked at it, you know, one of the big priorities for the committee was, um, I'm trying to remember how we said it. So uh, increase opportunity, maintain quality. So we wanted to get more without having to give anything up. That sounds kind of hard to do, right? But, but uh, so they said, you know, this, this 15,000 number, this is a number that we've been at within the last few years. It it's, has worked in the past. Uh, let's, let's stick with this 15,000 number during this, this first rifle hunt. It's gonna be similar to what folks have experienced in the past, perhaps even a little better. It's less than the 17.5, and we're recommending adding a bunch of additional, over 3 million acres of additional any bull you know, units. So, so in theory, that, that, that hunt should be less crowded, uh, more quality for a general season unit, which are geared towards opportunity, not necessarily quality, but, um, and then the flip side, the trade-off to that was, okay, and then we'll have this second season with an unlimited number of permits, knowing full well that should be a pretty difficult hunt. The elk, elk are really responsive to the hunting pressure. Uh, a lot of elk are gonna be in a deep, dark canyon or will have moved into a refuge area where they're maybe not accessible, but it gives hunters the choice. If they want to hunt every single year, they know they can count on that. If they want to wait to see if their son's football team is in or out of the playoffs before they buy their tags, they, they can see that type of thing and buy the tag, you know, the day before the hunt starts. That we wanted to maintain that, uh, the ability for someone who, who maybe doesn't have the time to become a bow hunter, but decides they wanna be a big game hunter to be able to pick up a rifle and go hunt big game. You know, over the counter rifle hunting opportunity that someone could take advantage of every year. Um, but like I said, knowing full well, it's probably gonna be a pretty difficult hunt. It's maybe not for everyone. I've had people tell me that, son that hunt sounds like a nightmare. I would never wanna have that hunt. You shouldn't even recommend it. And, and I tell folks, just, it sounds like that's not the hunt for you, but maybe it is for some people. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you my analogy that I, that I came up with. So I, 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 you're not gonna have a short meeting, sorry. Um, I, I do support the troops. But I don't like meatloaf, okay? I, I confess, I don't like meatloaf. But when I go to a restaurant and if I see meatloaf on the menu, I don't demand that the restaurant remove meatloaf from the menu. I just don't order it, you know? And I still support the troops. I'm, I, you know, I like hamburgers, it's about the same ingredients, but for whatever reason, meatloaf isn't for me. For some people, they love meatloaf. Maybe they order the meatloaf. That's this hunt. This hunt is meatloaf. For some folks, they look at it and they think, that sounds like a nightmare. I would never want to go on that hunt. But rather than, you know, coming to the rack and saying, this hunt sounds horrible, let's get rid of it, just don't order it. it that's not the one for you. So, you know, that, so there's my spiel on the, my meatloaf spiel on, on why we have those hunts and how we're trying to create diversity within the, the different elk hunting opportunities yeah. that we make available to the public. You've opened this can of worms, Josh. Yeah, I've heard. Good analogy. Good everybody, analogy. everybody was going to ask it, so we had to get it out there. So, so then the second part of that, talk about LE tag allocation, because I think that's really what most of the public comments, you know, were, were divided on. I mean, there, there, was a, there was a lot of disconsensus in terms of, like, we should be killing more big bulls in LE units, and others are saying, don't touch it, don't mess with it. If it's not broke, don't. You know that kind of attitude. Yeah. So, so I'm like, this, there's a lot to this. Um, the the way we manage limited entry units in Utah, you know, we manage for an average age of harvested bulls. Um, we made some recommendations, to adjustments of those age classes. The the recommended adjustments we made, based on all the available data we have, should still there should still be really great bulls available on the landscape. Uh, we are, you know, we will have fewer total bull, bulls. But we're still, you know, on those on that top tier unit, it's still going to be six and a half to seven year old bulls, or six to six and a half year old bulls. You know, those are bulls that are, and that's the average. You know, you'll have a few folks that harvest a three or four year old bull, and you'll have some folks that harvest ten and twelve year old bulls. But uh, you know, there's going to be great quality bulls still available on landscape. You know, we have our five and a half to six year old units like the Manti, the Wasatch, the, the you know the the, oh, the Fish Lake. And you know, and we see fantastic bulls come off those units every year. And some of the fantastic bulls that come off those units are four or five, and some of them are 12 years old. But uh, the, the recommendation for adjustment on age classes lets us utilize more of the resource, and folks will still have that opportunity to harvest great bulls. Maybe you don't get to sort through 40 different bulls before you decide which one you're going to harvest. Maybe you only get to sort through 20 bulls before you get to decide which one you're gonna harvest. So 
So with, with regard to the age objective changes, that, that's the, the rationale there. And the data that we used to back it up was you know, thousands of elk that were aged in a lab and, and scored on the Boone and Crockett scale. Um, as far as weapons allocation, you know, that was an un, another one where we had a lot of discussion. Uh, we do see lower success rates on the archery hunts, typically, especially on the units that are managed for a little bit lower age classes. The units that are managed for higher age classes, it, it's a surrogate for available, you know, the number of bulls on the landscape, they typically have higher success rates. Um, but even, even on the highest age class units, archery success rates are typically a little lower than muzzleloader or the different uh, any legal weapon or rifle seasons. Um, but when we looked at the demand, 77% of our applicants are applying for any legal weapon hunts. Uh, I think it was 9% apply for muzzleloader, 1% apply for the hams hunts, and whatever the difference is was how many applied for archery. 12%, something like that. So I, I can't do math while I'm up here. I've been to Goshen, so I, you can't, I didn't know, I didn't know. But <laughs> so toxic levels of lead. Um, it was years ago. My kids made me for Instagram. Um, but, uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> But so, that, so there's kind of the rationale behind the weapon split. So we, we kept the same weapon splits that we had before, 25% archery, 15% muzzleloader, 60% any legal weapon. But we did shuffle it around within that any legal weapon allocation to only 10% for that September hunt, 30% uh, for the mid-season hunt, 17% late, 3% for the multi-season, which we count as an any legal weapon hunt because they can hunt with any legal weapon. So, and those are kind of arbitrary numbers that I don't know that there's a super scientific basis behind those. They're based on tradition and demand and, and, and uh, somebody with a calculator that corrected me when I got the math wrong. That's, that's kind of where those came from. I have a question for Lindy since she came all the way down here. But it pertains to this, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry. Kay and Lindy, okay. for the past three years, it feels like you've come here to before the racks with the issue of the general season elk tag selling out and the demand and how it burdens your system. And we've heard about going unlimited. We've heard about going to a draw. Um, with that first season, where we're dropping our tag numbers down, and then we're actually capping multi-season tags, which is gonna create more of a perceived demand. Mm -hmm. Do you have any concerns or issues with that? Oh, yeah, there's always concern. Um, but we did a lot of um, maintenance to the system this year. We upgraded a lot of the system, and it actually worked pretty, fairly flawlessly. Like, it was pretty smooth. We sold out by noon yeah. on the the any bolts today. So like with the technology that we put in place and going to the cloud, there's always the concern because you can't rely always on technology. Like things do happen. But it also on the other flip side, I am confident in the system too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A any other questions? I got Dan, more. I got Dan, more stories. If you ask the right I, question, I know. I want to hear. I want to hear your. Uh, never no, mind. that was a great analogy. Thanks, <laughs> Danny. Uh, first, and then Ken. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. So, uh, so there was a lot of comment about going to the draw for the general uh, bull hunt, and and huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, no. And, and so did the did the did, did it sell out time wise? But but you know it's a hassle factor to to to, to try to get those permits on, on online. You know when it's over the counter like that. Uh, so where are we in that COVID curve? You know did because we had we assumed that we had a lot of hunters. Uh, you know, come out because they weren't going to their job. Uh, instead, they just went elk hunting for meat or whatever. Uh, so is that plateauing off, do you think? And are we, I'm sorry, I have her come back up again. Yeah. Sorry, I should have, I was gonna. So are you talking in general, like all of our like, or just elk hunting? No, just a general bull over the counter, which has been. So this year we sold out in five hours. So it's definitely, you know, the year of COVID, that's when it all went through the roof and we sold out, you know, in, in seven hours. Um, 
So they're all still hunting. Yeah, well, yeah, they are. But also just because they sold out, you know, in the first day, the person that would go the next day to purchase it a couple of years ago is now logging on at eight o'clock in the morning. And so it's just, that's why it's selling out quicker because everyone knows these do sell out the first day. We advertise it saying, hey, if you want it, make sure you get on in the morning because it has sold out, you know, in the first couple hours that the last couple of years. So are we are we to the point where we should consider a draw? That's all. I brought that forth last year. I know, that's why I'm bringing it back up. <laughs> so it's like, that's all I'm know, saying to that I'm question. <laughs> No, we, we, we recommend, you know, uh, two years ago, we recommended unlimited any bowl uh, to mixed results. Ultimately, uh, the, the board said no. Uh, and then last year, we recommended putting the any bowl permits in the draw, and, and we received a resounding no as an answer to that. They said, well, bring back last year's recommendation. So, so here we are with kind of a hybrid. Okay, go ahead, Ken. Uh, I don't know which one of you would answer this, but uh, this new program still goes unlimited on youth. Yes. Okay, uh, another question then, uh, how many youth hunters do we have besides that 15,000 that sign up late? Do we have a number on that? So this year, this is horrible. I'm gonna turn you want me to this. grease that so your laptop slides off right. easier? Um, so this year for the any bowl youth, we sold around 2,300 permits for youth. for youth. That was the unlimited um, youth permits for the any bowl. So, and, so it's really not a big deal. Yeah, and then the spike, just so you guys have it, um, that took out the 15,000 because we don't have a youth only permit for spike. And now the 15,000, about 13,000 of them, sorry, 1,300 were youth. And just to be clear, to be to be clear, I guess you know we we did recommend essentially an expansion of youth hunting opportunity for for general season elk, whereas in the past it was only unlimited for youth for the any bull, and uh, youth that purchased spike only permits that came out of the quota. We're recommending essentially a, a youth any bull permit that would be, or sorry, a youth elk permit that would be valid on any bull and spike units, as long as they follow the applicable regulations on whatever unit they're hunting with no limit. So, and that was a priority for the committee. They wanted that opportunity for youth to be able to have maximum flexibility. They could hunt all the, all the available seasons, except for that draw only season in September. So, but, it, but the archery season, you know, and the general rifle hunts in October, muzzleloader hunt in November, um, whether it's a spike unit, any bullion, if they want to travel and go somewhere far or hunt close to home in the, in the evenings, they wanted that opportunity available for, for youth and didn't want there to be a limit on it. So, Lynn, has this been a help point creep? Is it going to make a big difference or is it going to stay the same? We'll still there's, wait there's 130 no for, years. No points for general elk, but. I don't see how this works. We don't have points for general season elk. So youth would still be able to apply for a limited entry permit and accumulate points, but. Yeah, but my concern is, uh, if I understand this right, Dax, if, you, uh, if a 12 year old starts applying today for some of these units, they're looking at over a hundred years before they're gonna get a permit. That's, yeah. that's so, just my curiosity. So, We're gonna lose hunting if we don't keep the youth involved. And and if it's gonna take them a hundred years, they just will not start. So that, you know, and that's one of the points I made in the presentation. I, I showed that one slide, with, you know, based on current applicant numbers and permit numbers for, you know, the September early rifle hunts on a lot of our limited entry units. If a youth started, a 12 year old who just finished hunter safety started applying today, there's a handful of units to take them over a hundred years to draw. Um, you know, some of the units like the Manti, the Wasatch, they draw by the time they're in their late thirties, early forties, still isn't fantastic. But, uh, and the reality is even with all these recommendations and adjusting age classes and season dates, it's still gonna be hard to draw a limited entry tag. I don't think we can fix that. <laughs> I don't think we can fix that problem. Uh, but I think we can make it better. And I think, um, you know, the recommendations we're making 
will make it better. Folks that are willing to maybe hunt during a less desirable time of year or with a weapon type that's a little more difficult or has a shorter range, you know, there's a lot of things folks can do to uh, make it more likely that they're able to draw a limited entry elk tag. And, I, and with the recommendations we're making, we'll be able to offer more limited entry elk permits, yet still have great bulls out there on the landscape available. But I, I, don't, I don't think there's a way to say, well, you can hunt the Monroe, but just you're gonna have to be able, only be able to hunt it every other year. You know, that, that's just not realistic. We, we, we can't do that and still maintain the type of hunting folks expect when they you know, draw a permit on the Monroe. But I think we can make progress and what we're recommending I think makes progress. We, we don't want folks to have to wait 100 years to draw a tag. So Amos first and then Braden. Yes, Jack. Uh, in our area, the deep creeks, but we're on the west side of that. Uh, so we're pretty close to the Nevada border. I was just wondering where you, where you get the numbers uh, that would allow that uh, the permits to be uh, increased on that area. Uh, because uh, do do you go to the biologist and get account of what what's in that area? Because you know, because we're dealing with Utah, and then then we got Nevada doing the same thing. So we, you know, we're that herd of elk that's there is being pushed around. So, and it's you know, it's not uh, per se is not feasible for the hunters. You know, if that they, if they're traveling back and forth from one state to another and, and through other areas. So. That, that, that's our concern on that issue is, you know, where, where do you, where do you get the uh, numbers to uh, draw those permits? Yeah, so I spoke with our biologist for that, for that unit, for that West Desert, uh, Jason Robinson. I don't think Jason's here tonight. He's online. He's online. So uh, Jason, feel free to jump on if I uh, don't explain this correctly. I, I talked with Jason um, and, uh, and uh, on, that, on that unit, uh, I think the division estimate is about 950 elk. About 750 of the elk on that unit reside on uh, Go Shoot Reservation lands. And so, you know, obviously the division of wildlife, we don't manage wildlife in Nevada. We don't manage wildlife on, on reservation lands. You know, that's up to a sovereign nation or, or you know, another state. Um, our, so our, our recommendation, there's probably, uh, according to Jason, you know, a couple hundred elk that live primarily off the reservation and on this side of the Nevada line, obviously elk move, they respond to pressure and I'm sure some of those elk cross lines here and there. Um, but uh, the recommendation that we're making on that unit to turn it into an any bull unit will add more hunting pressure. You know, there'll be more hunters there than there currently are. Um, I think some of those hunters will harvest bulls, will probably harvest more bulls on the public lands portion than we have in the past. I also think the hunting pressure very likely will push more bulls onto go shoot lands and into Nevada. That's probably a reality as well. So, you know, maybe it's a mixed bag depending on what the goals, uh, you know, are from the tribe. Um, you know, I, I worked for the last uh, 15 years in the Northeastern region and uh, we have an any bull unit across the South slope of the Uinta mountains. And then the, the Uinta Nore Ute uh, reservation lands, uh, they have a big block there across the South slope of the Uintas. And they see that as soon as the hunts start on Forest Service land, we see a, a, a large movement, a lot of elk that move down onto the tribal trust lands there on the Ute lands. So I would imagine maybe at a little bit smaller scale, but probably a, a similar phenomenon might, might occur out there. I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's... It, well, yeah, it kind of, but you know, I think we need to, to work with the, uh, with the state on that and, and get, get to a number where we're we're satisfied with what's going on there. You know, we're, uh, like I said, we're dealing with the reservation, but we also concerned of the, the hunters that come in that you're permitting, because they're all going after the same thing. You know, if they're looking at a quality bull, you know, you're looking around 380, 360, you know, you, know, you, don't, you don't see that much of those type of bulls because you're, you're, you're moving them around. So that's not, not good for that. And you're not good. You're not doing your uh, your hunters any good either. So you know you kind of we kind of look at things like that. If you're if you're you know we're all into the hunting situation to where what you're going after. You know if you're if you're a trophy hunter or you're just going after for just the, the meat or whatever it is. But you know, we need to work and make it uh, feasible for everybody to 
to go after what they what they need. And I, you know, and I think that's where we need to work together and come with a good number and uh, where we're all satisfied. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Braden. First, Dax, I want to make a motion that we get a roast, not roast beef, meatloaf at the next meeting. So could DWR uh, <laughs> cook us up some? No, no don't. Not for, not for me. I want a hamburger. No, let's bring you some prime, prime rib instead. No. <laughs> so, um, just I had, I had a couple comments that came to me about crowding on the mid-season hunt and also just worry that during that mid-season limited entry, sorry, mid-season limited entry hunt that you're going to see uh, with all of the spike hunters, the, the deer hunters, a lot of the elk moving on to places with refuge, private property. Um, the comment came specific about the Fish Lake unit. A, some, a person that had hunted that said, hey, a bunch of the bulls we were hunting went right onto the Johnson's Ranch right before the hunt, and we could never see that get those bulls to come off during the mid-season spike hunt, or the mid-season hunt. Um, overall, how's, that, how's this going to impact the whole state? I'm talking, this is specifically on the Fish Lake, a lot of private mixed with public, but how does the rest of the state compare? So, and... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we, you know, the those units where we do have the mid-season hunt, like the Wasatch and and uh, and the and the Fish Lake, it, it, we still see pretty high success rates. And the age class is not super different. It, it tends to be slightly lower success rates, depending on the year and depending on the unit. You know, maybe slightly lower, but uh, I, I think you know hunting pressure changes elk distribution. It will probably make it more, um, but. On the units where we've had those hunts, we still see high success rates and, and good age classes. Um, I, I anticipate it'll be harder than if you're rifle hunting in September and there's hardly anyone else out in the field at the same time. And that was kind of intentional. That was kind of the, the purpose of, of why we recommended moving those permits to that hunt. So it's probably a valid concern and one that we thought about and, and moved forward with anyways. And not bio biology at all, but was, what was the hunter satisfaction been like on those hunts? Has it been pretty similar to the other hunts? The guys have had so, the mid-season tag? So hunter satisfaction, this is kind of interesting. Hunter satisfaction is very, very strongly correlated with success rates. Hunts that have high success rates have high hunter satisfaction. Uh, hunts that have low success rates have very low hunter satisfaction. So because of the high success rates, the hunter satisfaction has been pretty high. You know, if, if success rates go down, I would anticipate that hunter satisfaction would go down. The correlation between success rate and satisfaction score is super, super high. Any other questions? <laughs> Seeing none, I'll open it up to the public. If somebody has a question, it's time for questions, not for comments. Come up and, and stand at the, the podium here and ask to ask your question. Okay, there's a different age class recommended for the Book Cliffs Road List versus the rest of the Book Cliffs. Um, my understanding being it's the same herd of elk. What is the rationale in doing that? That's a great question. It essentially is the same herd of elk. Uh, the Book Cliffs Road List area has really limited access. There, there's essentially two trailheads, on, one on the north, one on the south, to, to get into the Road List area to hunt. Um, Right now, I think our priority in the roadless area has been the bison hunt. Um, it's a pretty unique opportunity for that once in a lifetime bison hunt. And we are experiencing issues with crowding, availability of parking. And, and that was something we took into consideration. Although they are essentially the same elk, there's, mo there's definitely movement back and forth. We decided to maintain the, high, the slightly higher age class in the roadless area, knowing that we would issue fewer elk permits there. But the trade off, the sacrifice, I guess, is that it makes more room for that pretty unique once in a lifetime bison hunting opportunity. So okay. it's, a, it's a fair question. All right, thank you. Uh, another one, why would multi-season limited entry tag holders not be allowed to hunt December archery? What's the rationale there? So the rationale behind that one is, um, and this is interesting, the multi-season permit holders typically have a lower success rate than like the September early rifle hunt. And I think it might be kind of the same effect I have. Like I bought a multi-season general season elk tag this year and I hunted one afternoon during the archery hunt. And I hunted, I think three, four days maybe during the any weapon hunt. And I'm, I'm here instead of out on the spike hunt. So when you buy that multi-season permit, maybe it lets folks feel a little too comfortable. And 
But yeah, we see a lower success rate on multi-season limited entry elk permit holders than we do on like the early rifle hunt. And with that late, uh, late hunt being something new, we didn't necessarily want to set ourselves up to the point, and, and I think it's something that some folks are a little bit nervous about, but we didn't want to set ourselves up to the point where everyone who is unsuccessful with the multi-season permit, which isn't a lot of folks, shows up on that late hunt too. Uh, so that's the rationale behind it. I really think that one's maybe not a deal breaker if that's something that folks really want to see. It's a small number of permits. So we could, we could change that if that's something folks really want to see. That's one, I don't know if we talked about that a whole lot in the committee, so. Okay, all right, and then just one more. Um, speaking specifically to limited entry elk, we make all these changes. How many more tags does it really give us? Can we take a guess as, is it 10%, 20%? Can we hazard a guess as to what kind of progress it makes? Currently we give around just over 3,000 limited entry elk permits. And this is, some of this we're guessing, you know, we, we have some pretty good data on these upper age class units by lowering the objective by a year, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what we may be able to offer. Again, that's assuming that you're dealing with a stable elk population. Um, you know, I think, and, and also, uh, this has been a question that's come up before too, folks are saying, so does that mean you're going to increase permits 40 to 50% next year when you recommend permit numbers? I don't think we're going to be that aggressive. I think we're going to work our way into it incrementally. Um, but, I, but I'm hoping that, you know, over time, as kind of the cumulative effect of changing weapon splits, changing season dates, um, and changing the age objective, instead of, you know, you know 3,000 limited entry up permits, you know, hopefully we can get to 4,000 plus. But I think it may take a little while to get there, and maybe it's more than that. We've seen, you know, on that Wasatch unit, I shared an example of the Wasatch unit, we, we increased permits 400% and still were meeting the age objective. And this plan opens the door to kind of push ourselves outside our comfort zones a little bit with the permit numbers we recognize. And there may be another Wasatch unit out there where we can really have substantial increases and still meet the age objectives. I don't think every unit is gonna withstand a 400% increase, but there may be another one of those out there. So uh, that's not a very specific answer, but uh, ballpark. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Okay, I'll turn the time over to Jason to review the online comments. All right, thanks, Brock. So for, for this, we had a total of 57 responses come, on, come in through online. Um, we had eight responses that strongly agreed, 14 somewhat agreed, six that neither agree nor disagree, six that somewhat disagree, and 23 that strongly disagree. And if we look at the weighted average, which um, gives a, a weighted score for each of the responses with five points, I suppose being uh, weighted for strongly agree and one for strongly disagree, the weighted average was 2.6. Um, a weighted average score of three would be a, a neither agree nor disagree. So this came in at slightly lower than three, uh, trending kind of towards the somewhat disagree, but um, some of the themes that I saw as I was reading through these comments, a lot of these themes have already been asked questions and have been covered pretty well. So it seems like they're um, being addressed. There are some comments about overcrowding issues and hunter distribution on the landscape. Um, there was uh, some sentiment to focus more on quality than opportunity. Uh, some of the things also concerned about waiting a long time and earning points, and now they're changing units um, and lowering the quality on some units that um, they may have been looking for and, and saving these points for through time. Sentiment to get rid of the multi-season tax. Uh, sentiment for no unlimited general season tags. Uh, not to have uh, two seasons, two seven day general season hunts, and then some tag allocation um, themes as well, which many of these things have been discussed, like I said. So that's the, the breakdown for those. Thank you, Jason. Now we'll have public comments um, again. 
We'll call your name one at a time. If you have a comment, we need to have one of these yellow cards. You still have time to get it in. If you're re representing yourself, you'll have up to three minutes. If you're representing an organization, you'll have up to five minutes. First comment, Bryce. <laughs> we love seeing you here, buddy. I wasn't gonna attempt your last name. <laughs> That's what I've always known you by, because I can't say your last name, buddy. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Bryce Castanetto, here representing myself. Just wanted to say that uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with all of you, and I understand a lot of hard work has gone into all of this, and um, I think what we have with the biologists here is incredibly powerful. It's, it's uh, something that I look forward to hearing what the reports are every single year. Um, <clears throat> I believe that I personally and strongly in favor for what the vision has uh, proposed. I think I'm an opportunity guy myself, and so I, I've got four sons that love to hunt, and I, I also feel that strong sentiment that I don't know if they'll ever have a tag, one of these desired tags that we all hope to have, but I, don't, I know they will not if we keep it where we are right now. And uh, I think opportunity is something that we all look forward to, I also think that a lot of us have forgotten what hunting really is as far as, you know, opportunity means just that. You don't have any guarantees. You need to go work your butt off or whatever it is. Sometimes we get lucky. And uh, I think that that opportunity that we will be given, I mean, it's not it's not a perfect world. Our, uh, our numbers as hunters, despite what everyone wants to say, it's growing. And that's evident in the fact that Point Creek continues to get out of control every single year. Uh, so I do not believe that hunters are, our numbers are diminishing, especially not in Utah. It's a wonderful state. There's lots of opportunities currently. And I, I see the division making a big push to continue to, to develop more and more opportunities. Um, with that, I would also like to say that as far as what we have on the table with the technology, I think that that needs to continue to be looked at. I don't think it's been perfected yet. I think we need to revisit that and really nail that down so that uh, before it goes to the next level, it can be mm, more accurate. And, and that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Bryce. Next comment by Craig. Bonham, yeah. Oh, that makes sense, I can see, yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to comment mainly on the West Desert deep creeks and turn it into a general unit. I strongly oppose that. Um, I've hunted out there since I was probably 10 years old. I love that mountain, I think it's amazing. I probably, I think I know it probably, there's, I think there's a few other people in here that know it as well, but but uh, I've never seen a DWR officer out there and I've probably spent you know, 40 to 60 days a year out there. Um, I feel like I know it really well and I, I feel like turning it into a general unit could be pretty rough. As as has been stated, there's about 200 elk that we can go out in there and hunt. Um, I, I think that's probably fairly accurate. That's not a lot of elk. Um, if, if we're looking at uh, 25 bulls per 100 cows, we're looking at 50 bulls to go hunt. Uh, they can go into Nevada real easy. They can go into the reservation really easy. And I just don't, I don't think it's, it's uh, something that's, that's actually well thought out. I also, uh, know almost every canyon in the unit, and and uh, there's not that many places for guys to go hunt without it being overcrowded. Um, a couple of the other th things that I look at, uh, um, it's it's kind of a it's a rough place. Um, I've, I've got more flat tires and probably spent more money on tire repair than anywhere in the entire. Uh, uh, I just spent a lot of money on it. Um, and and I'll I, I probably have four different tires on my truck right now trying to you know they're all different trying to patch them up but but uh, it, that being said it's you know we there are people out there that are are putting rebar and, and things in the road to, to make you have flat tires it's kind of a lawless place and a crazy place and I think putting more people out there it's it's uh, you're going to see more of that kind of stuff going on um, the meatloaf and hamburger analogy um, I like. I like hamburgers better than meatloaf too, but I feel like if you turn that into a general unit, you're pretty much burning down the restaurant. So hey, we're not gonna have any of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little different than the guy that got up first. Um, I, 
I take my kids out hunting all the time. I have two daughters that love to hunt. I've got a son that loves to hunt. They don't have to kill. They don't have to have a gun in their hand to have a great time. And so I know, I know point creeps happening. I, I get it. But, uh, but the West desert deep creeks is like, it could turn into a fiasco and I'd, I'd strongly oppose what you're doing, what the general season. That's it. Thank you. Paul Trosik. So Tosik. So see. <laughs> Um, my name is Paul Sosi. Um, I represent the, the Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Reservation. Um, I'm an attorney, so I think I get five minutes, right, instead of three? Only if you're representing a group, as far as I understand it. The, the Confederated Tribes of the Goshute Reservation. You bet. Then you yes. have five minutes. Thank you. Um, one thing that I'm looking at here is... Um, I've been practicing law for about 20 years and I've represented the ghost shoots almost that entire time. And during this time, we had, um, we need to protect our federally reserved treaty rights underneath the United States Constitution. The tribe, um, because these lands were set aside out there in this area on the ghost shoot reservation, were set aside for the, um, exclusive use and benefit of the tribal members. That includes wildlife. And to get to this point for these recommendations to be sent out, um, I do understand that, that the ghost shoots do have a seat here on the rack. I appreciate that. We, we worked hard, we lobbied hard to get that done. Um, however, if you look at the nation to nation relationship that the ghost shoots have with the state of Utah. In 2014, the governor passed an executive order. And in that executive order, it required consultation by every single executive entity with tribal governments when making substantial decisions that will have tribal implications. And it must be done at the highest level possible with the dis right decision makers, and it must be done at the earliest point possible. So I'm, I'm encouraging the DNR, all entities with the state of Utah, to really consider the impacts of your decisions upon the Goshu tribe out there. If we're talking about issuing 15,000 permits, if we're talking about um, adding the Deep Creek unit to the Any Bull unit, restructuring the um, harvest stage objectives. If we're looking at all those different things, you really need to consider the impacts upon the Ghost Shoot Tribe and their federally reserved treaty rights. And throughout these recommendations, it says that these are for recreational purposes. Recreational purposes are at a much lower level than federally reserved treaty rights. I mean, we all say here in Utah that um, the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land, that it's the greatest governing document in the world. And if that's true, we have to honor that. And we do that by honoring the treaty clause of the United States Constitution. Great nations, like great men, keep their word. So on behalf of the Confederate Tribes of the Goshen Reservation, these recommendations need to be run by the Confederated Tribes of the Goshen Reservation in person at the highest level possible, way before they're ever implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next one, Kyle Turpin. Oh, he doesn't want to comment. Do you want me to just read your comment? It's up to you. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so, uh, we, we run a farm on the, the what you guys call it, we call it the West Hills, you call it like the Moroni, Moroni Hills. So all that is private ground. The elk are hitting our farms. We're a small farm. We run like 400 acres of dairy hay. The, the West Hills is just dry ground. They're hitting the farms. And you guys want to open it up for all the public coming up to the bulls because all we have is bulls, no cows. All we're saying is help the farmers out or the ranchers, give them opportunity to go after the bulls and not the public. We're the ones that have to deal with them all the time. 
Um, well, I had one bull come around a barn, like the length of this room, and, and they're not scared of us. They're, they're kind of an odd group of bulls. Um, all I'm saying is quit telling the farmers to go pound sand and give them a chance to, you know, if you're just going to hand out these tags to all these people and have them going through our fields and damaging and cutting down fences and just raising heck. That's all. Thank you very much. Wade Garrett's next. He didn't want to comment, but he is expressing his support for the plan as presented. You check no. Yeah. But come on up, Wade. You can do it. This is not so. This is not surprising to me. <laughs> Coming from a BYU guy. Gosh. Are you representing the yes, farm bureau? Yes, I am. You're, okay, so yes. five minutes. I, I won't take five minutes, Mike. Uh, unless you want me to. Wade Garrett, um, representing Utah Farm Bureau, also a member of this committee. I got to listen to Brock's really riveting data uh, 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 one day of this, so you guys all should be jealous of me. Um, we worked really hard on this plan. Um, one of the reasons we did put that in any bowl is we understand there's private property, but hopefully you can now go buy a tag and be able to go uh, shoot one of those bulls on, on your private property because it is an any bull unit. That, that was part of the push. There's deprivation, those bulls. Ag does understand that they need to be um, shot, pushed around, help solve some of those deprivation issues. Um, there are several tools that I appreciate the group putting in here for ag as we go through this. Uh, they're important tools. I know it was give and take, but I appreciate those on the committee listening to those concerns. And hopefully we can work through that. And uh, I do support the plan as written and appreciate those that put all the hours into that. And I took less than my five minutes, Brock. Thank you, Wade. Next one, Kevin Norman, Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Kevin Norman representing SFW tonight. Um, just a little background on how our organization works to come up with our recommendations is we have a fulfillment committee that's compiled of our chapter chairs from every corner of the state, um, 17 of them. We come together and have a meeting kind of similar to this where it's a lot of learning, a lot of questions. Um, we're lucky enough to have Brock and Randy and many of the division employees that are here and and we was able to learn a lot of the why of this of this new plan. Um, you know, after lengthy discussion and, and many of these same questions, um, the consensus was that there was a lot of time and effort went into this plan and, and we didn't want to monkey with it much. Um, it's a good product. It's um, outside of the box. It's, uh, it's, everyone you know realize that there's maybe things they didn't love about it but there's give and take and and at the end of the day um we support the the plan as presented with with one exception um would be on the archery um the archery general season hunt um going to the two tag you can buy a, a bull and a cow tag um we would prefer if it stayed as is where you could harvest either sex um, with an archery bull tag. Um, Want to thank the committee for their hard work and the division for all the time they put in and, and, and we're pleased with this plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next is Brian Hollinger. Sorry. Brian Hollinger, I want to thank the committee for all the hard work they put into this. Um, my sentiments were in line with what Sportsman's for Fish and Wildlife had to say. I think the plan's great, pretty much all across the board. There's some give and take. The archery bull only portion of it, I feel strongly needs to stay as is. This is 
being able to harvest users X instead of buying the separate cow tag to be able to go do that. It, I think, takes a lot of pressure off of some of the other hunts for general season purposes if you buy only one tag. So that's, that's pretty much how I feel about it. Thank you very much. Next is Ridley Griggs. Okay, Ridley Griggs representing the organization of myself, so I want five minutes, but um, anyway. Um, I I think one comment, I think sales day is gonna be a real mess with the, the caps that have been set on multi-season tags and nobody likes it, but for multi-season at least, my sentiment is put it in a draw and don't shoot me on the way out, please, but that's how I feel. Um, I think it would make sense to let multi-season limited entry hunters hunt the December archery season. Um, it, it, when I read it, it struck me as a weird exception, um, maybe reminiscent of an old rule that allowed a sportsman permit hunter to hunt the Nebo, but only every other year and blah, blah, blah. It just caused trouble down the line. Um, I think that could happen too. And I think probably 95% of your multi-season hunters would be done by then anyway and harvest. So I, I say just, it's a once in a lifetime tag, let them hunt if they haven't harvested by then. Um, I really personally love the idea of bull only archery general season tags with separate cow tags. I, you know, when it takes, it's, it's taking a long time to draw um, other types of cow tags. I think it makes sense to um, have everybody choose what they wanna do and commit and use their points on it. Um, I strongly support the changed age objectives. I think that's the best way to make the most difference. Um, I also don't love how the archery season was moved four days later. We talk about, you know, increasing the challenge and, and things like that. And then on the archery side, we, we make a change that probably is gonna help success rates, I have to think. Um, it just doesn't seem to jive with a lot of the compromises that um, everyone else is trying to make. So. Uh, thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Craig Bonham, senior. First off, I'd like to ask a question. What is this bull score? <laughs> I was gonna say 380. Nobody knows, anyway. I, 371? Oh, pretty close. Yeah, it's a beautiful animal. Anyway, I'm, I'm here because uh, a long time ago, a good friend of mine, Dennis Shirley, s turned me on to the Deep Creek Mountains. And I have had taken my sons and friends out there ever since, since before 1980, out there to hunt. And it's been a, and it's been a wonderful thing. The first time I went out there, we hunted for three days and I saw over 50 bucks. It was unbelievable. I can go out there now hunting elk with my friends and I can hunt for 10 days. I'll be lucky during that elk hunt. I'll be lucky if I see six or eight deer at all. And why are we having a deer hunt out there? To make people happy so they can get a permit and go out there and run their four-wheelers and collect pine nuts and look at the wild horses that are increasing every year. I uh, knew Tom Beckers before he retired. We had a lot of conversation. I even went to the Juab County Recorder and I made copies of all the properties around on the deep cracks and I took those and I put them, uh, uh, wrote out a, a my topo maps so that I knew when I was out there where I was going. And when Tom retired, his replacement called me up and he said, will you take a day with me? I don't know the deep cricks. Will you take a day with me and show me around? I said, I would love to do that. Just give me a, a one day's notice. And I never heard from him. Was that Jason? I never did hear from him. I get the feeling that I've, like my son said, we've hunted out there for 30, 40 years, and I've never seen a game warden out there. I know, I know that the Henroids knew Tom 
and and some of the people in Pleasant Valley. But I I just get the feeling like uh, I'm a general contractor, and I can't build a house from my office. I've got to be out there on the job and see what's going on. Another thing, the Goshoot Indian Reservation planted the elk out there. I don't think there would be elk out there if they hadn't have done that. We ought to be given listening to them. Those property lines Five more in, seconds. go in and out and you're turning off general season hunters out of there. It's gonna be a mess. They're gonna have so many conflicts. Anyway, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Thank you very much. Daryl Spencer. Chairman, I'd like to hold my comment. That's already been addressed um, on, on item number five, the management, the elk management, but I do have a second, it's, it's twofold. I'd like to comment on item number eight when we get there, if I could, please. Okay. We'll, we'll put you on eight. Perry Hall. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Perry Hall. I represent Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Um, I had the, the privilege of sitting on the committee with a lot of people in this room and I first off wanted to say thank you all for your time as well as um, saying a heartfelt thank you to everyone at the division who put in a lot of time and effort and passion into this plan and I think the general population of Utah would have <coughs> a lot different things to say if they had the ability to sit in on most of those meetings and they are public so next time a plan's up please come to the meetings see the passion that these people have for the wildlife. Uh, that being said, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers supports the plan in full as written, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Cameron Perry. Yeah, I've um, just kind of state with what Kyle Turpin said. Um, I, I oppose the uh, Moroni Hills the way that they have it proposed because um, all of it, the majority of that unit is is private. And I mean, the, the public land is at the top of the, the very top of it, limited access. So all you're gonna do now, they're splitting it up into three hunts where the youth can start early and they'll just scatter them around and pursue them. So it'd be the, I disagree with the, you know, says buy a tag and go after them. Well, by the time they get there, they'll be off our land. They come back to our land after um, everybody's shot them, you know, shot at them or whatever. They, they cross the highway, go on the east side into the Manti unit where you can't shoot them. Then they come back during the winter, like right now, you know, we got bulls coming down like crazy. Same thing with my neighbor down the road from me, he has, um, bulls out on his fields all year long as well as we do, you know, and I, I, I agree with him that we, to work with the landowners, you know, and part of that is um, the way, in my opinion, that uh, this will create is you have large landowners or people that have locked up huge tracts of that unit, you know, in, in a, like a, their own WMU basically, and now they're gonna pay for, they'll be the ones that benefit from an any bull unit, not the rest of the public, because most of the public can't access that. And if they do, most of them are trespassing or cutting gates or fences to get in there and stuff. And so I don't think making an any bull unit's gonna help anything there. I, you know, I'm one of the ones that are, is affected by the bulls coming down. I'd just like to see something besides making an any bull unit. I don't know exactly what the, but you know, to work with the, the landowners, I know we don't have enough ground between the two of us, you know, to qualify for the big bull tags or anything like that, the way it's, it is now, but we're the ones, you know, because we're small landowners that we're gonna be suffering. And especially now when they open it up to the public Everybody their dog goes out there and trespass or whatever, you know, and and then it, as soon as the shooting starts, they're going to go to the big block owners that have the big areas tied up or head across the highway to where they're safe for a little while. And then as soon as that's done, they're coming back. So just I disagree with the way it is, you know, and especially to split it up into three seasons, 
you know, I just, I don't agree with that either. So, cause they're just going to pursue them for three seasons now and push them all over and you have people out there all the time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Kent Johnson. Kent Johnson, I'm here representing myself tonight as, and more as a member of the committee. I had the opportunity and the honor of serving on that committee. And I kind of wish everybody could have been there and seen the data and everything that we looked at. Like as, that, as Dax put in his presentation, we had eight meetings from April to August. The shortest meeting was four hours and the longest one was seven. We looked at data ad nauseum. But a lot of it was really good stuff. I, I enjoyed a lot of it. We learned things. Dax mentioned that the average age of a bull comes up to 320. And, and they hit their peak at around five and a half to six years old. They're at 96% of the growth they're going to be. And this data wasn't something that somebody pulled out of the air. This uh, Brock can probably remember the number of years they used to collect the data. But I remember 11 Western states, 18,000 bulls is what they collected the data from in a lab to, to learn this. This is some of the stuff we learned. We learned about you know elk mortality rates a little bit, what is known. And we had a lot of, now well, some of the discussions may have been heated, but I don't think they were that bad. And out of this, we came with the best possible product I think we could. There's a lot of thought, a lot of effort went into it. Did we all get what we wanted? Did, did we get the things we asked for and some of the dreams we may have had walking in? Absolutely not. Some of us, you know, myself included, I had learned to pull in my horns on some of the things I wanted to do when I learned more about what was going on and, and seeing more data. I think this is a good product. I'm proud of the work we've done. I'm grateful to have been able to serve on that committee and I support the plan as presented. Thank you, Ken. Kevin Adamson. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Adamson. I'm the president of Utah Archery Association, and I too was a member of the Elk Committee. My comments tonight are not only uh, directed at the RAC members, but also the general public who may be listening um, and those who are in attendance this evening. Before participating on this committee, I too would sit back. I'd read the forums. I'd see the comments from people that say, all they need to do is do this one thing, and they'd fix it. Why don't they just do this one thing, and they'd solve the problem? Today, having sat through the many hours of meetings and listening to the unbelievable data that the state has and working with as many knowledgeable people that participated on the committee, I learned it's not as easy as just fix one thing. This is a comprehensive, detailed plan that took hours to put together. The committee came together as sportsmen with a common goal. That common goal was, as Dax stated earlier, maintain quality while creating opportunity. Utah Archery Association supports the Division's Elk Plan with one exception. Utah Archery Association recommends that the general season archery elk tag remain as an either sex tag. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Farnsworth. Thank you. Matt Farnsworth representing myself. Um, I'm a very analytical person when it comes to a lot of the proposals um, I've sat on several boards, several working groups. I've worked with many of you on those. First time I read through this plan, I came out of my office screaming, yelling, throwing stuff up and down, stomping my feet. How could you get idiots together to come up with this? And about 15 times later reading it, I realized there's some really, really good stuff in there. It was for the first time in a long time, I've been excited about the future um, and nothing in particular, but the plan as a whole, just some of the opportunities that will create down the road, some of the unique hunts, the late season hunts, the 
only shooting a spike with your bow, but I can get rid of all these cow points I'm sitting on and buy a cow tag and kill two elk on the bow hunt. It, it's exciting stuff, and I fully support the plan as presented. Thank you guys for uh, all your work on the committee, and I apologize for my thoughts and some of my uh, opinions up front. That you guys might not have been as dumb as I thought you were. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, trust me, there are several there that are lacking. <laughs> Okay, Troy Justison. <laughs> Speaking of that. <laughs> Brock, you beat me to the punch because I am one of those dumb ones. So Troy Justison uh, here speaking tonight as myself as a representative on the Elk Committee. I was just sitting here as I heard this last comment. Um, I was dreading this round of racks just for the simple fact of the shakeup we did you know, through this elk committee. I really thought that through this process, we'd have a different response. It does my heart good. For those of you who know me, I've spent 30 years as a guide and outfitter in the state and success was dictated by a steel tape and social media. You know, I like the saying of putting the hunt back in the hunt. You know, I'm sitting on 25 deer points. I made the choice to, hey, I'm going to draw the biggest, baddest, best unit in the state. I freaking screwed up. If I could go back, I would trade those 25 points for more opportunity with my family, my kids, whatever, to go out and experience hunting and see what happens. Too many times we get hooked on entitlement. I heard on one of the forums that, People wait 20, 25 years, they should be entitled to a 370 inch bull. Absolutely ridiculous. Quite honestly, I don't, if you took all the people in the state that had over 20 some odd points, I don't think we have that many 370 inch bulls in the state. And quite honestly, what's the difference between a 340 and a 380 type bull? Not that much per time. You know, this does my heart good. You know, one thing I said when I sat on this committee, my whole goal in being on this committee was to maximize opportunity while maintaining quality. We still have room to grow. We need to get back out in the hills and get our kids hunting again. We all need to get out hunting again. And I've heard some comments saying that, hey, I get people out and even though you don't have a tag, they still get to get out. It's different. I mean, I'm waiting five years to draw a general deer tag on the boulder and I still go, but it's different when you have a tag in your pocket. I haven't killed a deer in 20 some odd years, but it's different when you have a tag in there and you have the potential. And so I support what the committee come up with 100%. I wanna thank all my other committee members. I wanna thank Brock and Randy. They've changed the way we manage wildlife in the state. And I wanna thank our partners at the Division of Wildlife Resources. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. I believe that's it. So I will turn it back to the rack for discussion or comment. Go ahead, Ken. Well, first off, I'd like to say thanks to the committee for putting in their time and, and effort. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting old and, and know that my hunting days are, are about done, but I'm glad to, to see some of these changes that are being made. I'm, I'm, worried about the hunting in Utah. I'm worried about the youth uh, and uh, being able to do the things which we can, get, we can do right now. And so, first off, I just, again, I'd like to uh, thank the working group for the dedication and the time that they put in to come up with this plan. And, and I know nobody's gonna be happy, or not nobody, but Half of us are gonna be happy with whatever happens and the other half's gonna be mad, but whatever happens. But whatever happens, it's gonna be a good decision. We'll make it a good decision. Thank you. Ken, go ahead, Mike. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I think it'd be a good idea if we split it into two sections and discuss it, a general season topic and, and address anything there that people have concerns with and then a, the limited entry side of things. Perfect, so let's start with general season. So if you want me, I could I could summarize some of the comments. I read every one of the comments. And so uh, the, the most frequent comment, the number one comment we received was don't make the general season unlimited. 
the second most common was don't change the artery to bull or cow, keep it as either sex. The third most common is get rid of the multi-season tags. Uh, the fourth most common was don't have a two seven two day two seven day hunts, and the rest only had one or two comments each. Those were the ones that had a significant number of comments. So let's let's start. That's a great comment. Let's start with general season. I just tried to summarize all of the the main comments that received in the comment period. And now we'll open it to comments from the rack. Ben and then Josh. So so comments currently just regarding the general season portion. That's correct. Right now we're just going to discuss okay. general season. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank the committee first for all the hard work they put in. They put in a lot of hours. Um, I was an alternate on the committee, so I attended some of those meetings. Um, they were good meetings, um, a lot of good discussion. Um, concerning general season, um, I want to address two things, the, the rifle, any bull general hunt and the archery general, um, general archery elk, um, and actually the, the youth general hunt too. I love the, I love what the committee did with the general youth hunt. Um, I hear comments all the time that people say a youth ought to be able to get a tag every year. And they're usually speaking specific to deer. We just can't do that with deer. There's not enough opportunity. If we did that for, for youth, adults would never hunt again. Um, we have that ability on elk. I love the fact that we're going to do that. It's awesome. Um, concerning the uh, the rifle, um, general elk. Um, personally, I don't like the idea of the two seven day hunts, but I can get behind it. Uh, and the reason why is because it gets us to unlimited tags. And I think that's important for maintaining general season opportunity. Um, I, I, and, and I think it's, it is, it is critical that we, that we main, that we support the, the committee on that um, unlimited tags on that second hunt. If I'll be honest with you, I think Dax is underselling it. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying it's not gonna, that it's going to be an easy hunt, but I don't know if it's going to be as hard as he's making it out to be. I don't know. Um, and I and I love the uh, meatloaf analogy. That was, that was awesome. Um, a, a thought that I've had because uh, I, I know the I believe the Northern Region put a cap on that last night in their recommendation. In my opinion: if you put a cap on that hunt, you're going to sell it out because there's a cap. A cap artificially inflates the demand. Um, if you go unlimited as is recommended, I honestly don't think what the I think it's going to sell less than the first season. I don't think you're going to sell 15,000 permits on that hunt if it's unlimited. If you put a cap on it at 15,000, I think you will. But if it's unlimited, I don't think that you will because the the uh, um, the urgency to buy that tag before it sells out is not there. So I think that's important. Um, regarding archery, general archery elk, um, I... I, I don't like, well, I don't so much mind the, 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 the bull tag and the cow tag being separate tags. It's not my favorite, um, but we've received quite a bit of feedback both tonight and in the online comments of people that don't like that change. Um, my biggest heartburn with that change is the intent is to take your cow points if you buy that cow tag um, we don't take your cow points if you buy a control permit. Also in this change is we're going to fix the private lands issue. We're no longer going to take points if you buy a private lands tag. We don't take your turkey points if you, draw, uh, if you, if you buy a general season turkey tag. There's a lot of precedents here not to do that. Absolutely hate that part of it. I, I cannot support um, that part of the recommendation. Um, so to me... Um, my preference would, would be concerning general season, support the plan with the exception of the archery. I'd like to see the archery stay the way that it is currently. Thank you, man. Go ahead, Josh. Thanks. Um, again, thank you to the Elk Committee. It's a huge undertaking. And thank you for that service. Um, two things on the general season. Number one, 
for those of you that know me, I'm almost always looking for more opportunity for more hunters. So to see these units be put out of the limited entry pool into a general unit, I think that's great, especially place like the Book Cliffs, uh, Floyd Canyon. There's few spots down in Southern Utah to hunt general. I think that's gonna be a great opportunity. I think the one exception, um, it sounds like the Goshoot tribe does not feel like their interest in this process was recognized early and soon enough. And so I support all of the moves to the general season hunt, except for deep creeks. I think the division needs to step back that portion of this plan and I'll make a motion to that effect um, and, and consult with the tribe before the plan is brought back in terms of that general deep creek hunt. Second point is in relation to the archery hunt, uh, moving it to uh, two tags instead of the one general. The first year, the multi-season bull came out. I bought it, I was excited. I passed on the second day of that hunt, 18 yards on a cow elk, uh, bedded, full draw, and I, I was holding out for a bull, and that was my choice. I know I made that choice. I went without an elk that year. So to, to do that archery hunt, you know, some guys say, well, why do you need two elk? Well, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I might shoot that elk on the first day and never shoot that bull. I might be happy and be done, but to have that choice, I think, really opens up a lot of opportunity for guys who spend a lot of time in the back country. So I support the elk committee's plan as presented, except for the Deep Creek issue. Thank you, Josh. I'll, I'll comment on, on, that, on that one thing. I'm, I'm torn right there. I mean, the one thing that the committee went, I was on the committee that we discussed at, at length was, Every time at every one of these rack meetings, there's going to be a group come in that say, don't change my unit. And so that's a good argument to not do the deep creeks. To me, it's a better argument than the deep creeks is where I spend all my time personally. But that, that's my comment. Can, can you go a little more? I'm not sure the, the point you're making there, Bart. The point is that, that I, I'm torn on whether to support as is or to follow what you're going to make a motion on here to keep the deep creeks out because I'm in, plan, I'm in favor of the plan as is and I don't want to start piecing apart little pieces. Then the whole thing falls apart. Huh. Okay. Let's go to Mike and then Danny and then Ken. Okay, um, I just hit, I'll just hit a, uh, maybe three or four topics. So the first topic is uh, the Mar Moroni Hills. Um, there was actually, I think, two or three or four comments in the, in the that we got online about it, uh, independent from the two gentlemen that are here. And I have actually talked to um, three different landowners that, that, that own property in that unit, and nobody is for that. Um, it's, it's, in no other area of the state are we taking a chunk of private that's in between two of our really good limited entry units and making that a general bull hunt. And everybody expressed the same thing that they're worried about their private property rights and, and you know, usage and how many people are gonna be in there. Um, I think there's other ways to go about it. So I, I would, my personal opinion is that we pull the Moroni Hills out. Um, um, the other thing that I'm actually really passionate about, and maybe I'm just crazy, is the multi-season tags. Now, you guys all know I don't, I, I don't like them, but I'm not gonna say let's do away with them. But there's a, there's a real public perception that the unlimited tags for that second hunt is gonna create issues. And unlimited doesn't mean, um, there, there's only a certain number of hunters that are gonna buy them. So it's not, it's not completely unlimited. But if we allow those 7,500 hunters to flop between those two seasons, however many people buy them in that second season are going to have to deal with the influx of, of the possibility of there being 7,500 hunters that come in there. Now, there's going to be successful people and whatever, but, but that's the perception. And, and I think if we, I could go along with the multi-season tags if we keep them and make them only for the first season. And then we don't duplicate that 7,500 into the next season also. I think it would reduce crowding. I think it would make for a better hunt. I mean, I want, I'm an opportunist. I've been an opportunist for decades. I love to hear what Troy said. Um, 
That's, that's what hunting is. And at the same time, if we can not double dip and allow that second group to have a good hunt with, with, with less hunters, um, and the less hunters are only people that have already hunted, it's not cutting anybody out. So, so I would recommend that we only allow the multi-season uh, permits to be used in the first season. And then, um, you know, we, we I, I probably get accosted out in the parking lot when I say this, but uh, I put in for archery elk tags and I like to archery elk hunt. And I think it's time for the archery elk hunters to kind of take it with the rest of the hunters. In this plan, the archery elk hunters, they get more days unlimited entry. They get, they can have an additional elk tag or if we don't change it, they can shoot a cow or a bull. Um, they get an additional limited entry elk hunt. Um, the point of that is, I think it's good to force people to use their points to hunt these animals. If, there's, if we're killing six to 700 cow elk a year through our archery hunt, that's the equivalent of 1,500 um, antlerless permits that, that could be given out in the draw. And we're not, they might have to buy their point or use their points that first year, but then they can still go buy that tag. I mean, how many rifle hunters would love to give up three or four points to be able to just go buy a tag, a cow tag over the, over the counter? And so um, I, I, I kind of go along with Josh that, that um, I think the two tag option actually opens up more opportunities um, where a person could shoot two elk rather than just one. Um, but then they got to use their points to do that. And I, I've used my points to buy private land cow tags. So, so maybe I'm just uh, up in the night on that. But um, let's see. You know, the Deep Creeks one does give me heartburn a little bit because of what the tribe said and their representation. So, um, I mean, it's 200 elk. I don't know that I'm going to fall on that sword to... To, to maintain that. Um, what, really quick, Dax, what was it as a limited entry, or was it a hams hunt with no, um, with no age objective? Sorry. Yeah, we've, we've tried several different things in the deep creeks. Um, at one point it was managed for our highest age objective. Mm -hmm. Then we've the gone lowest. Up, and, up and down on permits, and then we, and then we low, uh, it's been a hams hunt the last year or two, uh, where it was, you know, a September archery hunt, and then the handgun archery muzzleloader shotgun the last. All right. I think that's all I have for now. I, if I could, Mr. Chair, one uh, kind of a clarification that maybe helps, um, maybe not, maybe helps with the uh, Moroni Hills recommendation. Um, in a lot of the states, particularly the northern portion of the state, and, and even like a few units like the Zion unit down south, uh, having an any bull designation on units that have big blocks of private land has actually been really helpful for landowners. It gives them the flexibility to, if they don't want elk on their land, you know, between private lands only tags and then, uh, you know, having that any bull hunting, you know, they can really have a lot of control to influence how, you know, what, what kind of elk they have on their land. Uh, one of the other things to, to keep in mind as well, when we, you know, and this is one of the strategies in the plan, uh, when we deal with, you know, resident elk herds or elk herds that spend uh, considerable amounts of time on private lands, we have more flexibility, we're more liberal with working with landowners and those types of situations, like on a general season any bull unit, then we are in a limited entry unit. If someone who has land on a limited entry unit wants bull tags during a different season date to address you know, damage issues they might be experiencing on their private lands, we approach that a lot more cautiously if it's on a limited entry unit. If it's on a general season any bull unit, we have the ability to be a lot more liberal with uh, helping to address problems on private land. So, you know, I, I just wanted to share that. I don't know that that helps or, or, or not, but I wanted to, to share that. Okay, Danny. Dax, seven hours? I mean, seriously, that, did you guys, did you guys have a meal or something? That's crazy. Did you guys buy them food? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so. It, it was still too long. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've been to quite a few of these rack meetings now and, and I'm getting old. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I, I think that the tribe has got some excellent points and sort of the lo local landowners and everything, and it all makes way too much sense to me. So I would probably 
you know, oppose the, you know, the, the general season uh, for, the, for the Deep Creeks. It's a cute place. Uh, and then uh, as a meat hunter, uh, you know, I, I, I still think, uh, I agree with, with, with Josh, that, that the either sex uh, and sportsmen from Fish and Wildlife, the either sex, uh, you know, archery thing makes the most sense rather than trying to split the two. And anyway. Thank you, Danny. Go ahead, Ken. Biggest problem I have with the comments from people, not necessarily in this room, but over the internet, and what we've heard some tonight is crowding issues. When I was in my 30s, we sold 280,000 deer tags over the counter. School got out at one o'clock, Monday was off, and you couldn't find a spot that wasn't orange in the mountains. And now we're sitting down talking about overcrowding. And I sit down and think, you guys have no idea what a crowding issue is. So I'm, but technically I understand the, the tribal issue. I understand the archery issue, but I also understand that these guys put a lot of time in uh, on the committee and I think we, I, I like it. Go ahead, Scott. So as I listened to and read this plan, there were there was a lot of zingers. I think everybody felt that way. A lot, a lot of zingers, which probably means you just landed in a good spot. Um, there's things that I just hate, and there's things that I'm okay with, and there's things that I could care less about. But overall, I, I'm going to support it. I'm with Josh. I think we probably need to coordinate with the tribe. And I'm not necessarily against not putting the tribe in there as a general uh, unit. I just think we need to coordinate with the tribe before doing so. Amos and then Braden. Okay. Yeah, you know, we uh, you know, appreciate the, the comments. That's all been made, uh, and unfortunately, it's uh, uh, we kind of get laid on the on the issues that's at hand, you know, for the plans. You know, it's the tribe itself, but to to understand what the state's looking at and what they're what they want to do, uh, it's something that we need to work with the state on uh, for all areas. You know, not just the area where I'm coming from, because I'm familiar with that area, so I, I see what goes on on a on a yearly basis. You know, when it when it comes to that time, so we we're familiar with what 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 goes on. You know, and I'm sure everybody else has uh, what they see in your areas. You know, what what impacts and what what your concerns are, and so we uh, we'd like to uh, address those too as well within our own organization. Because we, we only permit five bull elk to our tribal members per year. And this has been going on for quite some time. So like plans like this, maybe we ought to start looking at our own and increasing ours too, maybe possibility. That's what we have to look at too as well. And then we have an outfitter that comes in and they, they're only limited to so much. So we were, we were talking about 900 elk on the on that particular area. But you know it goes off and on the uh, uh, reservation and onto uh, BLM land, private lands, wherever it goes. You know they they go wherever they want to go because you we push them to one area to another. So we're uh, you know so if you're sitting on the other side of the fence, you're waiting for that particular animal. So that's that's what goes on in our area. We're because I see it today. You know I've uh, seen a guy sitting there this morning watching some elk sitting on the private land. I don't know if he's got a tag for it or not, but he's waiting for him to, to come off so he could uh, get his fill his tag, whatever it is that he's got. So, yeah, I understand, you know, the, the committee previously, whoever's been working on the plan, you know, they probably put hours in putting this all together. So, and uh, with me coming on, you know, I just, felt that uh, we need a representative from our area to uh, to give input. You know, I think it's time we uh, 
give it, but you know, we're one, you know, want to be heard and uh, help with future plannings. You know, I too have uh, children too as well that are uh, grown up and uh, like to enjoy the hunting indoor, the outdoors. I have grandchildren now that are in the same way. So we're, uh, like I said, but we're limited what we can do. I know most of our members, they don't go out and get public tags. You know, they don't apply for those areas, uh, but you know, they prefer just stay there. You know, they, they talk about the, uh, the animal, the way the, some of the meat tastes, you know, they like prefer some particular areas. So, you know, and that traditionally, that's how we, uh, how we hunt. So, and never really had any thoughts about public lands or other areas, you know, we just kind of in our own area and that's what we deal with. But now we're sitting here at the table and seeing and listening to comments of what's what you all deal with. And uh, I'd like to get more knowledgeable what you guys deal with, what you're planning on. So we could be in favor and sit at the same table here and uh, help put things in action, you know, put those things in motion. So whatever, you know, like you said, you know, may not, not agree on what's, what's, what's planned, but you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's something good. We don't know. You know, that's how we, we always look at things. You know, we're, uh, we just don't know until we try, you know, and I don't, I can't say I don't disagree with a lot of things. I, I like to hear things out and to uh, listen to both sides before I make a decision. And so uh, sitting here, that's kind of the situation I'm at right now. And I'm, I'm taking in a lot of comments, a lot of input from the public and from the board here. So I could help, you know, be here and be part of that. So, you know, that those are my comments. So, and I, you know, thank you for listening. Thank you, Amos. Appreciate that. Raiden? I've spent some time out there at the Goshoot uh, Reservation, and, and one of the biggest bulls I've seen was, I was telling Amos before, was his, he had a name, Amos. What was the name of that bull? Uh, Bernie. Burley. There's a big old bull elk. Just you'd see him out there with the cows, bedded down, you know, with the moo cows. He thought he was a he thought he was a cow. That's how he identified, I guess. Um, sorry, bad joke. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple comments I want to address. I think first off, because of my role with ag, um, I heard uh, Perry. I heard, I heard I heard you, Kyle, about the Morona Hills. Um, I think. I work with a landowner that owns quite a bit of private land. And so, and we have land that's both in CWMUs, we've got land that's in general bull units and land that's in limited entry units. And I think uh, one, one of our areas, we had we have property, when it went to general bull unit, there was a lot of people saying, God, the sky's gonna fall, All of, you know, this is gonna be a problem. A lot of our neighbors were saying, man, opportunity is gonna disappear, people are gonna trespass. And actually it's been the opposite. I think uh, we've had more tools in our toolbox to manage impacts to our corn and our, and our alfalfa. Um, this year alone, we took out a couple of youth hunters, got, got them on some bulls. It was a lot of fun. I was out there on one of them, one of my feather kid missed. So um, I think there's some tools in the toolbox. I, I've been in the Morona Hills area. I, I love it. It's got a interesting layout though. The bottom is all private with that top of it being BLM. There's two dads that didn't want to add. You're going to when I read the plan, it seemed there were some tools in the toolbox that you could still continue to add additional hunts if there's enough concern. So I think yeah. it's not like this is the only way to manage Morona Hills, right? Can't we do, we could do a general, but you could also do other hunts on a more specific. Absolutely. That was a, sp a strategy that we specifically included in the plan to deal with these types of situations where, you know, you potentially have a lot of elk that are, you know, causing damage on private lands. And uh, we wrote in there specifically to have the flexibility to, you know, maybe have specific quotas or different season dates, whatever that could be tailor made to address an issue that might exist on a private. Yeah, that's I think that's helpful. And I, like I said, I think this Morona Hills. I got a, I got a couple of comments as well on it, but I think there's ways we can work through it. Um, but the Goshen just echoed with the tribe that maybe there didn't the capital C consultation that did ring a bell with me. I'm an attorney. I get that there's a need to consult with the tribe. Um, but I'm not aware of how that all went down. So it sounds like there's a request and maybe one of the things we could do is 
pass the plan as presented, but have, have a caveat that there's some consultation that proceeds and maybe we have a ham hunt next year with consultation. I guess we've got time to work through that issue. So not, I think there's some things we can do in the meantime. Um, archery, I'm still torn. I'm a bow hunter. I'm, I'm probably torn because I'm a crappy bow hunter and I end up shooting cow elk because I can't kill a bull, I guess. Um, so maybe, maybe that's what I'm struggling with this one a little bit. I did have some calls besides the emails. I had quite a few guys at bow as well that called and just said, I hate this. This is terrible. Um, but I've, I've also heard what Dak said that it can be an opportunity that, you know, you, you got to sacrifice points. Um, other than that, multi season, the last point I wanted to talk about was, you know, Mike, I kind of see where you're coming from on that. I, I think we're going to get, hey, either what, whatever we do today, right? If we decide to say you can't hunt that unlimited, that late hunt, we're going to have people with the multi season tag going to start emailing us saying we're crazy. At the same time, I think. I've never bought the tag. I was going to buy it this year, but I'm going to Nebraska here in a few days. So I need to go to, go home and go to bed soon, guys, so I can get ready for my Nebraska hunt. Um, I don't know. Let's think about that one. I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Sorry, Dax. My understanding of the multi-season tag and on this crowding issue, everyone said, man, ever since multi-season came out, the crowding has been terrible on the rifle hunt. But didn't those tags come out? They're coming out of the general season anyway, right? Yeah, multi-season tags would not have contributed to additional crowding than the rifle hunt. During the, the archery season or muzzleloader season, potentially, but during, during the rifle season, that's the quota that came out and of. See, I was getting a lot of the, 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 the rifle hunts crowded, so I don't know if it's been, maybe they just didn't clarify their comments. I don't know. So maybe it's more the muzzleloader season's crowded. Okay. That's all. Any other comments that haven't been made? And if not, I'd entertain any motions regarding the general season. Go ahead. Ben, um, I'll I'll lead out with a motion. Um, I I would move that we accept the general season portion, with the exception of the archery elk, and that we leave it as currently is. Yeah, I'll I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second that we accept the general season recommendations as written, with the exception of the archery tag. Leave as is. Either sex is that. Accurate. Okay, comments on the, or discussion on the motion. Yeah, I, I think that that kind of a motion um, negates everybody else's input. And so, and I understand why it would be made, um, but I, I'm, I'm gonna vote against that because I think there's some issues that need to be addressed such, a, such as the deep creeks. I, I think that that's a, a, a no brainer issue. Um, and then I've, you know, obviously we have our own concerns, but. Okay. Any other any other discussion on the motion that's on the table? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I probably would uh, also oppose that motion, and I would probably oppose the motion if it just had the deeps. I would oppose a motion that would just have Moroni Hills, and I would oppose a motion. I think if we that would be five or six separate motions for each one of those options, and I think we lose the credibility of what the group has spent all that time doing in this plan, even though I, I too, on a personal side, see those needs for some of that as well, but I think we lose the credibility of what the, the group has done to put this plan forward. So, so what, are, what are you, you're opposed to this motion or you're in favor of? of I'm opposed, of, I would be, be opposed to this motion and then I can see somebody making another motion for each one of those so each one things. of those specific things against the plan. Yeah, so I think either we do, it's either got to have all of those included to take in everybody's input or we accept it as one. And I would make a motion that way to accept it as okay. it is presented. That's fine. So Ben, you want to try again? Well, the, we have vote. a motion on the table. Yeah. So yeah. we have to right. vote on the motion or he has to withdraw the motion. And so, and so, and so, unless he says he wants to withdraw, we'll call a vote and see where people come. So I, I'm I'm comfortable with the rest of, of the of the general season portion as as recommended. A couple comments, like um, I understand the concern. Well, actually, I I don't know if I do understand the concern on Moroni Hills or or the Deep Cricks. I mean, on Moroni Hills, the gentleman asked for. Why aren't we giving these opportunities to the landowners? Well, that's exactly what this does. With with the late season and unlimited opportunities and, and or unlimited tags and also the general archery being unlimited, 
I mean, that's that's a landowner could buy a tag every year and whoever they want could buy a tag every year and they can hunt their own property. Like, I feel like this solves that problem that they're that they're saying, help us solve this problem. I don't understand that concern there um, on the deep creeks. Um, and we're talking about managing the public portion, public lands out there, not the not the tribal lands. Um, and as Dak said, this will probably push elk onto the tribal lands. I don't, I, I don't understand or or see how this plan would have a negative impact on the tribe out there. Maybe I'm missing something, uh, but that's the 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 reason for my motion. And and I, I if. If we vote on it and it fails, then let's we'll start having the discussions with the other other pieces. Perfect. Go ahead, Josh. Ben, can you maybe just briefly explain why the caveat for the archery hunt then, and as opposed to accepting the plan as presented? Yeah. Um, the 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 reason for that is there's been there's been several comments. Um, is various comments on on this people just generally like the way it is currently with the, the uh, either sex option uh I, we've all seen the comments of this is just a money grab you want to sell two permits i don't believe that but there's that perception out there um i i understand um i do understand how it, it can be an additional opportunity um, but like i stated earlier my biggest uh my biggest opposition to this is the taking of your cow elk points if you buy that over-the-counter unlimited cow archery elk tag that just it doesn't it doesn't fit with what we do with every other over-the-counter tag uh and regarding points and i just i can't get behind that um if if that was altered maybe um maybe i could get behind that i received a a, a comment from somebody that said what if we leave it either sex and sell an additional cow tag and that one takes your points um that's kind of a compromise that maybe fits both bills uh I, and maybe that's something we could we could discuss or pursue further if this motion fails i think you made good comments ben go ahead Braden. no i i, I like that suggestion ben i actually had a couple guys call that had similar ideas of keep the archery tag as is and then let me buy a separate tag if I want to. But I, I don't know if that gets to the plan's objectives, right? Of kind of dealing with point creep and other issues. So that's, but um, yeah, um, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. I, I, I looked at Brock and all of a sudden like, it was like, I had BYU PTSD or something, you know, it's like a test or something's gonna come up here. We get that all the time. <laughs> um, no, I, on that archery, on the archery thing, how, on your membership, I heard it from SFW, there was a, quite a few groups that said, hey, I support the plan as presented except for this this change. It was our SFW and Utah Archery Association both were the two groups. And then I think we, there were several comments in the online comments. It was the second most common yeah. comment. Yeah, I, was say, I felt like in my email, that was one of the biggest things I kept yeah. seeing was archery. And that's part of where I'm coming from on this as well, is, is okay. those, that feedback. And then what's the limiting factor on the elk at Deep Creek? You know, how can we only have 200... Uh, I heard 500 at one point, but is, there, is it just how dry it is out there and lack of water, is, or what's the biggest area well, laughs? It, it was stated that there's 900 elk out there. Jason, you want to address that? On public Love lands. Um, but before we go there, I also want to point out on this either sex archery elk, Dex made the comment, I wrote it down <laughs> so that I could refer back to it. He said, we, we want to encourage antlerless harvest during the archery hunt, and either sex elk tag does exactly that. Okay, Jason's online. He wants he's going to address the deep creeks. Go ahead. Yeah, so the deep creeks have always been a difficult unit to manage. Um, has been stated, you know, you have the, the tribal lands there, you have some BLM lands, private lands, and then you also have the Nevada state line. So it's always been a difficult unit to manage just because elk move and they move quickly with with hunting pressure. Um, so on the on the entire mountain, we estimate that there's about 950 elk, um, with the majority of those being on the tribe, about 750-ish. We don't have a, a great number from our, our standpoint. Um, we don't manage elk on the tribe. We manage the, the portion of Utah, um, essentially non-tribal lands. And on that portion, we generally have between 150 and 200 elk. 
that um, are generally on public lands, but they do move to Nevada. They do move on to the tribe. Um, so we've tried a, a variety of different management strategies out there with the strictly limited entry. Um, last two years, it's been under the archery and hams. Um, and, and honestly, um, we haven't found a great fit for that unit yet. And so the thought was to try this, this strategy to see if this would work for that, that difficult unit. With, with the thought being, just as Dax mentioned, that with some hunting pressure, um, worst case scenario, the, the elk would go on to the tribe um, and that would give them more hunting opportunity. And then, you know, it, it, honestly, the best habitat is on the tribe. The, the major limiting factor for that population is precipitation. Um, it's a dry Great Basin mountain range, um, but the elk do very well um, where we get, have good, good habitat. And just the way the land ownership is, uh, most of the best habitat is on the tribe. Thank you, Jason. So Ben and Braden kind of brought up a, the my my problem with this uh, motion is what was the first most commented thing, Brock? Uh, the first most common comment was do not have an un unlimited general season. Okay, and then what was the third? Third was get rid of the multi season. Okay, so so if we want to cherry pick and say, well, now we had the second most commented one, so we're going to avoid the the first and the third. So that's all. That's all I'm saying. So I, I think it's time to call the question. I'll call the, the question's been called. So I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion that Ben made? We don't have a second. Yeah, we do. Who's this? Oh, Danny. Danny. Okay. So all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. All those opposed. Okay, I'm ready to entertain whatever. <laughs> Danny voted against. I'll make another motion. Um, I had my hand up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Let's hear it. Okay, I would make the motion that um, that we make the multi-season tags good only for the first uh, rifle hunt and the archery and muzzleloader hunts, but not for the, they're excluded from the second hunt. Okay, we have a motion to make the multi-season only for, to exclude the second seven day period of the, of the rifle. Do we have a second? I could get behind that, I'll second that. Okay, Braden, we've got a second. I'll be the guy that gets flagged in the parking lot now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the reason is, is that kind of, alleviates a little bit of that unlimited pressure idea because there's only so many elk hunters that can buy tags. I mean, it's an unlimited tags, but there's only so many people that are going to do that. But then that takes, a, you know, an additional 7,500 people off the landscape for that second, that second hunt. And I just need to be a better muzzleloader hunt. I just, I need to, I can wait till the muzzleloader hunt to go back and keep hunting. There so, you go. Yeah. Any other comments on the motion? Go ahead, Ben. Um, Personally, I like the idea of the multi-season being able to hunt both of them. And the reason why I I am not a generally not a fan of short seasons. I like longer seasons, let people spread themselves out. Um, the only reason I was able to get behind this proposal is because it got us to unlimited permits. I like the I like the idea of keeping letting the multi-season hunt both because it keeps that opportunity to have that two-week rival hunt for for some people that want it. Danny. Well, and, all, and, and also, you know, you throw the wrench in the works, which is weather. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, I, I agree with Ben. Okay. Seeing no other comments, I'm gonna call the question on this. So the motion that we're voting on is to exclude the second seven day hunt from the multi-season tag of the general season. All those in favor. All, the, all, the, all those opposed. <laughs> but motion fails. Two to two to seven. Two to eight. Okay. Next one. I'll make a motion. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's okay, Josh. I'd like to make a motion to remove 
the Deep Creeks uh, general hunt, um, not indefinitely, but say bring it <clears throat> after a year, you know, after the, the tribe has had more time to work with the division. Um, so I would, I would just see this one piece removed from the plan as presented. Yeah, and I, and I second that because uh, that's why I seconded Ben's motion initially. Okay, we have a motion and a second to so remove this, the deep creeks. Is this for uh, both limited entry and general season? Or are we just talking about general I season? I thought we were just talking point? general season. We're just right talking now. general season. It's all, it, What that would mean is it stays in a ham's hunt. Uh, okay, that's what I was going to ask. Is it stay as a ham's hunt? It then? would stay as a ham's hunt. Uh, if that, if this, we're recommending that it stay as a ham's hunt if if this motion passes, any I, discussion? I, I guess I can rephrase my motion. The motion would be to keep the deep creeks as status quo for right now. Yeah, that's what I'm agreeing to. So go ahead, Ben. Um, I'm opposed to this motion and the reason why is the intent of this plan is to give as much opportunity as possible this is one of those areas where we can give additional opportunity by making it general season. Um, we're not adding any hunters onto the tribal lands. We're not talking about tribal lands at all. We're talking about public lands within the state of Utah. Um, I think we need to uh, support the committee on this and and make this a, a, a general season hunt. And, and, and I give that personally agree with Ben. I think that if anything, it benefits the tribal lands if we if we do this yeah it's already been stated that i mean if anything it's going to push elk onto the tribal lands and, and if if the tribe wants more elk opportunity that gives them more elk opportunity i mean it, yeah i um, i'd like to hear your thoughts amos well if you if you look at that yeah uh, yeah, I would agree it would benefit, but uh, again, you know, we're, we're uh, we have a season two that we uh, we hunt within, and as I see it, we you have uh, hunters that are out there at the same time during that season as well. So you got like we mentioned earlier, you have elk that's going off and on the reservation. So. Uh, I just, I didn't, you know, maybe I'm contradicting myself, but I don't see it, that, that advantage there. It's just, uh, it's just something that we need to work out in numbers and what we, uh, what we look at overall. Uh, I don't I think a year would to work with the uh, DNR and, and we come up with some good numbers and uh, we could work out what what's what's feasible for everybody, you know, on the on the on the numbers and what's what can be harvested, and uh, so we're not bumping into each other. Yeah, okay. that's pretty much what we're what we're looking at. We don't want to have any conflict with anybody. We just want to, you know, have our season. You could have your season, and uh, we could all enjoy hunting. Perfect. The, Brock, this this situation isn't unique. We have the same situation on the South Slope. With elk, we have the situation with bison in the book cliffs and the tribe. We have deer and elk units in southern Utah that border tribal lands. Um, I, I mean, the, um, this the current motion would go against the precedents, I guess, that we've set on the South Slope and other similar scenarios. So, Danny, do you have a comment? Yeah, all, 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 all I think we're really looking for is, is a, just a timeout for one year. Okay, oh. I, I would agree. I, I think maybe just in the future, just having uh, tribal representation on these committees is an important thing. I, I suspect maybe we didn't realize the obligation that we are under there, or, or maybe I, regardless, I, I think it's just a good idea to have tribal representation. But I'm I'm not a, I'm not opposed to the deep creeps deep, deep, deep creeps becoming part of that general season unit. 
Okay, go ahead, Eric. So my question is, are we going to just parse out the Deep Creek's unit itself and leave the rest of the general portion that they have, which would include all of of uh, basically Brad Miller County, that the yeah. confusion, Swayze's, all that kind of good stuff there? Because, you know, having hunted out on the deeps myself and spent a lot of time out there chasing wild horses, all that kind of good stuff. And, and seeing, I understand that too. And I understand the, that there's, I mean, it's, it's a tough hunt, even when it was a draw hunt. And, uh, you know, you have those hunters surrounded the little, one little farmer guy's hayfield out there on the Ivapaw side and sitting on the border of the, the tribal fence waiting for that elk to cross over. And, and it's a tough hunt regardless. I think having is a general season, you know, I don't know if, if, I would take my family to go back out there on a general unit, you know, but I, and, and I appreciate Amos's comments, especially when he said that possibly that would allow some of those tribal members that are waiting for that, one of those five tags to draw that possibly look at going on the general side and being able to hunt that mountain. You know, I thought that was a good comment or a good thought process there too, but so I would have probably still oppose this motion on that. Okay. I'll call the question. So the, the motion is that we, uh, pool the deep creek uh, we recommend that the deep creeks not to be included as a general season and stays as a hams for one year to consult with the tribe all those in favor all those opposed motion passes six to three You know, I, I appreciate the discussion that's gone on um, surrounding the deep creeks and some of the challenges that have been brought up today. And, and I'd commit that as a central region, as an, an agency, that we would continue or start to reach out to the tribe and uh, meet with them regularly and, and annually so that we don't, um, I think as Amos mentioned, that bump into each other or run up against each other and that we can, can that we can have a, a hunt that is gonna be beneficial to both of us. And, you know, I see Dax coming up. This, this is a plan that's, that's in place, but can be um, changed throughout the life of the plan. And, and I think we can have those discussions with, with the tribe. Just a point of clarification. So the motion was to accept the general season portion as recommended with the exclusion of the Goshu lands? Because we weren't recommending anything on the Goshu lands. Oh, to, so the non-tribal lands on the Deep Creek, leave, leave that out. Oh, That's okay. what the motion was. So permanently or with the one For year? For one year. One year with the direction to? Consult with the tribe. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ken. I just want to know if we're going to nitpick this plan. I agree. Uh, that these guys have spent their time on and got in. I mean, I can see the Moroni Hill. I can see it all. But I'd like to make a motion that we accept the plan, the, re the rest of the plan is presented. <laughs> Third. No. Way. <laughs> okay, we have a motion and a second to accept the remainder of the plan as presented. Just general Just season or the whole or the whole plan? I'd go for the whole plan. Okay. Hey, Mike, you seconded that, we've Mike. We've got a whole plan and a second with any still nodding. So, so any discussion on this? We do have a second, Scott. Scott's still seconding. Go, go ahead, Eric. Eric first, then Mike. So as a point of clarification on the last motion, wasn't it to accept the general unit as it is with the exception of the deeps so we that's correct so right now well all we've done is we've taken the deep creek unit out of the general season and left it in hams for one year oh so we didn't accept the remainder of the we re of the general <laughs> no we haven't done anything part. i thought that was i thought that's what the motion was was to no accept the, it as the, the general with the the motion was okay. to remove the deep creek okay. from the general season thank you for one year thank you Okay, any discussion on the motion, which is to accept the remainder as presented? F first Mike, then Ben. And that's the, that includes the limited entry, that's per correct. my understanding. That's correct. Okay, I wanna say one thing. I've, uh, I've served on a lot of committees 
and I'm a big boy, and I can show up to Iraq and have them discuss what we talked about. That's the public process. I'm, I'm a big enough man that, that the, the, the racks can change some of those things. I don't know everything. So I really take offense when it's like, oh, we can't pick this plan. So why do we have the public process? Should we just rubber stamp it? It's ridiculous, okay? I mean, I've just, I just spent the la in the last like six years, I've spent tons of hours and my time sitting on landowner association ones, Cougar, management plans, CWMU. I mean, I just take offense when we start to hijack the public process and say, well, just because these I, men. I don't think anybody's hijacking the public well, process. Well, so when, there, when, we have a motion. Do you have a comment on the motion? Well, that's my comment on the motion because the mo motion was made with that intent that we shouldn't nitpick or talk about and discuss the issues in the plan. That's what I'm Maybe talking about. Maybe the motion was made because they like the rest of it too. But we did agree initially to just talk about the general portion. We did, but we have a motion on the table. So that's the, if you want to oppose the motion, that's great. So I'm in opposition to this for that very reason. Um, it was stated earlier on my motion that that takes away the opportunity to discuss various points. There's still another point I want to discuss. So. Everybody, so I'll call the question. All those in favor. So the motion on the table is approve the plan, the rest of the plan as presented. Mo all those in favor. Opposed. Motion fails. Two to six with one abstention. I'll make the motion that we accept the remainder of the general season uh, portions of the plan. A second. Okay, we have a motion on the motion on the table to accept the remainder of the general season as presented. Any discussion on that? Go ahead, Ben. Um, I'm going to be in opposition to this because I want to support the, the the feedback we've got on the archery elk. I'd like to see that. Um, I'd like to see that get a vote. So Mike made the motion. Second was second was by Josh. Any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Passes five to three. Okay. Now I guess we're on to limited entry. <laughs> hey, we can turn that page, right? So the. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, your reason is you're opposed to the to the separate tags for the archery. That's the opposition by all three. That's good to have in the minutes so I know what to talk to when the, we go to the board. Excellent. Okay, limited entry discussion. I have a little bit of the heartburn with the five-day rifle hunt, um, simply because in the last couple of years, We've lost two or three days to weather over that period of time, um, and it takes two weekends out of the out of the hunt for for uh, youth hunters. I know that you know that it's not it's not a deal breaker for me, but it just feels like uh, feels like that's an awfully short amount of time if we get any kind of circumstances that that make it tough. But. Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Mike, I love you, <laughs> but I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I, I, um, I, I agree with you that I don't like the five-day rifle hunt in September, but it's because I don't want it there at all. Um, as was stated earlier, the, go, the, the committee was split on this. Uh, half of them wanted to get away, to, to completely do, do away with it, um, and that's the camp that I would fall in. Um, so I'm willing to accept the five day hunt as the compromise. Um, and, and so I, yeah, I can support it because that was the compromise from the committee versus completely eliminating it. I think that's important to understand that that was a compromise to keep that hunt, uh, to begin with. So I, I agree with that being a member of the committee. I agree with that. Any other discussion on the limited entry? 
you know, I think. <laughs> yeah. R right. <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually really like. I felt like the comments. We didn't get a ton of public comment on the. I thought we'd get a lot more about age class and oh man, you're taking the beaver unit, gonna make it a lot worse. But it was pretty quiet. Now maybe the southern region rack next week. I probably just jinxed it. It's probably gonna be just going nuts. So sorry about you guys. I have to go down there. Um, that's where all my family's from. Um, so I, I really think I struggle with the five day as well um, because I've been on hunts where we have had to use both weekends. You know, just once again, it snowed in the middle of the hunt. We couldn't get to where we needed to get to. But at the same time, I, I looked at this thinking, well, if the plans for opportunity and, and increasing opportunity, I think it's a good compromise. And, and hopefully people can get time off. And hopefully, you know, we might get some bad years where somebody writes in saying, hey, the snow ruined my hunt. But that's, that can, that's every hunt, right? There could be bad factors. So I, I can support it. And, the, and same with the mid-season. I had, I had a few friends call, like I mentioned earlier, with the mid-season. But I think overall, it's a good opportunity to get out and hunt elk. Go ahead, Ben. Um, Scott, your question, you, had, you asked for people to oppose it earlier. To clarify, I was not opposed to, in, I'm not opposed to anything on the limited entry side of this plan. My opposition was earlier was because of the, the general archery elk thing. Um, I love the fact that the committee eliminated that top tier, the top age objective, the seven and a half to eight huge fan of that i think that is long overdue i'm really excited that we did that i'm in support of the remainder of the plan and and i'm ready to to go there if if the remaining council is scott yeah I, i'm ready to make a vote on it too but i just want to bring this other point up i floated this idea before about is is there a grievance opportunity for people who drew a permit now who've been putting in for 20 years should there be should that opportunity exist those would we support something along that lines just a quick show i mean it's an idea we haven't given much thought to quick show of hands who would support that idea i would not lindy sure, can I say something? you bet legally we cannot it's in statute so that's the perfect answer, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later tonight. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so thank I, you. I just wanted to stop that right there. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. It doesn't look like anything. Anybody has anything pressing about the limited entry? I would. I would. Brock, I'll entertain a motion. Oh, sorry, Ben. If you want to do it, no, Ben. If you want to do it, I'll Go entertain ahead. a motion that we re, we accept the remainder of the plan as presented. We have a motion to accept and a second by Ben that we accept the remainder of the elk plan as presented. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Opposed? And it's two, four, six, eight to one. Amos, do you wanna let us know why you oppose so I can present that view to the board? I didn't know if I should oppose or, or abstain. I'd rather, uh, rather abstain okay. due to not having much knowledge of what's uh, oh, okay. what's presented here. So uh, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, okay, so to, one uh, abstention. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amos. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the once in a lifetime. So we'll call up Rusty Robinson and... Uh, for those of you that need a restroom, there's a restroom right around the corner here. Looks like some people are only came for the elk plan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll tell you when I get it. It'll be real quick. Oh. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Robinson, do you have anything to say before we uh, begin? Looks like we're taking an informal break. So, you want me to you want me to filibuster for five minutes? Wait, right, right, just... all right. <laughs> I'm you, sure you Chad call, would do his. Does Rusty have a PhD? I did not know that. Cool. Uh, yeah, Rusty Robinson, once in a lifetime species coordinator. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the once in a lifetime uh, species hunt structure and season dates that I'll be uh, addressing tonight. Not, not a lot of big changes. Probably the the biggest change, and and for me personally, the most exciting change would be the uh, recommendation of a new desert bighorn sheep hunt on the Mineral Mountains. Um, in case there's any confusion, that won't be for this coming season 2023. 
that would be recommended for the 2024 season, uh, being that, that that's a fairly new reintroduced population that's still growing. Um, but if it continues on the current trajectory, we'll have a, a huntable age class of rams out there in 2024. So excited about that. Uh, other than that, uh, recommending a new uh, bison hunt. There's already several bison hunts on the Book Cliffs Little Creek South unit. This would be an additional hunt to just kind of spread out pressure. And then um, some some changes to the archery only goat hunts on the Uinas and uh, introducing a new hunt there on the beaver. Uh, aside from that, I do need to make um, some corrections. Paul, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up. After I recommended the desert bighorn sheep hunt dates, uh, got to looking at, at recent history and uh, what we've done, the, the hunt dates I recommended were um, kind of along a, a calendar slide, shifting the dates up a day like we do for a lot of hunts. However, looking at, at recent history, that's that's kind of been a more of a set date hunt. We've uh, typically had the bulk of our desert bighorn hunts go until November 10th, and the bulk of our Rocky Mountain hunt dates go until uh, from November 1st to November 30th. So we really wanted to keep that a little more standard as that's kind of based around the rut and, and just kind of historic hunt dates. So so if you could see that slide, those are the the corrections that I'd like to make to my previous recommendations. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you. Questions from the rack. I have one, Rusty. Yes. So when we approved the archery goat hunt, the idea was this was going to provide opportunity with much lower success than the rifle hunt. How has, what has the success been on that archery hunt? Th that's a great question. Uh, just in case anybody doesn't know, when we uh, redid that goat plan a few years ago, that was one of the strategies in there was to uh, provide a variety of hunting experiences um, through either variety of season dates, variety of weapon types. Uh, I think it specifically mentions primitive weapon types. And so that's when, where those archery only goat hunts kind of originated. Um, but you're right, it's a very good question. To this point, the success rates on those have been pretty comparable to the any legal weapon hunt. And so as we took uh, recommendations around last year, we heard that sentiment from, from multiple people that, hey, these really aren't uh, meeting the, the, the intent of what those hunts were designed for. Uh, they were designed to provide variety in accordance with the plan, but when we recommended them, the, I think the public sentiment was these need to be very challenging hunts to maybe lower success rates, frankly, and provide some additional opportunity that way. And so in that sense, they haven't, they haven't met that. So that's why we're recommending uh, moving the one hunt from the Uinas to the Beaver and making it a later hunt. Uh, we could have made it later on the Uinas, but we didn't, that was very... Uh, practical to, to put people on in the high UNAs in November. So that's the reason for that. Move it to the beaver, make it later, see if that makes it a more challenging hunt. Um, and then likewise on the Nebo, and, and frankly, we don't know how these are going to turn out. That's why we kind of took a twofold approach, make a late hunt on the beaver, but also uh, keep the Nebo hunt kind of like it is an early type hunt in September, but just make it shorter. And we'll see which one of those works better, if any. What was the success on the Nebo this year? Uh, I don't know about this year. No. Uh, historically, and I have to pull up the numbers, but it's usually between 80 and 100%, which is pretty comparable to the any legal weapon. And maybe Kant or Lindy can correct me if no, I'm wrong. No, that's fine. That's, that's what I wanted to know. Any other questions on the rack about once in a lifetime? Ken? <laughs> uh, apparently the buffalo are still roaming out on the book cliffs and moving out of the area that you wanted them in? Is that why the the new hunt out there or? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're obviously still in the unit, but, but as you know, bison are very sensitive to hunting pressure. Uh, likewise, when you wait 23 years for a permit, hunters are very uh, sensitive to hunting pressure and to crowding. And so this is kind of a twofold approach to, um, you know, spread out hunters so you're not pushing bison off the unit um, and also to, to reduce some hunter crowding. Well, the reason I asked that was because when they first put them out there on the book class, you had one bull decided to go to strawberry. You had one bull that went into sheep creek. So I'm just 
wondering if they're still roaming like that or they pretty well calmed down. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with any crazy movements like that. Um, obviously bison move a lot, but um, as far as, you know, crossing multiple units and crossing highways and stuff, I don't think we've had a ton of that bison, or uh, Dax can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, have we had any really crazy movement with bison, like going to strawberry or no. anything like that? Well, in recent history. We did have one individual bison. Can't, can't get enough of me, I'm back. We did have one individual bison that uh, we had a couple reports of and I think a couple trail camera photos that went over onto the Avinaquin unit one year, but most of them tend to stay pretty pretty close on that, you know, in that Green River corridor and up on, you know, the book cliffs, so. Thank you. Other questions for Rusty? I just have one quick question. Have you looked at uh, doing like an archery hunt date for those who draw the any weapon hunt? Like the division had that in the past where there was an an archery extension, so, or, you know, the... Like make a portion of the hunt, an archery only portion. Yeah, but not an art, not a dedicated tag for archers, but just for whoever draws the permit, they could, um, in the past, the the division had that opportunity, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I think if that's something the, the RAC wants to recommend, I don't see how that would uh, in any way go against the current statewide plan, if that's something the, the RAC decided to do. <clears throat> Okay, questions from the public? Turn the time over to Jason to review public comments. All right, thanks, Brock. Let me pull my stuff together. So we had 18 responses um, to the question, which best describes your position regarding the proposals for the 2023-24 once in a lifetime hunts? We had six that strongly agreed, five that somewhat agreed, four that neither agreed nor disagreed, two that somewhat disagree, and one that strongly disagreed. The weighted average for this was 3.7, so nearly a, a somewhat degree, a somewhat agree weighted average, right around four. A couple of the themes um, in this, there was quite a few people that uh, provided responses you know, agreeing or disagreeing, but not a lot of comments on some of those responses. Um, some of the things I pulled out uh, was a bison, bison crowding issue on the book cliffs, uh, something that Ken kind of uh, approached already. And the archery only hunt should be moved later. Um, there's a question, why not apply for multiple uh, LE hunts? And then they don't support, and another comment was don't support archery only hunts for once in a lifetime species if they don't ultimately result in more hunter opportunity. They don't support one archery only hunts if they don't increase the opportunity, so if success isn't lower. Okay, uh, we have one public comment, Troy Justison. Troy Justinson, Sportsman Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we support the division's recommendation with these changes here. Uh, we are excited about the minerals. We do appreciate the division bumping that back one year just to increase another year of growth on these rams and, and provide more quality opportunity there. Uh, speaking on these once in a lifetime archery hunts, I am a huge proponent of this. We have failed the system. We know why these were designed but in order to make them achieve what they're designed to do, we have to choose first the right unit, limit the time, and then they become unsuccessful. Case in point with the hams, we bring in the hams, same idea, we make it a 45 day season, come on. So I think they can achieve what they're supposed to, but we gotta pick the right unit, put it in the right circumstances and limit the then what they're designed to do so thank you thank you troy uh come back to the rack for comments discussion go ahead ben uh yeah for a little bit of history on the archery mountain goat um on the unis um 
the, the archery owners have learned how to be successful on there in recent years. But when I started the first year, there was two tagged and it went 50% uh, success, one of two killed. And the next year, I believe there were four tags and one of four killed. So initially it was doing exactly what it was intended to do. Hunters have figured out how to be successful on that on that unit. So I like what um, Rusty and the division has done here in moving that to a different unit and, and making attempt on uh, an, another unit to, to provide the opportunity, but also achieve what um, was set out to do with this, with, with an opportunity that's got lower success rates. And I'm gonna be very interested to see how it works out um, with that new hunt on the beaver. Any other comments? I actually don't like them. If the success rate isn't different to me, they can put in for the regular tag and they can hunt archery if they want. I mean, I remember when we voted on it, one of the key things was this is gonna be less successful and provide more opportunity. Well, you can still hunt with a bow and, and put in for the same draw that other people put in. Yeah, that's why I brought that up. I really don't like it when we give the special interest group a, a you know, part, a portion of what we have. Um, I think everybody should be on the same footing to obtain the opportunity to hunt. I think we could address that issue by, you know, having a an earlier, you know, archery hunt days for that's only art that's archery only, so they don't have to fight with the, the any weapon crowd. But um, you know, I I don't really see the need to have uh, archery only permits on hunts that have such high success. Well, Brock, to your point, that's exactly what this recommendation is is attempting to do is to to change those hunts to where it does lower success rate where we can provide more opportunity. So I, I actually I, I, oh I was, I was just gonna say I really like what Troy said, you know. I mean if we're gonna give somebody 90 days or you know this big long time, they're gonna go kill. So I, I'm willing to give it a try, but I'm not saying we get rid of it. I'm willing to give it a try, but it didn't work last time. If it doesn't work this time, I, I would like to see it go away. <laughs> well, it, it did work initially. Well, one out of, one out of two doesn't work. That's, that's a difference of okay. one. If you take the two, the first two years, it was two out of six. What's the Nebo? I mean, aren't there 10 archery tags on the Nebo? And they have like an 80 to 100% yeah, success rate. Eight so or 10, it, something like that. Yeah, so we took 10 archers and let them have easier draws. And So I, I'm fine with letting it, trying it, if see if it works. I'm, I'm not saying let's not try it, but if it doesn't work, I'm not in favor of it. So is there a different in uh, permits it takes to draw those then? The general season versus the archery? A different in, in points? So Yes, I believe the archery is easier to draw. Yeah, yep. Uh, I think max points was, uh, it used to be, you know, just two or three years ago, it was nine or 10 and 12 points. And then I think, believe this year it was 16, at least on the Nebo. Um, so it is it is getting up there, but but uh, any legal weapon is more difficult. So I don't know how much more. I think you might be able to help me out with max points on the any legal weapon. It, I haven't paid as much attention to the points it takes to get the goat tags, but on the, the, the bison, like when we had that early archery bison hunt, um, man, it was only, I mean, it was in the twenties. It was, it was not far off of what it was taking to draw the rifle tags. How many points did you have, Rusty? <laughs> My mic's broken. I can't. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other discussion? I'd entertain a motion. I'd move to accept the uh, plan as presented. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion from Eric to accept as presented and a second by Scott. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Abstentions? One. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the big game seasons and key dates. Dax Mangus, I don't know if you want to say something, Dax. 
briefly? I, I, unless you need me to. No, this is just to set dates for a couple years in advance like the board's directed them to do. There were a couple changes. We went, I went through them in the presentation. It was not 53 minutes long, so hopefully you were able to watch that one. Questions for Dax? Yeah, the one question I have that goes along with what Troy was saying. Um, what, how long's the hams hunt? I don't have it right in front of me. So previously it was 45 days, it uh -huh. was September 1st to October 15th. Uh, we have it now, it's still longer hunt, it's about 21 days. It, it would start the Saturday after the muzzleloader, um, the, like the spike muzzleloader season mm -hmm. ends, uh, like the first Saturday or second Saturday in November and go to the end of the month. Okay, it's like so three weeks. So we cut it in more than half. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions for Dax? Questions from the public? Turn the time over to Jason to summarize. Thanks, Brock. So for this, we had 28 total responses, six strongly agreed, 11, 11 somewhat agreed. Two neither agreed nor disagreed, four somewhat disagreed, and five strongly disagreed. The weighted average for this was 3.3, so uh, just above the neither agree nor disagree. A couple of the things I pulled out, of course, season dates uh, for the spike archery hunt, uh, multi-season hunt, the late season. Um, there was maybe some confusion and maybe Dax can clarify. Uh, there were some comments about a spring antlerless hunt. Um, and those are really kind of the main themes that, that I pulled out of there. Yeah, uh, let me clarify on that. I, I think I didn't explain it clearly, uh, said something to the effect of we'll recommend antlerless hunts in the spring, meaning through the spring rack process would be, would be when we would recommend the antlerless hunts that would take place in the fall, not that we would actually hunt in the spring. So I, I think I worded that poorly or we wrote it up poorly. When well, we now were... I'm against this, Dax. I was hoping for a spring elk hunt. Oh, yeah, so we... <laughs> yeah. we... Two, two for one. <laughs> you, 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 you might accuse the division of being dumb, but we're not monsters. We're not monsters. Uh, okay, do we have any public comments? For it. We don't have any public comments, so I'll turn it back to the rack for discussion and comment. Turn it back to the rack. I see no, so I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept as presented. We have a motion from Ken and a second from Mike that we accept as presented. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? One. Thank you, Dax. The next item, another fun one, emerging technologies. Derek Yule. Do you have anything to yes. uh, talk about before we start asking questions or you just want us to yes. fire away? Briefly, I do have a few things. So briefly is the key word there. As many of you probably knew, um, when we originally came out with this presentation, there was a lot of confusion from this, people's comments that, that these restricted weapon types were going to replace the general season type hunts, and that is not the case. We clarified that that same day because that was obviously a concern for people. So, and then also there was another clarification we wanted to make that the in the restricted weapons definitions, the archery definition was not the definition that the committee um, pres or recommended to the, to the Division of Wildlife. So after the committee met, we made our recommendations and they, the agency changed that definition to, to be the single stringed, no pulleys, no wheels definition. Um, but we wanted to make that clear that that was not the committee's recommendation. Um, and then just quickly, just there's a lot of stuff in the presentation about all the things the committee talked about. Um, but this presentation, the recommendations we're making are only for the restricted weapons definitions and for um, the statement on technology that the committee um, put together. 
So that's the only action items in this presentation. But I do want to also say that the committee had a lot of good recommendations. Like we talked about pretty much everything you can think of when it comes to technology. And because just because those aren't being presented now doesn't mean those have been forgotten. Uh, the division is looking at those recommendations, but we simply didn't have enough time to go through all of them and vet them. And, and so we are, the division is committed to go through all those recommendations and bring them forward at a, the ones that they can adopt or implement, they will bring forward at a future date. But these restricted uh, weapons definitions, we really wanted that portion out so that they could be um, in the elk plan. So that's all I have. So any questions? Questions from the committee, from the rack. On the muzzleloader, um, did you discuss having like the bullet be the size of the, of the bore and not allow sabots? Yes, that was discussed uh, quite a bit uh, at the committee, but we we felt like we wanted to have as many people be able to participate as possible in it, and we didn't feel like that was going to significantly change the success rate of that weapon by having a sabot or no sabot. So, but it was discussed. Yes. Okay, Ken. Well, basically, this is just for changes for the future. Correct. And that's all. Yes, these are so that we will have these tools in the future to, to implement them, yes. There are no current hunts with these restricted weapon types. I have one question, Derek. So SFW sent a recommendation that we've all been able to see. They have a bunch of things in there. Were the, were the things that are in their recommendation things that were recommended from the committee that you guys didn't address? Y yes, there. except for um, maybe uh, Kevin can will address it here in a minute. They have one exception in there that wasn't the recommendation of the committee, and I, it was with the archery equipment. Um, the committee's original recommendation was to have no further restrictions on archery. They felt like being a, a bow, using a bow of any kind, was restrictive enough, and so it was only to make it any bow, but no electronics on the bow. Thank was you. the original committee recommendation. But all the other things like no electronics, that was all a recommendation of the committee that you guys haven't included yeah. here. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Ben? Uh, Derek, you, you stated that the, the committee recommended no additional restrictions on, on a restricted archery definition. Uh, why did the division bring a different recommendation than the committee? Um, as they met, um, as an agency, they just felt like if we're going to restrict all the other weapon types, that there, there needed to be something also on the archery. And then there was a, a desire from uh, some constituents to have that as traditional archery, as they call it, you know, longbows and, and recurves. Um, and follow-up question, if, if the... If it was decided that we have to have that definition, why wasn't the committee allowed the opportunity to write that definition? Um, well, we had discussed all those definitions, like what we would have in the committee, um, but that specific one, we felt like we knew what the committee wanted and what they had preferred. And we, because we talked about it at length in the committee about that archery definition. And so when we came up with the definition in the committee, um, as we met as a division, that was the recommendation the division wanted to make. And so I think as far as the definition goes, we felt comfortable with the definition we had, that it wouldn't need to be significantly changed by the committee. Go ahead. Yeah, I, two questions. <clears throat> um, is the technology committee disbanded or is it no can, can you maybe talk about because you know the elk committee met and and they're done right for right. 10, 10 years so talk about like what's the the plan moving forward of the the technology committee yeah so that's a that's a good question because it was the question we had as a committee almost the whole time we did we you know like with the elk committee you're tasked with writing a plan and that last 10 years you know but the, with this we didn't have that direction as to there was no time length given. We had we didn't even have a a date for when we needed to complete anything, and so we have not disbanded the committee. We plan on if as 
as things come up, we will reconvene the committee um, and, and discuss anything further that is needed. So it, it is not over. Um, so when we left the committee, we just told them, for now, we're gonna take a break. We've discussed, I mean, we felt like it would discuss everything we could and take a break and then we'll, something comes up, we'll reconvene. Yeah, that, that's helpful to know, thank you. And then the second question is, why did the committee feel like the only recommendations they could make are on restricted weapon types? Because when I saw this on the agenda, I was actually pretty excited by it. And then you did a great job, but by the end, I was a little let down because I thought some of these other uh, encroaching technologies were going to be addressed and we could kind of have some definitive answers. And when I didn't see that, I sort of thought, well, we got like one out of 12, but like the one we got was arguably not even some of the more potentially pressing issues. I mean, I know uh, satellite feed trail camps has been addressed in years prior, but like these technologies are happening so quickly that, you know, when I saw SFW's recommendation for prohibit this, prohibit this, and I'm like, they see the writing on a wall in the way that I, I kind of agree with and want to get behind. And so maybe talk about why you felt, why the committee felt that this was as far as they can go at this time. So to clarify, it wasn't the committee that felt this is as far as I could go. These recommendations are what the, uh, the agency felt that we could present at this time. We hadn't had time to go through all those other things, but we have committed that we will, we're going to go through all those as an agency and, and look at all those and, come with future uh, proposals. I understand like that there could be a sense of urgency to get on top of it, um, but I don't think we're looking at, the, the agency's not looking at putting this off for, for years. I think this will be addressed quickly and, and possibly, you know, by the next round of RACs in April. And if, if this, all those other ideas and, and recommendations are brought forth in April, I think that's soon enough because they, even now these, if we changed any of those now, they wouldn't be implemented necessarily, you know, until the fall and April would be able to do the same thing. So I don't think there's a, a big difference between now and April on those other uh, recommendations. Is that true? Because people have already applied for their tags then and you, can, you can't change the weapon type after they've applied right. for their tags. That's, I mean, that's true, but so it'd be a year, a year lag. So, so to clarify, the recommendations SFW has made in their letter were all recommended by the committee, but they haven't addressed them yet at the division. I think that's what I was looking for. I, I, I guess I was trying to understand the Yeah, the committee was the process, supportive but... of all the recommendations okay. that were submitted. Thank you. Yes. You know, Derek, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Brad. I was just asking for other questions. Yeah. Um, I guess the question I have is, is you kind of got there a little bit, but you said just these three, these weapon types are going to restrict. You know, I wonder why we don't wait to do something until you have an actual hunt. You know, I was the attorney in Nebraska for the game and parks, and a lot of times we would, we would define things when a hunt would come out. And so I just wonder if you say, hey, we're going to recommend a restricted hunt. This is the season dates, and this is what it means. I just wonder if that's a better approach. Yeah, it's a hams now. We just need to redefine yeah, it. I, I think it's, um, I guess it's kind of maybe a preference of which one you prefer, but it's it's hard to make a recommendation on a hunt when you don't have the tools for that hunt. Um, and so I think we felt like as a, as a division that having these tools first then will allow us to re make those recommendations on a hunt. I guess it's e either way. If, if, you, if, if uh, the restricted weapons get passed, um, will that take the place of the hams so weapons? It, it doesn't take so all the definitions in there will be like we didn't want like three muzzleloader definitions yeah. and so the muzzleloader definition that is restricted muzzleloader will replace what is currently the muzzleloader definition in hams um and and the archery as well and but the other ones like shotgun handgun we just took the current hams definitions for those Any other questions? Questions from the public? Oh, 
Danny, I didn't see you. Sorry. Oh, no, I, I'm just uh, the entertainment here. I, I, blow guns. We haven't. You know. What, what about that? blow guns? Is that technology or what? The, Come on, dude. You know, scope on a blow gun. As long as it's not magnified. <laughs> okay, questions from the public. Turn the time turn the time over to Jason to review the public comments. All right, so we had uh, 34 responses to the question. Which best describes your position regarding the technology committee's recommendations? We had eight that strongly agreed, 11 that somewhat agreed, five that neither agree nor disagree, three with a somewhat disagree, and seven with a strongly disagree. The weighted average on that was 3.3, so just above the neither agree nor disagree. I think as uh, has, has been mentioned, there was some initial confusion with the definitions and what uh, the purpose of the restricted weapons was. So some of the initial responses that came in through uh, the internet kind of reflected that and some negativity along with that. Um, some of the other things that I, that I recognized in there or themes, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about muzzle loaders, uh, scopes and, and modernizing and different things along those lines. Um, which also there was discussion about uh, some wounding loss as well associated with, um, well, kind of with both long distance shooting and muzzle loaders and not being accurate and then wounding loss with uh, primitive weapons as well. And then uh, there were several comments about long range shooting concerns and not being supportive of, of long range shooting several distances were measured, typically a thousand yards or more, some even maybe 600 yards, but those were some of the things that I pulled out of this. Thank you, Jason. Public comments. Okay, again, three minutes of your representing yourself, it's five minutes of your rep representing an organization. Daryl Spencer. Okay, his comment was, if you restrict any, you have to restrict everything, archery, muzzleloader, rifle, et cetera, et cetera. No loopholes like the trail cameras for cattlemen. Matt Farnsworth. Thank you again. Matt Farns was representing myself. Um, just want to say I appreciate this, the committee and some of the definitions they put forward here. I realize this isn't a replace each weapon type, but some setting the groundwork some, for some future opportunities. And I'm really excited about some of those. Um, what's not to like about a December elk hunt above 10,000 feet with a recurve. That, that's exciting. That's so, something new, fun to look forward to. So thank you. I support the recommendation as presented. Thank you. Kevin Adamson. Five minutes. Thank you. Kevin Adamson, Utah Archery Association. Uh, we had representation on this committee uh, from our organization. And I will say probably, uh, in my opinion, one of the most knowledgeable people for archery equipment in the state of Utah. This person has served as president of Hoyt Archery probably for the last 20 years. Utah Archery strongly opposes the recommendation from the DWR. It makes no sense. Um, I hate the fact that as president of an organization, I can't just stand up here and say, we don't want it. I hate the fact that I then probably have to make another proposal. Um, if that has to be done, Utah Archery Association recommends that we leave it as is with compound bows included, 
referencing rule 657-5-11, where it talks about the minimum bow pull is 30 pounds at draw or peak or whichever comes first. By leaving that in there, you do not exclude compound bows. If you wanna restrict archery, and I'm gonna say if you do, and I have no idea why you want to, then set something similar to what's been passed around and talked about with a maximum of five fixed pins on a non-sliding site and no electronic range finding sites. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Kevin Norman. Kevin Norman representing SFW. Um, I was privileged to sit on this committee and uh, it was a neat experience for me. Um, I, wanna, I wanna make some clarification um, and, and a little bit on this recommendation from the division on the uh, restricted archery. Um, kind of like the elk committee, our, our priority was also to, if, if we kind of had the same motto, if we could increase opportunity by maintaining quality, that was kind of the standard that we was looking at everything through. Um, the reason why we didn't recommend this um, longbow recurve recommendation was, um, like Kevin said, Randy Walk was on our committee and, and he, he's, super knowledgeable and he had the statistics that 3% of archers are longbow or traditional archers. Um, we felt like that was counterproductive to what we were trying to accomplish and would limit, um, limit a whole bunch of people and exclude a whole bunch of people from, from that. So that's the reason behind that. Um, the committee's recommendation was um, no electronic sites, um, and uh, beyond that, it was it, everything was good. Um, SFW's recommendation takes it a step farther, like Kevin also mentioned. Um, five pin, fixed, no slider, no electronic sites um, for the restricted weapon type. Um, I would like to say, in that committee, I think the main sentiment there was to kind of draw a line in the sand that we've gone far enough, like we have enough technology in, in our weapons now um, that we need to kind of curb that and draw a line in the sand of we've gone far enough. Um, we got to protect the resource and it's a lot harder to take something away from somebody than it is to, to just fix it now. Um, so I would say the sentiment of the committee was as that was our main priority was to set those boundaries so we didn't have to deal with everything that came up from here to eternity. And I think the committee did an awesome job of that. Um, as all you guys got, got uh, our letter of our recommendations, those were just things that were left out for whatever reason um, on this round of racks that uh, SFW is in support of that wanted to bring them in front of you guys. I know it's kind of messy, um, but we wanted to get them out there in front of you because we felt they were important and it is an urgent matter. Um, the longer this goes on, the harder it is to, to uh, fight the fight. Um, it becomes you're then taking things away from people and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother battle that um, we want to get out ahead of, and I think um, the committee did an awesome job. It was a very diverse committee. Um, when I first sat down, I thought, man, how are we going to get anything done? And every one of these recommendations had 100% support nearly on, on all these recommendations. And to me, they were, they were, they were a no-brainer. Um, I, I don't know where we go from here, but um, just wanted to get those out in front of you guys and and uh, know that we support those and the committee on these. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Chavis Lunskog. Uh, 
uh, Travis Lunskog, just representing myself. I'm just an average everyday hunter. Um, and I, I've never been to a rack meeting until this, when this rack meeting got me so excited to come. All these changes I think are really exciting. I'm glad we're having these discussions. Um, specifically on this topic, um, I think we're scratching the surface of a gold mine talking about traditional archery being introduced as a specific part of our management plan. I feel like it's a great way to expand opportunity and it can be done in a way that doesn't diminish or reduce opportunity from anyone else in any other category of hunting, including compound bow archery. I think that could be something that could be left as is and traditional archery can be added to it. Um, going along the lines of putting the hunt back in hunting, getting back to our roots, putting focus on things like skills and knowledge instead of buying better gear, getting better technology and drawing better tags in order to draw, have success, putting the focus back on learning uh, the, the knowledge and skills and having that be an integral part of our, of our management plan. Um, I see traditional archery as, as a huge, powerful tool that could get us moving in that direction. And I know right now it would be a very small category but when the opportunity is opened, I think people would pursue that opportunity. I know I'm the same way. I think I should, I should say I'm not a traditional archery guy. Uh, the vast majority of hunting I do is with a rifle, muzzleloader, and compound bow, mostly a compound bow because that's where the opportunity is. If there was new opportunities for traditional archery with incentives that came along with it, I would follow that opportunity. I think a lot of people would as well. Um, I think that a lot of hunters are actually seeking that, seeking to get back to that. Um, looking for more challenging ways to develop hunting skills, hunting knowledge, and getting back to those roots. I do think is a category that merits a, a close look at. And, and, and I also think it's a, a way to expand opportunity without taking opportunity from any other category in hunting, which is pretty unique to me. I also like that it is something that would um, not necessarily draw in new hunters. It'd be a category that would draw in perhaps existing experienced hunters into that category. Um, I, I might get a lot of hate for this. As a hunter myself that loves opportunity, I'm not super excited about the idea of tons of new hunters, but I like the idea of a new category that might draw existing hunters into a more challenging category. Uh, hunters that would take that challenge and self-impose that challenge in order to get more opportunity. Um, and, and so I, I like that these discussions are happening. I think this is something to, to look at closely. Thank you very much. Troy Justison. Troy Justison, uh, representing myself as an alternate on this committee. Um, as Kevin pointed out, the thing that excited me and kind of the motto or the mission of this committee was the same as that of the elk committee to maximize opportunity and increase quality or maintain quality. Our biggest threat to quality is technology. Guys are not getting best of the West muzzleloaders, single shot rifles to go kill a two point. I'm not worried about success. What I'm worried about is the pressure that's put on the top end. I've been attending, I, I, I love to see new guys come involved in the rack. I've been attending these things for about 30 years. The thing that drives me the most back crap crazy is when I hear people come and say, there's no quality left, we need to cut tags. If we don't at some point draw a line in the sand and say, hey, enough is enough, That's going to rob us of that opportunity to continue to have quality on land. Once again, I'm not compared. I'm not worried about success. I'm. We're never going. I don't think we are going to kill the last deer, the last elk on the mountain. But we put so much pressure on that top end, and then that trickles down. And we try to manage by science in here, but a lot of it, and the vision will admit it as well. A lot of these recommendations are based 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 upon social issues and what the public wants. And as that top end goes, the natural thing is cut tags. I don't want to cut tags. I'm sick of cutting tags. I want to get back out and hunt. So I don't support the division's recommendation. Um, one of the things we looked at with these uh, restricted weapon types was trying to create a weapon that was 100, 150 yard max. 
I believe compound bows or that most people, 60, 70 yards. There's a few out there that can stretch it, 120, whatever, for the most part, it's 60 yards. And that's what we, our goal was, is trying to limit that um, to where you have to get close. It's hunting again. So I would encourage this rack to look at the original uh, propol uh, proposals and what the committee brought forth. And a lot of them are listed on that recommendation from SFW. And I'd hope in the future, as time and effort is in, uh, put in by these committees, that everything that was brought forth would be brought forth by the division. So thank you. Thank you, Troy. With that, I'll turn it back to the rack for comment and discussion. Danny. I'm old. Uh, so I, I, I started with a, you know, a bear recurve and, and killed a, a tiny little deer, uh, the very first one. Um, but I'm, I'm with, I'm with Chavis. Uh, uh, you know, we just, we can, even though that it doesn't exist in large numbers now, uh, I agree with him that it, that things will, would definitely grow because it, it's just such a sexy thing to, to shoot a, a longbow or a recurve. It, it, it's just so much fun because the maximum yardage for me at that using that kind of equipment is 35 yards, not 60. <laughs> That's the maximum because I can't even hold it back any longer. So anyway, appreciate you. Uh, ben? Uh, yeah, so I, I've talked to multiple members that sat on this committee, um, and, I, and I've got some frustration with the recommendation on the restricted archery, and, and here's why. Um, the committee recommended no additional restrictions on archery. When this, as, as I've discussed this with, with committee members, this, this recommendation was a blindside to them. They, they were not expecting this. It was a total surprise. I'm frustrated that the committee, if, if we have to have this definition, I'm frustrated that the committee was not given the opportunity to write that definition. Um, as I've sat here and thought about this, I, I wanna just point out like the, the definition that was written for a rifle, a restricted rifle is essentially no scope. I mean, there's the no semi-autos also, but really the no scope is the is the big thing there. Um, and the 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 definition that is being um, recommended by the division going completely um, eliminating the opportunity to use a compound bow on as, for a restricted archery weapon. It, it would be the equivalent of writing the restricted rifle definition as a a, a flintlock muzzleloader. I mean, really. We're, we're talking about going to some very, very far extremes. Um, I really like the recommendation that was brought by SFW and uh, Utah Archery Association, if we have to have this definition, going from eliminating sliders and going to a fixed pin sight, I feel like that is right in line with eliminating scopes off of rifles. I feel like that that fits the, the intent and um, and what's being done with the other restricted definitions. I'd prefer not to have that um, restricted definition to begin with, um, as, as I think has been represented by a couple organizations here as well. But if we have to have that definition, um, that would be my preference. Go ahead, Josh. Um, <clears throat> two things, one, I. I like to see the definitions presented. Um, I do look forward to the technology committee's future recommendations because I think it should be an ongoing committee that's constantly evaluating the technology and its influx into the hunting world and community. So that's great. Second thing, I <clears throat> I gotta admit I'm kind of at a loss on this archery one because I know Ben is an avid hunter. I'm I'm kind of surprised that the Utah, Utah Archery Association is so adamantly opposed to this, in my mind, I would have thought they'd be like overjoyed. And, and the reason I say that's because uh, the archery club I shoot at, the Beehive West Edge Bow Club, uh, one of the founding members many years ago when I joined said, uh, 
technology in the archery world has saved archery as a sport because it, it took it from this very rudimentary thing to this very effective way to kill an elk. When, when I was switched to a sliding scope, or I'm sorry, a sliding pin system, I felt more effective with my bow at 100 yards than I did my muzzleloader with open sights. Very effective. And I think the pendulum is starting to swing backwards from that. Only 3% of people hunt with longer recurve traditional archery. 3% I think of archery hunters. 3% of archery hunters, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're gonna see record long bell sales go through the roof because there are, there are people that are, to the gentleman's point, hungry for that kind of opportunity and that engagement with the wild. Not, not the wildlife, the wild. And so for me, I see this as a very attractive new way to create opportunity. Like the recommendation to put a, a camera with Luminox on your bow, that's, that's anathema to me to what the intent of this technology committee is trying to do. So we can what, film our hunt and put it on social media. I wanna see the opposite of that. I wanna see a guy with a stick bow climbing in the hills, doing it for reasons that don't involve these other things. So, so, and I'm not saying like, I'm not open to some of it, but I just, I'm surprised and somewhat at a loss, as I said, for why the archery community is so against this. So, no. So, um, I'm, I'm, what, what I'm struggling with here is that you put together a committee, they put in all these hours, and then they make recommendations, and then the recommendations that come to us are different and only contain a part of it. And I don't understand the point of the committee if, if we're not going to, I mean, it kind of defeats the public process to me. So personally, I like SFW's recommendation. If you're gonna have a definition for restricted archery, this is a definition that's a compromise, but I like all the other things in there that the committee recommended. I think we have to get on top of it. That's my opinion. I agree, I don't see anything in the recommendations the SFW put forth that I couldn't get behind and I, I think I was kind of expecting that. And when I, when I first watched the presentation, I was all excited. And then by the time it was over, I was kind of upset. Me too. And I was like, wait, I mean, what happened to scopes on muzzleloaders and, and uh, Bluetooth scopes on rifles and those, you know, and I know that those are still sitting on the desk somewhere in Salt Lake. Um, but the, the thing is, is I kind of feel like what SFW said, what they express is, you know, every year that goes by, Another guy buys that tech a and two thousand dollars scope. Yeah, and puts it on his gun, and then it's that much harder to get it off. So I don't see, I I don't I don't know that I'm comfortable passing the things that I agree with in their proposal. And I'm not saying I'm not comfortable with that. I just don't know because that's that's a little bit more, a little bit farther down the road than than I think the progress has been made with the division because they are the partners here, right? Um, as for the, as for the bow issue, um, I mean, if it, if it goes to, to compound bows, I, I, I'm okay with SFW's um, proposal, but I kind of still, I, I kind of like the long bow recurve side of things. Um, it said, you know, three to 5%, whatever it is, I've seen 5%, up to 5% of people use recurves and long bows. I mean, for so long, we only had 8% of the applicants in Utah were archery hunters. And we were giving them 25% of the, of, the, of the opportunity to hunt. And so I think that three to 5% would, would grow fairly rapidly. And, and that's where, you know, you could give out so much opportunity there, you know, longer seasons, you know, different time frames. So, I wouldn't vote against um, the proposal to keep it at five pins, but I, I also wouldn't vote against the proposal that the division put forward on the restricted stuff, but I would love to see more of that, more of the tech um, items addressed. And I just, I don't know, how do we do that? Ben, comment? Well, yeah, to Mike's question of how do we do that, Kevin wrote us a motion. <laughs> um, 
and I'm hearing some sentiment that we like the their recommendations. There's a motion right there. Now, but is that all of the items that were in that letter or just just the one that, that Kevin just talked about? There's 10 points in here. There's the, the restricted archery definition, um, prohibiting electronics on scopes, um, prohibiting electronic sites on current archery definition, um, prohibiting technology that allows hunters to see through fog, snow, and smoke, uh, prohibit artificial intelligence glassing aids, um, expand the current aircraft drone rule to prohibit their use for scouting, um, prohibit uh, rangefinder optics that have that drop you a pin, um, prohibit heat seeking bullets, and prohibit electronic calls for big game. I saw that letter. I, I like, I'm not against it. I'm, I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna take a position on the, uh, <laughs> the letter officially, uh, but what I would say is, you know, I'd like it to go back to the public, like those other items, I'd wanna hear what the public has to say first. And so I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying, let's pass everything in the letter right now until the public has a chance to weigh in. That's I mean, we, we've heard some public comment on some of these, like we've received public comments says, get rid of scopes on muzzleloaders. Um, I, I, because the committee recommended it, if, if there's a tie vote, I would vote in favor of that. I think the only things that that doesn't include is the muzzleload definition and the primitive rifle definition, right? Well, I, which I, I think, think people are okay with. I think the the intent of the motion as they wrote was that that that's part of the so we would committee's in, recommendation. Include those the, and these yeah, ten extra ones. Yeah. That's your intent, right, Kevin? The the keep the I, restricted I favor that. muzzleloader and rifle definitions as presented. Yeah. I I agree except this wasn't like, I mean, this is a huge change that I, I support in theory, but it, like, like Braden said, it didn't go out to the public. But it, it wasn't presented. I mean, I know a committee said that. And I don't think it is a huge change. I think it's getting in front of a potential huge change. Oh, I, I completely agree. I just think if, I kind of worried that we'd be going about it backwards. I mean, we've, so there's, through the wildlife board process recently, they've they've talked about how you know something's brought forth and it's not, um, you know, it hasn't been vetted through the public process in the proper way. But I'm not saying I'm I, I'm just I'm just throwing it out there because that's that's been said. And really quick, what was the one item on the SFW's um, motion that that wasn't included in the um, five pin fixed site? On an art, on a bow. Oh, so that was on the restricted side. Yeah. Okay. So so I I generally agree with that, Mike. But we got one time I don't remember who said it in here. How do we present a proposal if it isn't at the rack process? And so just because if we choose to to support that, this is part of the public process. The the board doesn't have to accept it. We're but I, I, I don't think you wait another year to get in front of all this and let another 500 people go out and buy $2,000 scopes. That's my opinion though. Yeah, I, I mean, another option is the Northern Rack just completely tabled it last night. I don't, um, but I don't know that that's a good idea either because then you're letting yeah. somebody else make the decision. Sure. Um, Talk more about how, how did they table it. I don't know, I didn't watch this, just, I, I heard that today. Um, I could get behind this motion from SFW. I, I could get behind that real easily. I, I could also get behind um, the, per, the the division's recommendations with the exception of the restricted archery definition. I could go for either one of those. Scott. Yeah, same there. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I like the idea of this traditional archery as well. And I don't know that, could could there be two categories? So that all we're trying to do is put tools in the toolbox right now. So can't we create that category? Second. Well, that's a great that's a great idea. Have a restricted archery with the five pin no slide and a traditional archery. Mm -hmm. So a restricted archery and then an, and then an extra restricted archery or a traditional. Well, is, isn't it isn't it um, Pennsylvania that still has a traditional flintlock hunt? I, I'm not in favor of it. By the way, I'm not in favor of giving. I two think to three I think so. So. Percent. I 
I don't love every point of SFW's recommendation, but I do like that it goes way further than the division's recommendation. And so if we could create a class of a uh, uh, long range, or I'm sorry, long bow recurve only and a five pin compound only as two types of restricted archery, I could get behind that. Go ahead, Ken. Well, maybe I misunderstand this, but SFW's proposal, isn't that what the group committee originally proposed? Uh, and I may be wrong, but the Utah Archery Association, whatever it's called, they didn't he say that there was no restrictions on on, on archery. placed on archery? That's correct. Yeah, so that it, was the committee's so it, recommendation. Was no so it does go no. against it. I'm just clarifying that. Yeah, your that right. recommendation that was the one, would yeah. the one deviation. Correct. I kind, I personally I am in favor of having some sort of restriction. So it's so it's, it makes it harder than than having a slider that you can shoot 120 yards with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if we have to have that restricted definition, I think that five pin, five fixed pins, I think that's perfect in line with what the other restricted definitions are. Um, somebody made the comment about um, people buying, continue, buying scopes, optics. I mean, there, there's some pretty darn cool technology out there in the last year or two with binoculars that, you, well, the yes, the communicate of the scope, but also that you range an item and it drops a pin on your phone of the point that you ranged. Um, yeah. I'll tell you what, if I, I mean, that's some really cool technology. And if I went and bought that today and in a year was told I couldn't use it anymore, I'd be pretty upset. So I, I like the idea of getting out in front of that. So Barack, what if what if we did entertain a motion that that modified this restricted weapons a little bit more, have the two separate archery categories? I, I hate mucking up things that people have worked on. It's like we just said the committee brought a recommendation to the division, division changed it. Now we're here, we are changing it, but that, let's do it anyway. No, but <laughs> but I I, I kind of I'm thinking what if we did the archery, leave the other weapons as is the, and then I still feel strongly though that maybe we just have the. I like SFW's recommendations. I just would like to move that maybe we, and this is not a motion yet, but maybe we could uh, talk about putting the rest of these recommendations out for the April rack. I just, I just feel like once again, I remember when the trail camera stuff went through the, the person who drafted the bill was calling me all the time going, man, I get, I'm getting a lot of comments because I didn't run this through the public process. And they, they felt like going through the legislature directly was not public enough. And so, you know, and it's Casey, Casey's a great guy. And so, you know, he got a lot of heat for that. And I, I just feel like if we just pass up in today, we'll be getting the same calls later. Brock, are we to the point that I can make a motion? Sure, make it. Um, I, uh, I'll i take a stab at this. I, I make the motion that we adopt SFW's motion as written on their recommendation. So we have a motion and a second that we accept SFW's recommendation, which includes the division's recommendation with a slight modification to the restricted archery plus nine other items that were recommended by the committee. Can, Just to be clear, those are the 10 items at the end of the list. Yes, the correct. Yep, yep. And, and the reasons why are to support the committee um, on the recommendations that they put forth. Um, and I just, I, and get out ahead of some of this technology stuff. Sorry, just to, to clarify which, which Ben has, that the motion would adopt the, the 10 suggested motions at the end of the letter that SFW uh, provided to the RAC. No, oh, it's on there. In addition to the rifle and muzzle order, yes. He didn't put that in there. So, so the motion on the table is we expe we accept the division's recommendation on rifle and muzzle loader and the ten items on the end, which is changing the restricted archery to five pin no slider, yeah, yeah. plus the nine items regarding technology. With that, 
end this uh, topic or would we be able to uh, put you, forth another motion? You after could put that? forth another motion after, after but, that. Okay. but if, if that motion failed, it would be accept the motion that that would be the final motion. Yep. Any discussion on the motion that's on the table? Go ahead. Yeah, I guess I have one question about, <clears throat> so did the public see the committee's original recommendation? No. So I guess I would, I would probably be against this just okay. because of the lack of public input. And also we're going with one group that granted represents a lot of different individuals. Going with one group's comments uh, just straight up rather than uh, taking the whole uh, public input into account. So right, but I, it is a one have, group. It is the committee's recommendation that the group. But, but we're, we're yeah. reviewing this as one group's recommendation That's correct. to us. But, but so, to Brock's point. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen the committee's original okay. recommendation. So I would have to be against it. Because okay. To, to Brock's point, the committee was made up of several constituencies. Uh, Jason, you were giving me a look. It looked like you had a question or something. Yeah, what you said was different than what Brock presented as far as a motion. What I understood you to say was adopt SFW motion as presented in their letter. And then I heard some other portion saying, and the DWR proposal on rifle and muzzle loaders. That was my intent. Okay, all right, perfect, so thanks. Thank Just you for the clarification. And you're still okay with the second, Ken? Okay. Go ahead, Josh. I, I almost, <laughs> I don't even know how to say this. These are such hot button topics. It's gonna get discussed regardless. So it's like, whether you pass it now and discuss it later or discuss it first and deal with it then, I don't think it's gonna matter. So I'm kind of, if we can still amend this, I'm kind of like, yeah. I agree too. Let's I mean, give it a go. It's urgency on it. Let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. Any other comment? All those in favor of the motion? One, two, three, four, five, six. All those opposed? Passes six to three. And, and Barack, I'm just, just for the record, I'm only opposing, like I said, I'm not, not against recommendations, just opposing because it didn't go through the public process. And That's that the only, the record, only so issue I have. Right that. Uh, Barack, I think it was four opposed. Oh, it was. And it, and was it four. did go through the public process because this is the public process. Yeah, I'll disagree. <laughs> uh, Brock, can I make a motion? You bet. Um, I do have an issue with this lighted pins and video equipment on a bow. I Like if somebody wants to film their hunt, wear a GoPro, it, it has no place on a, on a on a weapon. So I would say, We've just passed this motion, but we were still able to amend it. So I would make a motion to remove um, current archery prohibit electronic sites with the exception of lighted pins and video equipment that is not even the taking of game. I don't think it has a place on on, a, on archery equipment. So my motion is to remove that from the motion we just passed. So remove video equipment. We we just we just said prohibit electronic sites with the exception of lighted pins and video equipment that's not aid in the taking of game. Right. Why are we creating uh, some loophole on a bow where now we can put a video camera and maybe in five years it does something different, lighted pin, it just, to me this is uh, disingenuous from the intent of what archery is and, and should be, so. I would make a motion we remove this from what we just passed. So you don't want anybody to be able to film their, their hunt? They can do it with a GoPro. They can do it with their phone. They can do it with their friend. There's a lot of ways to film it. It doesn't belong in the bow. Okay. Does, well, and, so there's you made that motion, right? Yep. So there's a motion. Yeah, I know there's a motion. So I'm seeing if there's a second before we discuss it. Well, I, I would go. Question. Okay, we have a second from Brian. Scott. Now we can discuss it. I would question whether the motion's even valid given that we just approved that now he's we did but you can always change you well, can always change yeah and okay. robert's rules would require a two-thirds uh supersedence there so. so we can change a motion that we just made Ab absolutely <laughs> well um, i don't know um i would personally like to see a a, a longbow recurve category um i think that that's a valid point 
it's another tool in the toolbox that may never get pulled out and used, kind of like some of my tools. So, so let's discuss that next. Right now we have a motion on the table. Okay, I just want to make sure that's still okay. a possibility. We can do that. We okay. can do that. Right now there's a motion on the table to remove with the exception of lighted pins and video equipment. From being added to archery equipment. Yes. Right. From with, archery equipment. With the exception of? That's what it said, and he wants to remove oh, okay. with the exception okay. of. He right. wants no yeah. electronic yes. equipment on a bow. Right now, people are allowed to use a compound bow with five pins, no slider, and add a camera to it, video, you know, 4K, whatever, as well as use Illuminox. Well, Illuminox right now are nice for low-light shot, but what's an Illuminox in 10 years? Like, if we're addressing technology, that's uh, against the, the, the direction, I think, the technology committee was that we just passed. So for me, that's an issue. Go ahead, Ben. Um, I don't feel like that goes against the, the committee's uh, intent. I mean, it's talking about attaching a video camera to your bow, no different. I mean, are, are we, are you, are, do you want to restrict attaching a video camera to a rifle as well? Because that's, I mean, why do one and not the other? I, I, I don't... Well, well, when nobody's talking about adding it to a rifle, I mean, we already have a restricted category that doesn't allow for that in, in those cases. So why would we allow no cameras on muzzleloaders, shotguns, handguns, but we can on a compound bow with five pins? I don't think the definition we just passed restricts a video camera on a rifle. Derek, where's Derek? You clarify on that? It, there, there's, in what we just passed, there isn't. Yeah, I, I mean, was there any ever any intent to restrict a video camera attached to, to a weapon, no. any weapon? No, that wasn't the intent. We, yeah. It was talked about specifically with archery because that's when it came up the most. Yeah. Was people I mean, wanting to attach a video camera to their bow. Yeah, it's but just a method of... I don't think many other people had with, talked about even cameras on rifles. I don't know if that right. even came up. Yeah. Yeah. It is a it, no, it, 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 it is, it is it with is the a scope, thing. but there's no scope. You, you, you yeah. can, uh, you can <laughs> any attach. other meaningful discussion. No, it is a That's thing. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can attach a video camera. It's very, actually a very um, common thing to put it on a scope rifle to put a camera that looks through your scope and video through the scope. Or the um, side, the Taticams or whatever on the side. Yeah, exactly. T uh, there's Tacticams and there's uh, a, another trigger cam. Um, and, and then, um, in addition to that, uh, like cameras on a shotgun, um, so, I, I don't, I don't see the point of this. Sorry, can I make a clarification? Yeah. So in SFW's proposal, it does um, on the third page, number uh, number two, it says current weapon types prohibit any electronics on scopes except for illuminated reticle or red dot. So that would eliminate cameras okay. yep. on rifles. Any other discussion? Then I'll call the question. The motion is to, to remove the line that says, with the exception of illuminated reticles and video cameras. That's correct. All those in fav favor. Opposed. Motion fails. Two to two, four, six. Abstentions? Amos? Oh, okay. Two to, eight. Two to eight. Motion fails. Mike? Um, I move that we add a third category, which, um, or a second category to the restricted archery, which is the division's original um, proposal. Called traditional archery? <laughs> a primitive. Primitive I'm, archery? I'm just kidding. They don't like that word. I, I, I second that. Okay, any discussion on this topic? Can you say that one more time for me, Mike? If I remember, <laughs> it's getting late. Um, I, I move that we go that we approve the divisions uh, as a second category for restricted archery. We approve the divisions definition um, that was presented. Is that that's fine? Yeah. Okay. Any discussion on this? This just gives them a definition if they want to use it in a future hunt or something like that. 
Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Two, four, six, eight. Opposed? Passes eight to two. Any, uh, okay. Any other discussion on technology? Okay, thank you. Next topic, crying out loud. Last, Last topic, number nine, CWMU and landowner permit recommendations. <laughs> Welcome to the front, Chad. I'm back. You think that we're tired of being here, but I'm not. This is where I'm getting started. <laughs> let's, let's do this. <laughs> okay. Questions for Chad. Do you have something you want to present, Chad, or do you want us to jump right into questions? Let's do questions. Okay. Questions for Chad from the rack. Yeah. I I got notes, but I, I can't really mem remember. Was uh, the Lazy H the only one that was recommended not to be accepted as a new CWMU? Yeah, so as far as the renewal goes, there was a couple other split recommendations as far as permit numbers go. But yeah, as far as renewing, just that one. I have a question. Grass Valley decreases by 8,000 acres. No, re no recommendation reduction in tags. What proportion of the CWU is 8,000 acres and how many tags do they get? You can... Can you tell me that? Um, yeah, so total tags, I have that right here. So 140 total tags, it's it's a large CWMU. Let, okay. me, let me look it up real quick. Well, Chad, I mean, while you're- So you're reducing it by 12 square miles with no tag reduction. Yeah, so I guess the question this is, is, is are those 12 square miles just, just salt flat or what? I, 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 <laughs> While he looks that up, I think we have to remember that the CWMUs, they don't go off of management strategy. They get to decide. So if they want to kill more deer and reduce their acreage, they can. And if, and they could come in and increase their acreage by 50,000 acres and not add one deer permit. And I think that's a fair point as I'm looking this up. My computer's gone slow. But it, there, the truth being, if there's a, there's a lot of CWMUs statewide that if they came in and said, I want 10 20 more tags, okay. we would probably back that. Okay. Um, we look at, we try to look at the satisfaction. If the public hunters are having a good hunt and they're getting the satisfaction ratings, um, that's mostly what will drive our recommendations. Okay, and then, and then explain to me, I wish Mike wouldn't have left. Maybe I'll wait for my next question until Mike gives back because he's on the committee, right? The CW committee? Yeah, advisory committee. I'll wait then. Okay. Any other questions for Chad? Eric first and then and then Scott. So I have a few, but I'll, I'll ask one right up the front and then we'll see where these go. Uh, the red, red iron, yeah. CW, the new one, Jueb County, does it include, I guess either I missed any maps that show that, does it include any public lands? No, that, none, of the, none of the new ones the new include, ones? and I do have maps here that if you wanna look at them, we can, we can pull those up, but yeah, none of the new ones have any public land in them. Okay, and then, I asked this question in a previous one under the uh, SRP, a special uh, ute recreation permit that, that is required by any uh, public who is benefiting commercially on public lands of obtaining one of those guides have to do it. Are the CWMUs going to the federal agencies to get the special use permits for these commercial activities? So, and if so, are they submitted with the application and is there a chance to see those? Yeah, so the, we don't get them submitted to us. Uh, by state law, they do have to have it. It says in state law that they must get those permits if they're to use it. The, the thing is, is you could potentially have public land in your CWMU and not hunt it. Like it could be surrounded in, and you could not hunt it, but it, it is something that we're addressing. It, it, it states it when we give them their COR um, I personally emailed both of the ones that potentially could have public land in that this year and said, this is a requirement. Okay, even even though they may not hunt it, if it is listed as a boundary, within the boundary, they're basically saying it's available to hunt. So that's, how because then, I mean, if, if they're not going to include it, 
then that would you know take that away. But if it's included, then they, they could actually hunt that, which then says they would need to get that yeah, permit from and, the agency. And we are we are pointing them to that and, okay. and telling them that they need to, to get with the agency that the public right. land, whoever has that public land, that they need to get with those agencies by by state law. It is it is in our law. <laughs> Uh, Chad, a couple of the benefits of this program to the public are hunter access, and a lot of that comes through antlerless permits. Can you speak to the antlerless harvest and permit numbers that are available on the CWMUs that are renewing and the new ones? Yeah, this might, I'm gonna share my screen. How about we do that? And then we can see. And this is probably mostly what 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 you can see there. So, um, and I is what they harvested um, during the last three years, and J is what we put on their COR that they would harvest the minimum harvest over the last three years. Um, to be fair, like I mean, some of them are zero, right? So they hit it. Pavant enzyme. On the last renewal, we we dropped the ball. We didn't get a three-year minimum harvest. Um, you can see we do have that on the next one or, or for this upcoming one. So, so we picked that up. Um, and and what I would say too is we don't have mandatory reporting, so it's not 100%. Um, I I don't know if it's a, those numbers are 100% accurate, but it's probably pretty close. But but some of these that are close to that minimum harvest, they may have hit it. So on these that have no permits, tell me how that allocation works with buck to buck to or public um, versus private bull or cow. Or is this just elk or is this, this elk? This is and just deer? elk. Because, this is just elk. Yeah, we don't have any deer that are so doing this year with those. Are these all 90-10 splits so that 10% goes to the public? Mm. I don't think so. I think mini mod is not. Um, so how, how does that 90-10 split work relative to the antlerless permits? So if you 100% you, of the antlerless permits go to the public if it's a 90-10 split. So if 100% of zero goes, then they get 90-10. Yeah. And do we have hunter satisfaction information on antlerless hunts? Yes, we do. So, there you're seeing success rates, um, and I'm I was trying to fit these all on one slide, so hopefully they make sense, but set success rates from 2019, 2020, and, and 2021, and then one, one metric that I'm starting to look at is to see what the unit success rate, so the surrounding, um, our, our surrounding hunts, um, to see, see what public hunters do on public land hunts. Um, and comparing those, and then you see the satisfaction ratings for, for the three years. And some of these, we just, yeah, we don't have the data for everything, but that's what, what we had through our harvest results. Chad, I assume that satisfaction is based out of five then? Yeah. Thank you. So, so why does a CWMU mu have zero if they're over objective? So that you you see that one. So Ingham Peak is one that has zero, right? They're yeah. they're pretty much at objective on that unit. I'm, I think they're. I have it on here. They're, the estimate is is that they're 25 okay. over. Um, so they're they're pretty close to to objective on that. And then that's a call from the biologist that that works out there that they they work with them. Um, and it's their call to I guess their rec part of their recommendation with with the CWMU of whether they need to to have cow permits. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, Jacobs Creek on there that's 1,200 over objective, um, and it's it's going to be a split recommend. So this is where it's a little bit tricky, right? Because we do antlerless recommendations in the spring as far as permit numbers, but they are renewing right now, and this probably needs to be evaluated as part of the renewal process. Um, so yeah, in the spring, it will be a split recommendation of us recommending eight cow permits 
and the CWMU is requesting zero. And they're 1,200 over objective. Why, why just eight? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's one of those things that we've, we've talked a lot in the past of as many cows as bulls if you're over objective. Um, How many bulls do they get? 20. 20 bulls and eight cows. And so it was, it was kind of a way for us. I think the biologist was trying to kind of meet in the middle. I will say on this unit too, that it's East Canyon. If you're familiar with East Canyon, there is a big chunk of private land that doesn't allow hunting and they hold a lot of elk. Uh, the operator does say that there's not, there's How did not they get their 20 it. bulls? Yeah. I've, and I don't know how many they harvest out of. We can look at harvest and see if they harvested all 20, um, but they do ask for 20. It, it, is, it is honestly one of those that it's a tough position for us, right? And I think as you see the split recommendation that, um, I, I don't know if in the past we had too many split recommendations. And so we're progressing towards that way of, of trying to get them to, to do a little bit more and and having a split recommendation, at, at least to have some. He's probably not. <laughs> so that makes your oh, tonight. We're not addressing permit numbers. I assume we're just either approving or not approving these CWMUs. So yeah, so they're up for renewal. So it's a you can you can approve or. A recommend approval or recommend denial. Uh, if there's recommended approval, then it is the buck and bull permits are up right now. So, but not the antlerless permits. The antlerless permits would be later. So, if, if they got approved and you dis and it's you just disagree with the antlerless permits, then it would be in the springtime. So, is is there no? <laughs> well, one of the big challenges with this is consistency again, right? Yeah. And, and this was the, we just revised the LOA Landowners Association rule, right? And one of the biggest challenges was there was that there were so many discrepancies over the years that you end up with a map that looks like this. And you just you look at it and you shake your head and say, what on earth happened here? Is there policy in place that's not being followed or is there just no policy? There, well, it says why why it, do we see such, such huge disparity yeah. in permit numbers, whether they have to, whether they don't, uh, success rates, 8.3% 8, 8 success rate? So my Come question on. is, what's the benefit to the public? Two tags. Yeah, it'd be two tags. Um, and and I, will, I will say that this is something that, you know, I've been involved with CWMUs. I've been the coordinator for three years, but I've been involved with CWMUs as a biologist before that, and I was a law enforcement before that. But more specifically, as the biologist, this was something that that it, it's difficult. And and I think if it was easy, then then we wouldn't be here. But but it is it is it is hard as a biologist, as a coordinator, to look at some of these numbers. And stand up here and justify zero would be really hard to justify in my mind. Eight, we have, we're, we're getting something, um, but then you have a working relationship with these people, and so so for biologists, it is hard. You, you have you have to have a working relationship with them. If you come and you make your recommendation every time, and it's you're asking too much from them, then, then the, the relationship resolve or dissolves and, and then it may not be productive. And that is something that I am working currently with the CWMU Association. Um, we talk about CWMU advisory. We, we didn't do good enough because LOA was still on top of me last year, but we're, we're trying to develop those metrics that we look at to say, and that's why some of this stuff is up here, like the unit success rate is, okay, if, if people are struggling with not being able to kill at a higher rate than the surrounding unit, that, that may be a problem. Um, let's bring them into the CWMU advisory committee and figure out if it's a real problem or if it's a, or if it's a, a lack of wanting 
to accomplish and cooperate problem. And so uh, that, that's what I'm really trying to do moving forward is, is get a lot of these metrics. Um, one of the metrics I wanna use is cow to bull. If you're over objective, um, it's, it's hard in my mind to think that your cows shouldn't be as high as your bulls. Um, but we don't have anything concrete. So that that's, I, and, and the CWMU Association, uh, I'll put it, and, and most CWMUs, they're very good to work with. Like we, we go to them, um, they help us solve these problems. Um, they don't, and I shouldn't speak for them, but I would say a lot of CWMUs wouldn't want to see or have this discussion because it, because it's not reflective of all the CWMUs. And Chad, maybe it'd be helpful to have in the future public hunter success and private hunter success parsed out. I, I know that on some of the CWMUs, and I'm not voting on this, so I'm gonna abstain just because of who I work with and what I do, but I think there's some times we have private hunters who say, eh, I just don't wanna shoot a, a deer today. Um, it happens actually quite a bit. I was up at one of our ranches two weeks ago and multiple hunters saw six-year-old bucks that I would love to shoot, right? And they were like, eh, it just wasn't what I'm looking for. You know, I'm gonna come back in a few more days. And yeah, and with that, I, I'd love to do that one, but on the antlerless, they don't actually break it out. So on the antlered, I can, antlerless, yeah. But, and most most, most of them are 100% public. public. So, so what you're seeing there, for the most part, is what the public is doing, and there is zero, zero private. I, I, like I said, I think, I think many mod is the exception. Red ranches might be an exception too. The rest of them are 90-10. So I have a question too. Okay. If you have the map, can you pull, pull up Ingham Peak? I'm glad Mike's here because he's on the committee. I want to, I, I'd like to understand how this decision's made. Only if we turn off the cameras. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand because I'm a big proponent of having public land available to public. While he pulls that up, um, the CWMU Advisory Committee spent uh, a couple meetings last spring talking about uh, what lands would qualify, uh, private or public lands would qualify to be part of a CWMU. Um, there was, uh, you know, I, I believe we we defined that a lot better. Would you say that, Chad? And yeah. we went through that kind of that part of the rule and 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 worked that out. And then Ingham Peak was the first uh, CWMU that we saw that had, I believe it was the first one we saw that had public lands within it. So yeah. I'll let you take it from. So, so this is my so, question. Okay. I grew, I grew up hunting this area. That's why it's kind of near and dear to my heart. So this, I grew up in Brigham City. We hunted Grouse Creek. We hunted Park Valley. This is where I grew up. The, all this public land right here has high elevation. 8,000 feet, this is where the deer are during the first, at least the first week of the hunt. And this trade lands is all 5,000 feet of elevation. They come down here if you get a snowstorm and there's a, some does and two points down here. Doesn't seem like a fair trade to me. We're giving up all the high elevation and getting 5,000 foot sagebrush. But, so that's what, that's what I wanted to know. And, and man, there's just a lot of, of, of public land that's accessible I, I can see something like this that nobody can get to, but I have a hard time here. All this edge stuff here. I don't, how did that? How did that happen? Yeah. So, so we, like Mike said, this is a process. We we kind of set some ground rules as a committee. Um, we brought in the biologist that was over the area. We brought in the operator to give him a chance to speak to it. Um, the discussion was had in the committee. Um, and then a recommendation came before the committee um, that that they felt like this was a fair trade and and the public got benefited from it. They felt the biologists felt like that there was that the habitat that we were getting, even though it's lower elevation, that they've seen wildlife on it and that it was available. And well, there's so, a bunch there in the winter. <laughs> and and yeah, I don't know. I couldn't say what time they looked at that, but but the feeling. Oh yeah, you're oh, here. The biologist forgot, is here, I so I'd like to. Here. Yeah. Sydney Lamb. 
current wildlife manager in the central region, former biologist and box elder, former protege of Brock McMillan. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's not a protege now, just former. <laughs> if she's going to argue against me, I'm not claiming her. No, <laughs> just teasing completely. I explained this prior to Brock, but I'll just explain it to the committee or to the rack. Um, yeah, even during classification season over the last two years, there's been plenty of deer on the trade lands. It seemed like a benefit, like the low land. December, that, right? November, yeah. December? After the hunt, sure. I agree. <clears throat> um, 100% agree. The other low land that's included in the CWMU is of little value to deer or other species that are hunted there. I do believe part of the compromise was made by the advisory committee because they were including upland in the trade lands and it was a good place for upland hunting? No, that's not actually true. Not correct? Yeah, so I I voted against uh, them including, I was only one on the advisory committee that voted against including the public lands. Um, the operator actually stated, and it's all on the, on, on, on the record, I believe. So um, he was trading the, the, so I'm I'm having a little bit. So the trade lands are only in the black, right? Yes. Correct. See, he, they were talking to trading those those uh, the checkerboard that's lower than the CWMU. So to see that that that's not in the black, that's kind of um, a little different than what I remember. I could be wrong. Um, since it's recorded, I'll uh, give my, myself a way out. But one of the big things was, is the operator said that he would only trade for the species and that he was going to remove the upland game and then the division could uh, buy walk-in access. And so, yeah, so, um, and then that was a, that was a sticking point um, that, that, uh, that uh, um, the vi division said that they were gonna try to work through, um, but, but my recollection is those the checkerboard that's that higher elevation checkerboard was supposed to be the trade lands. It wasn't that, but I could be wrong. I mean, I've been wrong before, but that's my recollection. And 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 those the trade lands up on those ridges would be better trade lands than the trade lands in the bottom, if I, if from what I remember and recall. Correct. Yeah. So um, I mean, we could pull up on, I could pull up Onyx and we can see who owns it. And then that would tell me if I'm right or wrong in my remembering that. So Mike, Mike, you just brought up a question and it's kind of for you, but you just brought up a question I've had this whole time. So I've heard a DWR talk about trade lands for a long time. How, but I'm not familiar because I've never hunted them, never been on them. How are they represented on Onyx? As private. So does the public even know they can access this? It's a tricky question that yeah. Chad could potentially answer better. Yeah. There is only like a layer on our website that you could query to show you trade lines, but to my you knowledge, can't it's download. not on You can just query. Yeah, I mean, that's correct. I, there, I, there is somewhere on the website. <laughs> now, you got to remember Onyx is a private company, and so... So I don't. I wouldn't put the onus on Onyx. To no, tell no, me where I, I'm the, at. Oh, and yeah. not on Onyx at all. It's on the division to make the public aware that they have access to these lands because they're they've given up their right to hunt the public well, and, land adjacent. And, and the division, to be to be fair and defend them, I agree. Um, the division has that on their on their website. You can go in and and pull up the layer of public trade lands. That's 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 how a, I found this all out. That's been a real. Progress in uh, you know in the How last. How many acres of trade lands do we does Utah have? Oh, tens of hundreds, maybe a hundred thousand. I don't know. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands so, because you have six six thousand right here. We're looking at sixteen thousand acres of private land. I don't understand why there's trade lands involved at all. There's. What is it? Isn't it five thousand acre minimum to be a CWMU? Yeah. Well. For, part of yeah, it is 10, part of it is for, is this elk this, as well this three miles right here yeah. they have to trade this so that they have contiguous yeah. otherwise they lose this this ridge top right here that's yeah. not and for define it, it it was originally for definable boundary I, um not, yeah. i'm not following on ridge lines. it looks like there's a private corner there right but it doesn't have it only has to be contiguous it only has to be contiguous 
correct me if I'm wrong, but it only has to be contiguous to meet the minimum. And then after you meet the minimum, you can do corner to corner. Yeah. And you can okay. have a, a section that's away or, okay. you know, just, but so, so I think they do have that. I think they the, do too. Yeah. yeah. It, it was a definable boundary issue, as I recall. Yeah. And, um, and part of that was, well, it's been the defined boundary for so long that, that they're going to keep it that way. And, you know. But we just I had this discussion last year saying with OnX and everything now, there's no, those definable boundaries are like obsolete. Well, and a definable boundary changes with every new hunter out there, right? I mean, I've never been on that piece. I don't know anything about the boundary. Well, uh, how's it definable a, to me? On a CWMU, isn't there very pretty strict posting requirements? Like, it's it's not just like private lands where it's corners and gates and stream crossings. This isn't it? They're like uh, every soul. It's the same as trespassing unless public land is included, and then it is, I think, every 300 feet. Okay, I thought it was every 300 feet, regardless. It, it was, area. but but then then we pretty much were told like you can't make it be more than state code so yeah my sense is you're not going to wander out there and not wander. Well, no, because the whole this whole boundary here is the top of the ridge so they've just run the boundary down the ridge top there i, I agree with the comment that was made though with onyx anymore uh, the property lines in the pretty easy define definable boundary and, and i would say that that we do get some pushback as far as if if that's if we just use Onyx, then should we have to post our property? Mm -hmm. So it, that that does kind of cut both ways, especially for those that. Well, I mean, then you're looking at. Not everybody owns Onyx. They still yeah. have an obligation to post their property, regardless of what technology somebody may have in their pocket. It makes no difference. So my recommendation on this would just be to remove all the public land from within the CWMU. Even the landlocked. Uh, I don't see anything that's landlocked. The, the blue landlocked right there. It's corner to corner. You can't cross corner to corner. It's a public refuge then within the CWMU. If <laughs> this is one of those areas they can't hunt, right? If the public can't hunt the public land, why is this? Why is the private hunting the public land? It is is that upper one landlocked? That, that doesn't look like. No, landlocked. it's not. But this okay. is the sit, isn't the Sitlow land that borders BLM? <laughs> Publicly accessible? Yes. Yeah, so why is that whole school section in, on the... This whole area is accessible. This area is accessible. Right. This whole area is accessible. So there's only, there's one section and two quarter sections that That's right. are included within. Yes. Yeah, I think those become refuges that are non-hunted. Anyway, and and I would little, just on like, that... 80 acre sections. Scott, that it would... Or parcels. Then, if, if public land is in there, then they do have to allow the public benefit. So you, like if that, if the landlocks were in there, then they, the public would get something in return. But, I'm, on, but I'm, not, I'm not seeing much public benefit to begin with, right? We're talking about a handful of cow permits, maybe. Did, did Ingham and Peak even have any cow permits? No, no so they have zero. I'm not seeing, so you got two bull elk permits and that's what we're getting in exchange for access to that? Yeah. Well, you get you get more trade land acreage than what trade land what that they has winter, public. wintering deer on it. There are there, I don't want to say just wintering. I have shot a buck in one of those trade land areas, a little two point when I was fourteen or sixteen. I don't remember, but but it's it's not the best. It's primarily winter. So what other um, CWMUs have public lands on their boundaries or on their interiors that we need to know about? That, that are renewing, it's just TL Bar. Yeah. Oh. Um, this one, it is it is landlocked there. Um, it It is necessary for them to get to their 5,000 acres. Yeah. That one, so so here again, that one's problematic. So th this is one that, that doesn't even qualify. Track. It shouldn't be there. Yeah. The only way it is there yeah, is by taking 640 of public acres and sticking it in. There's almost that are publicly accessible, right? Yeah, and and there's a couple others. I think there's two others in the state that would be that same way. And this one, since it's corner to corner and you can't legally access it, um, and 
they actually showed them, they actually talked quite a bit about how the, there's a little uh, riverbed that runs down through it and the pronghorn pretty much hang right on there and there's not very many pronghorn at all. Um, They're asking in for that two area. pronghorn? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a 50-50 split. And your recommendation is to approve the, the divisions is or is the division to follow the code? Uh, we're, we're recommending approval. That's okay. the CWMU advisory committee also saw this one and I don't, I don't remember if it was unanimous, maybe Mike does, but this one was recommended by them as well. I might have voted for this one because that one actually kind of makes sense. I, I um, agree, actually. You know, on, on, on this one. Um. So Chad, since we're on a roll, <laughs> mini mod, what about that? Can we bring that up? Uh, I don't have a map like this. You don't have a map like of that? many mod. No, but I just put the public land ones on. Curiosity killed the catfish here. So, I like I could go online and I don't know how long it'd take if you want. No, 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 we're good. Okay. I, I'm just curious if you had any comments about about that one because I've heard this discussion about this other. Yeah, it, many mod doesn't have any public land in it, so. Um, don't have a lot of concerns on that one. And there's nothing adjacent. There's no public land adjacent to it. To many mod? Yeah. I most of them do. I don't know. Like I'd have to, I'd have to look at the map because there there are a lot of CWMUs and private land in that area, but I'm not as familiar with it. So I'm I'm confused here. How? Um, you don't meet criteria, so you get around not meeting criteria by adding public land, which is another violation, right, without an exemption. It just seems like two bad apples in the same pot here. And and this, this is, I don't know when TL Bar first started out, but like I said, there's a couple others in the state that, that Yeah, don't. this is one of those challenging ones, right? It's yeah. been there for long enough that it's, it's like it's grandfathered in. So this is the comment I was making earlier, right? If somebody draws a bull permit this year and says, look, I've been applying for 20 years, I should have a Pavant tag with an eight-year-old bull there. Where does that guy come to grieve his, his issue? He doesn't. He doesn't have an opportunity at all. Because it's in code. The only place that we give an opportunity for a hunter to grieve their issue is through the CWME program. When these folks don't abide by the, 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 the established rules, they get to come back and say, we think we should be able to get around that because of these, these reasons. We don't afford that to anybody else. What, what do you call those? They're not exemptions. They're variances. not variances. Where's the variance for every other public hunter? I think the flip side It doesn't even thing. exist. It's unique to this group. It's a bias for this private landowner group, that's it. No other hunter in the state gets that opportunity. On the flip side, I don't though, think Scott, we no one's gonna be ever doing hunt it. this property otherwise. Why not? You can't legally access that parcel. It's trespass it, under Utah code right now, you cannot corner cross. Now that's a big debate. No, what I, well. So you could never hunt that parcel of BLM land and you're never gonna get access to that private. So why not? Saying, why aren't you gonna get access to the private? They'll say no. Uh, yeah. right a lot now of it gives you one tag, so right yeah. now so the only what, benefit is one tag. What's, what's the and benefit? a pronghorn tag is not going to make them a lot of money. Right? It's not like it's going to make them. So. I, anyway, I don't want to belabor that point. I, I'm a, sorry. I shouldn't even talk. I'm abstaining. I'm trying to abstain, but I. <laughs> I'll be to, to me, this one's pretty easy. I mean, it's a landlocked piece of land. It's inaccessible. I don't have a problem with this one. Um, the previous one we were looking at, that that, that one's. I don't like that one, but this this one this one's pretty easy. I don't have a problem with this one. To me, you've got another section. If you can get that other two private people, and there's your there's your land you make up in the southwest corners, right? So and this is where I come from on the agency side. What uh, Ben said is true, and and it's in the rule this way where it reads that any public land or private public land that is not publicly accessible. So those checkerboarded areas like that, I, I, I'm okay with that. But it's when you get to those fringe areas, those areas that they say, oh, I need to go to the edge of the, you know, over here just to meet a 
physical boundary or a definable boundary, especially with technology. I think there's one of the technology rules we should continue to allow. But those are this this is this I would not have a problem with. But those other ones on the fringe Sometimes areas. a good trade. I'm in favor. But yeah. those lands are accessible. It cost me four hundred dollars to hire hire an R44 to fly me there. Four hundred dollars an hour to fly me there, and so I mean. There's a, people paying thousands of dollars for a tag to hunt some of these units, and for 400 bucks, I can I can fly there and hunt it. I can't land on, on like wilderness, but I can land on BLM or on. Anyway, I'm. Any other questions for Chad? What else? What Let's else go back we, to the point. What hand. else do we hear about your program that you haven't brought up yet? <laughs> I want to go back to Ingham Peak and <laughs> get that one off the books. Okay. Uh, public comment or questions, not comment. Questions. I actually did have one more. Oh, okay. Scott, Scott first, then public. It's regarding the request for additional deer and elk permits on Diamond Mountain. Can you talk, speak to that? Yeah, so the the LOA rule was just passed by the board, right, in September. I don't know. I've been back to that thing too many times to remember what month anymore. <laughs> um, but it, it was passed. Uh, for it to be completely finalized, it still has a process to go through, which I didn't realize. Um, but, yeah, it's a it's had to get governor's signature, and then it has a 30-day comment period. I was told that that would be at the earliest finalized December 8th. Um, but but regardless, we, we wouldn't have been able to implement all those, the new rules going into this right now. So our recommendation is, is just that we follow, we, we already had a three year COR with them. Um, Diamond Mountain has always taken the percentage amount. They're, they don't get over allocated any of the animals and where we've increased the amount of tags, it would increase the amount of deer and elk that they get. So it would just be following it as, as we have in the past. So I'm not, I'm not familiar with that allocation process. Can you speak to that a little bit more? So, so in the old rule, it's either by acreage percentage or by usage. So Diamond always went by acreage and this, this would continue just to be their acreage percentage. No, but tags went up. Tags for the unit. Public tags, tags yeah, public tags for that unit went up, which bumps their number up. Wasn't Diamond Mountain like one of the ones that was actually following the formula how you intended? Yes, okay. on, on, permit on that part of it. Yes, not on, the, not on the public hunt part of it. And permit allocations change every year? Yeah, by, by rule that they could change those every year. Year. But the exemption or whatever that is only occurs when they renew. The yeah, the variance. The variance yeah. only occurs when they renew. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is why is the variance off the table? And we can't discuss the variance. So Diamond Mountain allows no public access at all, right? There's no public access for hunters. So why do we why do we say well we're going to adjust permit numbers, but we can't talk about the variance? It, <laughs> it seems to me Good like question. if we're going to talk about permit numbers, let's talk about the variance. Let's get public access. If we're going to give them another 11 permits, let's get something for it. If we're not going to get anything for it, why are we giving 11 more when they don't give public access to begin with? I think we ought to be cutting those permits. But the variance has already been granted. I agree with you. <laughs> when the COR comes up again... Well, and I guess I guess to Scott's point, and yeah, maybe that's the issue. It's t it, there's a there's a rule with this variance that gives them three years, and the permit numbers are adjustable every year. But man, that seems awkward to me. But but to your point, it is adjustable. It's a recommendation coming from us that we're trying to follow the rule. You still have the ability to make a recommendation to the board of whatever you'd like. Like you don't just because we're recommending it doesn't mean you have to follow our recommendation. And can we make a recommendation on the variance or no? I think I think so. I mean, it's not on the agenda. You'd make a, I don't know if anybody else would talk about it, but I, I think you, you, I think you can make whatever recommendations you want. Um, 
Any other questions? Any questions from the public? I mean, yeah, questions. I turn the time over to Jason. Thanks, Brock. Uh, we had 15 responses to the question, which best describes your position regarding the CWMU and LOA recommendations? We had three that strongly agreed, two that somewhat agreed, four that were neither agree nor disagree, one somewhat disagree, and five strongly disagree. The weighted average for this was 2.8. Um, some of the comments, uh, there was a comment not supportive of public land being included in the CWMU. You had that discussion. And also a, a comment about private and public land tags should be equal. So as many public tags as there are private tags provided. Okay, so I turn this, it back to the rack for discussion. <laughs> this is a um, little bit off topic what we've been discussing, but it's part of the packet and it was discussed at the Northern Region Rack. And I just wanted to get on record to say that uh, they, the Northern Region Rack uh, addressed a, um, a, a, a CWMU advisory committee ruling, I guess you'd call it, or recommendation. Um, and uh, I, I feel like that was an inappropriate use of hearing that um, and um, that that recommendation should have gone straight to the board and not been involved in the RAC process. Um, the, the, the issue was a, a permit from a, 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 a complaint that was filed against a CWMU and I think everybody received a letter. I received an email, so that's why I wanted to address it really quick. Um, the, all the all the uh, public uh, there's, there's a public record of that meeting and anybody can go look at it. it starts at the hour and 13 minutes and it addresses you know where where both sides got to tell their story um, in the northern region rack last night um, they only heard one side and and uh, and and the information they were given wasn't really uh, it didn't go along with with what the public record shows from from our CWMU advisory committee meeting uh, previous. So, um, I just wanted to get that on on record in case um, you know the board the board looks at that uh, northern region issue. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to ask. But so I'd like to ask because I that that individual called me, <laughs> and and they told me that at the CWU meeting, it was incorrect. They said this was the second violation and they said, no, they had never had a complaint by this before. And they had, they had come asking for a variance before, but they had never had a complaint on it before. And the committee had said that this was the second violation and that's why they did it. Yeah, so I mean, if we look at the public record that, that that's on the uh, division's website from that, to, from that meeting we had, um, what happened was uh, three, I think it was three years prior, it could have been four, um, the, the division um, held a CWMU advisory committee meeting with a bunch of uh, CWMUs that were struggling to help uh, in the harvest of cow elk. And um, during that meeting, it was disclosed that, uh, that the operator had been shutting down certain areas of his uh, CWMU due to the fact that uh, they had reached the, the, the quota for bucks harvested off of the landowners within the CWMU. And he was advised that, that he couldn't do that. Um, so when this issue came up that the public hunter wasn't allowed to hunt a certain area of the CWMU, um, that, um, that, that it was taken into account that, that the operator had been told that he couldn't do that. And then here they were doing it. Um, so it was, you know, there was, you know, I think that that recommendation passed the CWMU advisory committee uh, with one opposed, and everybody else was in favor. Um, so, so I don't want to say anybody was like misleading on purpose because you know we can all you know misremember or whatever. But but it's on public record. Anybody can go look. I mean, the the public hunter was upset enough that he filed a complaint. He showed up to it. He spoke out against it. He said he loved the CWMU and he loved how he was treated, except for that one thing. And but it was still there was still always a but there that he really felt like he was. So the public hunter or the public hunter's friend. 
So, so the, no, so the public hunters, I believe it was the punk, public hunters. So the grandpa, and I could be wrong, maybe it was the dad, I might be misremembering, but there was a, the, um, the wife drew a tag and they were mentoring um, a grandchild or a son. I don't remember um, if it was a grandson or a son. And so it's kind of a little bit misleading to say that, uh, that it was the, the friend or this acquaintance or just somebody that wasn't attached to the, to the hunter because they were attached to the hunter. I mean, if I'm, my wife has points and if she draws and we're going to mentor my daughter, I'm going along. And I'm probably going to be the one that files the complaint if there's a big issue. So I don't, I, there, was, there was just some different misinformation um, that, that, was, that was talked about. Um, and like I say, it starts at an hour, 13 minutes, if anybody wants to watch it from the February 1st meeting or the first meeting of February from the CWMU Advisory Committee. Kobe's on there I'm too. I'm good. So, the, that individual yeah. said they were going to be here to comment tonight, and they're not here. So I'm, I... Right. No. And, and my comment would be, it, it seems like it, it should have, I think was mentioned, it should have just been taken straight to the board. Okay, we're still at the discussion. Oh, let's hear it. Kobe wants to say something. Okay, Chief no. Jones. Seriously, Brock? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> um, so I, I do want I do want to say something. I've I've looked at, I I used to run the private lands program. I've evaluated private lands programs all over the West. Um, you know, and I, I understand there's there's a great benefit to the CWM program for, for private landowners, especially when it comes to bucks and bulls. And there is a lot of opportunity here for the public too, especially when it comes to antlerless harvest. I think that the I think the older I get, the more important hunting opportunity is to me. It's like how many good years do you have to hunt? I everybody wants to kill a big buck or a big bull, and I love that. Um, and it's it's Sometimes the antlers opportunity it makes the same memory. You know, sometimes it makes a great memory. My point in all of this, and I'll stop rambling, is I'm really glad this this rack, especially, looks through these things really closely. I am. I'm glad. And I want to remember, I want us as we do this, just remember there are a, are a lot of merits to this program. It's a good private lands program. Is it perfect? It's not. Does it need critical review? Sure. Um, and we have some of the best partners in wildlife management and of increased populations on, on other public land that's available and all sorts of benefits because of this program. You know, I hear all the time, we hear all the time with management, well, Colorado's got it right or Idaho's got it right, Wyoming's got it right. On this one, of the private lands programs that I've been involved with, I think Utah got it pretty darn good. And that's, what, that's, that's all I wanted to say. So thank you. Thank you. So I'll make a comment, Paul. I am a fan of the CWMU program. This one I struggle with because they don't have any real public access. They don't have any cow tags. And they have a lot of public land in it. If they were, in, in my opinion, if they were real partners, if they were given public opportunity, I would have much less heartache about it. Yeah, I, I come out pretty harsh against this, but I, I agree. I, I think it's a, a worthwhile program. It's something that ought to be continued, but I'm just looking for equity. Public lands within boundaries is a no-go for me. And if you're not, if we've got a 90-10 split for bucks and bulls and there's no cows, that's not equitable. Just It just isn't going to work. Okay, I'd entertain a motion. All right, I think I'm gonna do these in kind of increments. And it sounds like there may not be support for the T-Bar Ranch, which is the smaller one that had just the one section in there. So I'm gonna exclude that one. But I would recommend that we, I make a motion that um, public lands be removed from the interior of Ingham Peak. So we have a motion and a second that we remove all public land or just accessible public land? Well, let's say accessible. Okay, accessible public land from Income Pink. 
Any discussion on that? I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Abstain? So, nine in favor to abstain. Sure. And Mike? Um, I'm just on the record here, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I'm just abstaining due to my current employment situation. Sure. Then I I'm sustaining because I've already addressed this issue. Okay. Excellent. Um, I'd take, go ahead. Okay, so as another motion, uh, I'd make a motion that we, uh, we do not approve any of the variances. No other hunter has an opportunity to bring a variance before this group or the wildlife board. Until we equalize that, I see no, no reason that this group should be singled out given that opportunity. So we have a, a motion to not approve any more variances. Every of the variant, any of the variances that are in, well, so that would limit that 500 acre one or that 5,000 acre one. So, so just be Yeah, there, well, so the TL bar, is that what we're talking about? Is that, that as saying a variance? It, so yeah, they're, they're, technically I guess it would be a, a variance. Um, it was granted in the past, it, it goes against rule. <laughs> Doesn't, so, so we have a motion, we don't have a second. Okay, let me. So we had some that were season date variances, right? Um, so the variances, that, variances are where a CWMU is asking for something outside of the rules that they're governed by. It's like me saying, I need that scope. And I need to hunt in the middle of December during no, the No, I, I get the concept of variance, but I'm like, what are the four variances that were, yeah, like, are we excluding one CMU altogether in, because I mean, I, I agree that the grievance process is inequitable, but. Yeah, I'm, so. The one was to increase, they wanted one deer tag and one to the public and said they wanted four, but wasn't that one of the variances? And then there's yeah. another one that. Okay, here we go. So Jacobs Creek was wanting an extended elk season till November 30th. Right. All the way through uh, the, the CWMU advisory committee recommended it be from um, just still a 61 day season from October 1st to November 30th. But it's, it seems suspect because it was like if they wanted a later season because the elk weren't down, I get that. But then they said, well, if you're not going to grant the variance, we don't want any change. And so they wanted something again without sort of it. it it, it was a variance that to me didn't have any precedent. So that, that one was problematic when, in your presentation for sure. And then the same with the, the, the deer one. Yeah, so that, then you have Lazy H that was um, non, that's, that's the one that the, the landowner got uh, convicted of fraud. So we're, because of that, we're right. recommending well, and I, I don't know if that's a variant. Well, they, they asked, that was a split recommendation. So I guess we have three variance requests. They were asking for a variance to be, have some non-contiguous land in theirs, but if, depending on how you handled our recommendation that we're recommending denial, then then obviously the, the variance would go away. Um, Sweetwater is another one that's an under acreage elk CWMU that the CWMU advisory committee uh, recommended that they be granted that, but that that one is also so. So we have that, and just to try to confuse you a little bit more, we have a little split recommendations, and that's one of the split recommendations. So they're not an elk CWMU right now. They applied for it, and the CWMU committee um, recommended them for a variance to be an elk CWMU. If they're granted to be an elk CWMU, then we have a split recommendation on the amount of tags they get. So they're, they're wanting a total of four. We're recommending a total of three. And then Red Iron is another split recommendation. They have the acreage to be an elk CWMU, 
Uh, it's not an area that has a lot of elk or elk habitat. So our recommendation is, is that they don't be granted to be an elk CWD. So, so I don't know where you lump in the split recommendations and variances. So. The only recommend, uh, the only variance you're recommending is that uh, Boulder Mountain um, CW. I don't remember the name of it, but it's Sweet on the Boulder Water. Sweetwater. That's the only variance you're re recommending in this, correct? That that was uh, from the CWMU Advisory Committee. So we're our our recommendation even to the CWMU Advisory Committee is to follow the rule. Um, but they have that variance process to go through. So on, on all of all, on all of variances, ours is to follow the rule. So so the division's recommendation is to follow the rule. So if we recommended to accept the division's recommendation, the balance, then we would be follow. Then the, the, it would include yours. So it's still no second. I, I'll, I'll second it, but it doesn't sound like it, yeah, withdraw that and address it a different way. So the I, I'm, I just pulled up the presentation. If I understand this right, the DWR recommendation, the, the presentation shows three variances, Jacobs Creek, Lazy H, and Sweetwater. And all three, the division recommendation is essentially to deny right. the variance request. Right. Yeah. So let's make a, are there other issues that we want to discuss separate from this? Or can we make a motion now to accept the proposal, to accept the recommendations as presented. Before I say that, is there other issues we want to discuss? Okay. Um, well, I would just wonder, maybe this is to Chad. So the CWMU Advisory Committee variance request, should that have gone to the Wildlife Board or does that come through the RAC process to be voted on through that? Because because um, I, I, I mean, I've, I've been on the CWMU advisory committee. I was on it, you know, in the 2000s and now for the last like four years, but um, I've never dealt with this. Because I, I think it would behoove everybody to know why the CWMU advisory committee, you know, granted that variance request for that. So that CWMU Sweetwater, um, they don't have any other public land or private land that they can include. There, there are a lot of hay fields. Um, the division's been paying a ton of money in depredation. And, and so the way it was presented and, and it was agreed upon even by the biologist, I believe the biologist from the DWR brought it forward and kind of argued in favor of it was to, um, was to grant that variance request, and that was a pretty compelling argument. So, so it's hard to, for me to understand why the division is going against that when it was presented in that manner. I don't know. Uh, me too. I mean, it makes no sense that they they argue for it and against it. So the the way that I remember that going with the biologists is being asked questions about the sustainability of elk and said that there there are elk there that it, it could probably sustain a hunt. And so that's probably what Mike's referring to as far as, how th this is the way I remember it, is that for maybe speaking for it, um, our, our recommendation going into that was to follow the rule, but we did speak towards that it would, that it could sustain a hunt. Um, okay. And then the other factors that they said. So so we're, we, we try to present the data there that of, of whether what the potentials is if you did grant a variance, but even there, our, our recommendation was for it to to not be approved, and we follow the rule. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Okay, okay, I'll make a motion that we accept the CDMU LOA as presented. The the balance. The, the balance. Okay, so we have a we have a motion to accept the balance as recommended by the division or as presented, and we have a second from Ken. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Eight. Opposed? Abstain. So eight zero two. Any any other that items? Maybe bring? just a heads up that when antlerless. Uh, permit numbers are considered. I think we're gonna start talking about at least equal numbers to represent 
equal to the buck bull numbers if they've got those. So Think. be aware. Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, meeting adjourned. Thanks everybody. I really appreciate your efforts and your dedication to be here for such a long meeting. <laughs>